Hello, I'm Jennifer Joy, author of The Indomitable Miss Elizabeth. Please stay all the way to the end to get access to a special bonus chapter. Happy listening. The Indomitable Miss Elizabeth, a Pride and Prejudice Variation, American Mystery Book 2, written by Jennifer Joy, narrated by Nancy Peterson. Chapter 1 Lydia, you really must practice your pout in the mirror. When well done, it can be quite alluring. And mind your posture, dear. Mother clucked her tongue at Lydia, who displayed her immaturity by sticking her tongue out in turn. Elizabeth could not help but wonder how Mr. Darcy would react had he been there to observe Lydia in all of her impertinent glory. She doubted Miss Darcy, who was nearly the same age as Lydia, would ever resort to crude gestures to express herself to her elders. It struck Elizabeth, as it did at least once a day, how distinct her family was to Mr. Darcy's. And while she in no way felt inferior to his station, she was, after all, every bit a lady as he was a gentleman, she could not help but hope his regard for her was stronger than the adversities her family would inflict upon them. Time would tell. Elizabeth was soon distracted from Lydia's protruding tongue and her own amusing thoughts when Mother turned her attention from her youngest daughter to her eldest, or rather to Jane's cheeks, which she pinched enthusiastically, explaining, On the chance we happen to see your Mr. Bingley in Meryton, handsome young gentlemen of fortune do not want pale wives. Coming to Jane's defence when she observed her dearest sister wince in pain, Elizabeth said, Mama, do be gentle. You do not want Mr. Bingley to think her feverish either. To Elizabeth's relief, Mother dropped her hand and began inspecting her other daughters in the carriage. Elizabeth turned toward the window in hopes of being overlooked. Mother did not often find much of which to approve as she was concerned. Kitty, the fourth Bennet daughter, needed no further motherly ministrations, and so only received a nod of approval. Kitty was engaged, and soon to be married. She only awaited the third and final reading of the bands, and confirmation from her betrothed's parish to wed her beloved officer Denny. Elizabeth was happy for her. Kitty would marry for love. As for her third daughter, Mary, mother was not often in the habit of troubling herself over her. She had accepted, a feat miraculous for a mother with five unmarried daughters and the sole ambition to see each of them married well, that perhaps not all of her girls would be so fortunate as to marry. With Jane's recent success in capturing the eye of Mr. Bingley, Mother appeased herself with the often vocalised reassurance that one spinster daughter would not entirely ruin the family, nor would Kitty's choice of a second son and regimental officer who lacked sufficient coins to provoke a jingle in his pocket which left only Elizabeth, the second daughter, the one mother did not know what to think of half the time, but for whom she held high hopes anyway. Elizabeth turned to face mother and receive a rare smile of approval. Approval because Mr. Fitzwilliam Darcy of Pemberley in Derbyshire had shown an interest in her. And surely that must count for something. Over the past few weeks, Elizabeth had felt her mother's esteem toward her increase, as her possibility of marrying better than she had believed her most obstinate daughter capable of grew. To be sure, capturing the attention of Mr. Darcy had come as a surprise to Elizabeth as well. Not long ago she had despised him, and she had assumed he held her in no tender regard. How wrong she had been, on all accounts. Elizabeth sighed in an attempt to hide her eagerness as she stared out over the rolling empty fields. When would Mr. Darcy return? The past fourteen days had felt like an eternity. Had time and distance dulled his affection? 
Now as they swayed on their squeaky carriage seats into Meryton, Elizabeth searched through the glass window for a rider with unruly hair curling under his beaver hat, his wide shoulders filling out his ebony greatcoat, and his perfectly fitted buckskin breeches meeting with polished hessian boots. Mr. Darcy should be returning soon. He had said he would not be away longer than a fortnight. Mother somehow knew the direction of her thoughts and how they had held fast to the image of Mr. Darcy's breeches stretching over his perfectly formed thighs. Her unwavering gaze and knowing smile made Elizabeth want to squirm in her seat and blush to the shade of a tomato. When her mind's eye travelled up Mr. Darcy's frame, past his square chin to his disarming smile, Elizabeth resorted to a tactic which had served her well when she most needed to control her contemplations. She thought of Mr. Collins. Like a bucket of cold water dumped over her head, the results were immediate. Her skin cooled, her pulse slowed, and, more importantly, she was able to meet Mother's look with feigned indifference. Or so Elizabeth chose to believe. Jane, has Mr. Bingley given any indication as to when he expects Mr. Darcy to return? asked Mother. So much for that. Time and again, Mother had proved herself to possess disturbingly accurate insight where the futures of her daughters were concerned. Unfortunately for Elizabeth, Mother's attention was distracted before Jane could give an answer. I do not suppose he mentioned his dashing cousin, did he? Colonel Fitzwilliam is not as handsome as Mr. Darcy, but I have no doubt he would make an excellent match for one of my girls. Mother's eyes passed over Mary to land on Lydia, who rolled her eyes and crossed her arms defiantly. You just wait and see. I will marry the handsomest, richest, and most devoted man, and you will all be jealous, Lydia mumbled, once again practising her pout. Much better, dear, Mother complimented Lydia, patting her hands approvingly. Lydia's studies in the art of flirting were not nearly as important as the question burning in Elizabeth's being. When would Mr. Darcy return? She tried not to fidget as her patience failed her abysmally. Jane was too polite to interrupt, but her frequent glimpses between Mother and Elizabeth communicated that she did indeed know something worth repeating, thus adding to Elizabeth's anxiety. Mother continued patting the hands Lydia clutched together in her skirts. That is all well and good, Lydia, but I hope you would have enough sense to accept an offer from Colonel Fitzwilliam if he were to ask. Kitty, now an expert on acquiring declarations from eligible gentlemen, said, The Colonel is not as handsome as my Mr. Denny, but I heard he has ascended in rank based on his own merits. He would want a sensible wife to assist him in his ambitions. Mother tapped her chin and declared, On the other hand, the colonel might prefer somberness to joviality. This time, her eyes fixed on Mary. Mary's face blanched. I am certain he would not. However, she added, with a flicker of a glance at Elizabeth, I too admit a healthy curiosity about his and Mr. Darcy's return. Elizabeth smiled at Mary's thoughtfulness. She observed much more than she let on, and it came as no surprise she understood Elizabeth's growing need to hear some news, any news, about Mr. Darcy. Was it becoming easier for him to stay away from Hertfordshire? Would he come back for her? She had promised him nothing, only hope, hope she might be able to love him. It had been a bold request, she knew. Men like Mr. Darcy were unaccustomed to waiting when their minds were made up. Then again, Elizabeth was learning that Mr. Darcy was not like most men. Jane was finally able to answer. Mr. Bingley has only said that he expects Mr. Darcy to return with his cousin soon. He did, however, say that... While the precise moment of their return is uncertain, 
he felt confident in reassuring all who ask that Mr. Darcy's word is not one to be compromised. He has already prepared rooms for the gentlemen. They will return to Netherfield Park? Oh, how wonderful! That will make the arranging of dinner parties much more convenient for Mr. Bingley. Mother's sentence trailed off unfinished, leaving behind a wake of optimistic anticipation. Elizabeth secretly hoped Mr. Darcy would stay at Mr. Tanner's inn. They had only recently discovered their familial ties, and it would be a pity to separate them. And then there were the other house guests at Netherfield Park. Miss Bingley and her odious sister, Mrs. Hurst, had returned as soon as Mr. Wickham's murderer had been captured. While Elizabeth was secure in her possession of Mr. Darcy's regard, where Miss Bingley was concerned, she did not appreciate her or her sister's disparaging remarks toward her family. Kitty, whose concentration was greatly limited to thoughts of her own upcoming wedding, clapped her hands together. Oh, I do hope Mrs. Burke received the Order of Lace in time. It will be the perfect finishing touch to my gown, and I do so want to look beautiful for Mr. Denny on our wedding day. Lydia, who had believed herself to be the object of Mr. Denny's affection, scowled in her corner of the carriage. Mother squealed in delight. The first wedding in our family! And I'd always supposed my Lydia would be the first of my girls to wed. Poor Lydia. Though she crumpled her face like a toddler sucking on a lemon, Elizabeth pitied her. Lydia's vanity, her most cherished feature, had been insulted when a handsome officer dared prefer Kitty over her, and Mother's thoughtless comments only poured vinegar on her open wound. Mother and Kitty babbled on about the upcoming ceremony and the wedding feast to be arranged afterward. It would be a simple affair, as the militia was to depart from Meryton two days hence, her dreadful inconvenience to Mother, but one which did not diminish her joy in having a daughter marry. The sun reflecting off the glass blinded Elizabeth as they turned a bend and Meryton spread out before them. They would go to the haberdashers before proceeding to Aunt Phillips to exchange gossip and plan Kitty's wedding feast over tea cakes. The carriage slowed to a stop, and one by one, they entered Miss Burke's haberdashery, home of the circulating library and every frippery imaginable for a lady's home and person, much to the consternation of the modiste and milliner who could not compete with Mrs. Burke's lower prices. Elizabeth was anxious to see if any new books had arrived. There was nothing better than a book to pass the time. They were not the only ladies enticed out of their homes by the sunshine and dry roads. A gathering of ladies, like a gaggle of geese, Elizabeth thought wickedly, of varied stations hovered around Mrs. Burke at the counter. Lady Lucas stood next to Mrs. Thorne, the vicar's wife. Elizabeth regretted her goose thought when she saw them, but it was fleeting since the rest of the ladies fit the description appropriately. Miss Bingley and Mrs. Hurst stood together slightly to the side, clearly a part of the group, but much too good for it. They would waddle with astounding speed to gobble up any crumbs set against their competition. The modiste and the milliner's wife stepped away from Mother and toward Mrs. Burke, refusing to look up from the tips of their slippers. What truce had the shopkeepers made with each other so that they would not only be seen in each other's company, but seek refuge in their enemy's shop? Good afternoon, ladies, greeted Mother, no doubt assuming she would be welcomed by the group assembled. Elizabeth could see otherwise plainly on their pinched faces. Lady Lucas looked longingly down the hall behind the counter and sighed. Miss Bingley sneered, as if Mother had unwittingly stepped in a pile of fresh manure. After long seconds of uncomfortable silence, Lady Lucas had the grace to step forward. Good afternoon, Mrs. Bennet. I hope you are well. It is difficult to be otherwise when the weather has been so favourable, 
I have no doubt it shall continue through Kitty's wedding. We have been blessed much of late, what with her engagement to a handsome officer and all. And have I mentioned that Jane is very soon to be engaged? Her presumptuous comment elicited gasps from Mr. Bingley's sisters, as well as a fierce blush to Jane's cheeks. Mother, oblivious to anything which did not add to her pleasure, continued. I will not reveal the name aloud, but no doubt you have noticed how another gentleman in possession of a large estate and a fortune to support it has bestowed his attention on my Lizzie. Interesting how all of a sudden Elizabeth, mother's least favourite daughter, should now be my Lizzie. Elizabeth would have been mortified had the reaction on Miss Bingley's face not been so impressive. If looks could kill, Miss Bingley would have glared Mother down in one batting of her stubby eyelashes. Mrs. Thorne, ever the peacemaker, took it upon herself to intervene before Mother could offend anyone further or cause Miss Bingley to suffer an apoplexy. Her warm brown eyes, full of understanding toward both the offended and the offender, the vicar's wife took Mother's arm and steered her away from the brood of ladies toward the rainbow-coloured assortment of ribbons dangling over the far end of the counter. "'You do provoke the ladies sometimes, Mrs. Bennet. You ought to take greater care, lest you cause offence. Her plea met against an unabashed stone wall. "'My dear Mrs. Thorne, all mothers should occupy themselves in the prospects of our daughters. It is not my fault if others have failed where I have succeeded. You are an exception, of course, Mrs. Thorne.' That brought a smile to Mrs. Thorne's face. "'Next week will be ten years since the vicar and I married.' And what a blessing for you to marry at an age most would consider firmly on the shelf. Mrs. Thorne's smile faded with a long-suffering sigh. What a relief it must be to you as a mother with five lovely daughters of marriageable age to have met with a measure of success. I dare say the frequent tribulation you suffer from your nerves is much improved as a result. Having touched on one of Mother's favourite subjects, that of her poor nerves, Elizabeth watched her regale Mrs. Thorne with a lively account of the greatest thorn in her flesh, while the remaining lady sneaked behind Mrs. Burke's counter, each casting irritated glances over their shoulders toward Mother before they went along the hall to a small parlour where Mrs. Burke took her tea and invited her usual acquaintances of whom the majority of the ladies joining her that morning were most decidedly not, over to pass the time in gossip and embroidery. It was an odd sight. When Elizabeth saw Mrs. Burke slip away, leaving her husband to attend to their customers, the scene disturbed her even more. What a strange assortment of ladies! What could they possibly have in common? Elizabeth would have asked Mrs. Thorne, but she did not think it wise to do so when her mother could overhear. If the ladies had met together to exchange gossip, mother would invite herself, where she clearly was not welcome. Making her way over to a cushioned chair surrounded by ostrich feathers and other fluffy fripperies in a secluded corner, Elizabeth sank into the seat and looked out of the window opposite her, hoping to see him riding by. The marble mantel clock on the shelf behind her struck the elapsing of another hour with a trilling chime. It was a pleasant tune, but the joy it brought was short-lived. Each passing day had grown longer than the previous, and Elizabeth found it ironic that the very thing she had wished most from Mr. Darcy was the very thing with which she now grew impatient. Time. The closer they rode to Meryton, the more difficult conversation became as the portrait in Darcy's mind of Elizabeth was soon to become reality. Her fine eyes were so much more vibrant and expressive in reality than in his dreams. Two weeks had been an eternity, and he vowed to himself never to part from her company for such an extended time again. His horse pulled against the bit, responding to Darcy's impatience. 
had he not been convinced of the sincerity of Miss Elizabeth's character, after all, her values were similar to his own, he never would have endured the suffering of separation. His cousin, Colonel Richard Fitzwilliam, shook his head and chuckled. The two of you are a pretty pair. Control your emotions and you will gain control of your mount. It stung Darcy's pride to receive instructions in equestrianism from his cousin. But Richard was right. Of course, Richard had not much opportunity to know Miss Elizabeth. He had not witnessed her strength of character, her dazzling wit, her undefatigable loyalty, or her humour under adversity. Richard would soon understand his reasons for wishing to hasten their return to Meryton, as well as their stop in London, unnecessary but entirely worth the sparkle it would bring to Miss Elizabeth's fine eyes. Slowing their stallions to a walk as they passed the vicarage leading into the village, Darcy pulled out his pocket watch for the tenth time in the past hour. It was entirely within the realms of possibility for Miss Elizabeth to have walked into Meryton on this fine day. She often did so. They rode by the post office, approaching the haberdashery toward the stables. His groom, who had accompanied them from London, nodded at the stable owner. Darcy looked across the square and to the corner where Miss Elizabeth's Aunt Phillips resided. Was she visiting her aunt? Pity he could see nothing through the windows. A bell tingled from the doorway beside him, and he sensed her. The disinterested manners he had trained himself to adopt told him to temper his smile. Blast it all! With a wide grin, he turned his horse, leapt to the ground, and doffed his beaver hat before Richard could turn his horse. Miss Elizabeth looked every bit as pleased to see him as he felt on seeing her, and his heart soared at the knowledge of her delight clearly expressed on her resplendent countenance. Chapter Two Sunbeams surrounded her smiling face, reflecting streaks of auburn hair at her temples and casting a fiery glow around her head. How appropriate! Miss Elizabeth was much too lively to be considered angelic, and Darcy was well aware that a life together with her would be as full of lively disquietude as it would be full of passion and bliss. Miss Elizabeth, Darcy said, drawn to her like a moth to the flame. The corners of her eyes creased upward, and she clutched her bonnet between her hands. Mr. Darcy, how good it is to see you again. She paused long enough for him to appreciate the sincerity in her words. Did you have a pleasant trip? Her eyes wandered from him to his horse, to Richard, and back. Ah, there it was. He had suspected her inquisitive nature would move her to ask, though he dearly wished to satisfy her. It would be a disservice to speak prematurely and risk lessening her pleasure when it was time to reveal what he had done. He must be vague. I did. I thank you. Richard and I delivered our prisoner to Hartford without any inconveniences. He knew very well she did not care so much about that part of his trip. Did you spend all this time in Hartford? She inquired discreetly. Hardly. He pinched his lips to keep from smiling at her growing frustration. He loved the way she wrinkled her nose. It did not occur to her to pout or use the other degrading feminine devices most ladies depended upon to get what they wanted. Instead, she laughed. Very well, Mr. Darcy, it is clear to me you wish certain things to remain secret, and so I shall content myself with your return, made all the better with the addition of Colonel Fitzwilliam. Are you well, sir? she asked Richard. Richard now stood next to Darcy, and he swooped an exaggerated bow. Thank you, Miss Elizabeth. I am better now we are here. Darcy would have me riding all over England otherwise, and I much prefer to spend some time in leisure during my leave. Will you be staying long, Colonel? Richard's smile deepened to a grin. 
I have heard of the many lures of Hertfordshire. My aim is to ascertain if these rumours are true. Darcy felt his ears burn. It certainly had gone well for himself and his friend Charles Bingley. In fact, it would not surprise him if his capricious friend had already proposed marriage to the eldest Miss Bennet during his absence. Bingley's heart often acted before he could properly consult his mind. But in this case, Darcy felt certain Miss Bennet would not deny his impulsive nature. Mrs. Bennet, on the other hand, she was another matter entirely. As if his thoughts had conjured her, the bell on the door of the haberdashery rang again, and out walked Mrs. Bennet, dragging Miss Mary along with her. Lizzie, the emerald clip suits you best. I asked Mrs. Bird to set it aside for us. Oh, Mr. Darcy, how lovely it is to see you, said Mrs. Bennet, as if she had not seen them. She tugged on Miss Mary's arm while her eyes looked Richard up and down, nodding her head in approval at what she saw. To be fair, Richard did strike an authoritative air, even in plain clothes. Mrs. Bennet looked between himself and his cousin, clearly wanting an introduction. At least she had grace enough not to ask directly. And who is your friend, Mr. Darcy? she asked, one hand firmly holding Miss Mary at her side, and the other smoothing over her bodice and fiddling with the ribbon from her bonnet. So much for manners. He would have to get used to that. Allow me to introduce my cousin, Colonel Richard Fitzwilliam. A colonel, squawked Mrs. Bennet. After she quieted enough for Darcy to continue their introductions, Richard bowed as he would to a superior officer. Addressing Mrs. Bennet in the grave Miss Mary, he said, I apologise for the delay in introductions. My last visit here was so brief and turbulent. I fear I was obliged to leave before making your acquaintance. I am pleased to see that my breach of friendship remedied, and I trust my cousin to ensure sufficient opportunities to associate with your good family. That pleased Mrs. Bennet so greatly, she shoved Miss Mary a touch too enthusiastically, nearly sending the poor girl tumbling forward into Richard's arms. Fortunately for all involved, with the exception of Mrs. Bennet, of course, Miss Elizabeth had anticipated her mother's move and had steadied Miss Mary before she toppled over. Not one to be easily discouraged, Mrs. Bennet asked. And is there a Mrs. Fitzwilliam waiting for you at the barracks, Colonel? She ought to have asked that question before attempting to arrange a public embrace. Darcy saw Miss Elizabeth's jaw set. Their courtship would not be an easy one with Mrs. Bennet's constant interference, especially with Miss Elizabeth's tendency to act contrary to her mother's wishes. Not that Darcy could blame her. The colonel took her impertinent question in his stride. Alas, I am as yet unattached. The life of a soldier's wife is a difficult one, and there are not many young ladies who wish to live in a state of constant uncertainty and disturbance, when they could marry a gentleman with a steady home. Mrs. Bennet positively beamed. My Mary never fusses. She believes life's trials are sent by God to strengthen our character. Is that not right, Mary? She looked to Mary as if to affirm she had quoted her correctly. Miss Mary, the pious sister destined for a life of solitude, glared at her. Perhaps she was not the mindless, sermonising puppet Darcy had believed her to be. If she possessed a fraction of the intelligent spark he admired in Miss Elizabeth, there may be hope for her yet, just not with Richard. It was unfortunate, but Richard needed to marry a lady with a greater dowry than any of the Mrs. Bennet possessed. Mrs. Bennet's insinuations were for naught. Before anyone could react or think of appropriate retort, a difficult feat, as there was very little appropriate about Mrs. Bennet, the lady herself continued. 
how fortuitous you should arrive at this precise moment. Kitty, whom you know is soon to marry Mr. Denny, he is an officer too, Colonel, she added, delighted in the common ground she had made between two distinct officers with too little in common to merit her comparison. The militia is quite different from His Majesty's army, Mamma. Elizabeth clarified. Mrs. Bennet harumphed, plopping her fists on her hips. They both carry swords and wear dashing uniforms. As if that explained anything. Fortunately for all present, Mrs. Bennet returned to a topic she could speak of with more authority. Kitty has acquired a lovely bit of lace for her dress, and I dare say she will be the most beautiful bride Meryton has seen since I wed Mr. Bennet. You may not know it now, but I was quite the beauty in my day. Mrs. Bennet looked at them intently, clearly searching for a compliment. Darcy would leave that for Richard to handle. His cousin had a pleasant turn of phrase, whereas Darcy typically gave cause for offence when he spoke what was on his mind. Character, which was of far superior value and more enduring than looks, ought to grow, nourishing love and devotion with the passing of the years. He knew such an attachment was possible, and he would settle for nothing short of the best. Nor did he expect Miss Elizabeth to accept anything less. Clearly, you speak the truth, madam, as your aspect is reflected well in your charming daughters. Richard nodded his head, adding to the certainty of his statement. Mrs. Bennet gushed and fanned her face, which was flushed with flattery. We do hope you stay in Meryton for the winter, Colonel Fitzwilliam. With the regiment leaving two days hence, we will suffer from a lack of their gaiety unless you stay to add to our cheer. As if Richard's sole duty in life was to add to others' merriment. Darcy felt his patience wearing thinner with each crass comment Mrs. Bennet made. Richard must have felt it too. With a polite bow, he gestured toward Darcy's groom for the reins of his horse and added, I aim to please in a tone confirming it was time to depart. Mrs. Bennet, senseless to all things proper, but acutely aware of all things pertaining to an available gentleman, when she still had unmarried daughters, said hurriedly, I do not suppose you would do my daughters the honour of seeing them safely home. They express their desire to return to Longbourn, but the other girls and I must remain to make arrangements for Kitty's upcoming wedding feast with Mrs. Phillips. What with Mr. Wickham's recent murder, I am uneasy when they do not have a protector to see them arrive home without being assaulted and ravaged. Elizabeth's cheeks coloured as red as hollyberries. Mamma, surely Mr. Darcy and Colonel Fitzwilliam would rather continue to the inn. They must be tired after their journey, having only just arrived in Meryton. Knowing she would object to her mother's suggestion and wishing to ease her embarrassment, Darcy said, We would be honoured to see both Miss Elizabeth and Miss Mary to wherever they choose to go. We only came from London and have no need to go to the inn immediately. Mrs. Bennet clapped her hands together. Then it is settled. Thank you, gentlemen, for your thoughtfulness toward my daughters and seeing them home unharmed. Think nothing of it, was all Darcy could say. After all, it had been her idea, not his. Still, he relished the opportunity to walk beside Miss Elizabeth, and for that he would endure Mrs. Bennet's blatant manipulations. A flash of mischief crossed Miss Elizabeth's face. Actually, Mamma, Mr. Darcy kindly offered to take us anywhere we choose to go. Miss Lucas has recently returned from her aunts in London, and I would dearly love to pay a call on her today. Darcy bit his lips together as Mrs. Bennet's face contorted in frustration. I hardly think it appropriate for you to bring two gentlemen unknown to Miss Lucas on your call she objected. Mr. Darcy is not a stranger to Sir William and Lady Lucas, nor, I believe, is Colonel Fitzwilliam. Elizabeth looked to Richard for confirmation. Tis true. I had the pleasure of meeting Sir William at the informal inquest before departing for Hartford. 
Mrs. Bennet puffed a strand of hair off her forehead. If you insist, I suppose there's nothing I can say to prevent you from calling at Lucas Lodge. They are a good family and dear friends of ours. Even if they are a bit dull at times, Miss Lucas is rather plain, but she cannot help it. Mamma, exclaimed Miss Elizabeth. For her sake, Darcy pretended not to have heard. Instead, he gave instructions for his groom to follow them with the horses, so he and Richard might ride back to Meryton after seeing the ladies first to Lucas Lodge and then to Longbourn. In light of events too recent to ignore, Darcy would not allow Miss Elizabeth to walk without a suitable companion, which Miss Mary, with her pocket-sized book of sermons already in front of her nose, was certainly not, when it was in his power to prevent her from doing so. On that point, at least, he could agree with Mrs. Bennet. Chapter 3 Elizabeth took what felt like a first breath since her mother had joined them with Mary outside the shop. To her immense relief, Mr. Darcy pretended not to hear her mother's parting comment about Miss Lucas, and that he did so was a kindness to her. Mary, having no option but to join them, looped her arm through Elizabeth's and whispered behind her book of sermons, "'If Mr. Darcy still admires you, and I do not doubt that he does, a man such as he does not change his mind once it is decided, you should not hesitate to accept his offer. You would be hard-pressed to find another gentleman of morality and good sense willing to put up with our mother.' "'Mary!' Elizabeth hissed, peeking over the pages to see Mr. Darcy still occupied with his groom and Colonel Fitzwilliam. You know how I feel about the subject. Now is hardly the time to discuss it. Since when did Mary know so much about her and Mr. Darcy anyway? Had she listened at the top of the stairs while Elizabeth and father had discussed it at length? She narrowed her eyes at her sister, who merely held her book closer to her nose and shrugged. Love is a gift from God, and the greatest emotion. I will not debate its value with you, but I do question why you doubt you could fall in love with a man such as Mr. Darcy when by all appearances you love him already. Elizabeth could easily have asked what Mary knew about love, but she kept silent lest they be overheard. What Mary also did not know was how deeply Elizabeth had despised Mr. Darcy for faults of which he had proved himself innocent, how they had been trapped in Mr. Bingley's library together, providing him with an alibi when Mr. Wickham was found murdered at the barracks, but were unable to use unless they admitted to their compromise. That had happened less than a month ago, and while Elizabeth's regard for Mr. Darcy had improved dramatically, rooted in respect and trust, she had requested more time, and there was no sense lamenting it now. Instead, she observed how Mr. Darcy spoke with his groom. His posture was not condescending, nor did he behave in a dismissive manner. He had handed the reins over gently, and listened when his groom asked a question, which was interesting in itself. Most servants avoided eye contact, and did their best to carry out their duties unobserved. But Mr. Darcy's groom stood tall, and spoke directly to his master, man to man, as dignified adults of all stations should do. With a final nod, the groom retrieved several packages wrapped in paper from a leather bag and handed them to Mr. Darcy, who received them with thanks. His politeness to a humble groomsman warmed Elizabeth's heart. Maybe Mary was right. Was she a fool for making him wait? Mr. Darcy walked toward them, a dignified eagerness in his step. His earnest smile lit up his face and caressed her hesitant heart. Would he look at her thus always? If you will indulge me, I want to take this opportunity to see if these volumes are suitable for Mr. Bennet. You got books for my father? That had been thoughtful. Judging from the size of the two tomes, they would be highly appreciated by father. Mary lowered her book and reached out to accept the package Mr. Darcy extended to her. Please open it. I know Mr. Bennet enjoys political satire and botany, as well as more philosophical works, but 
This might not be quite to his liking. Mary tucked her sermon book in her pocket and unwrapped the larger tome with deft, eager fingers. Running her hand over the imprinted title, a smile grew over her face. The cultivation of roses, she said under her breath. To Mr. Darcy, she said, You are a keen observer. We have one thriving rose bush at Longbourn, but it is not my father who cares for it. Mr. Darcy did not look surprised in the least. Perhaps if you do not consider the reading enticing to your father, you might think of someone else in the household who might enjoy it. He looked intently at Mary, whose cheeks brightened to match the delicate hues of her precious roses. I can indeed. Thank you, Mr. Darcy. His eyes danced in merriment as he handed Elizabeth the thinnest volume. Her gloved hand brushed his, sending a spark flaming through her body. Perhaps I will have greater success with this book, he said, causing Elizabeth's blood to warm. Not for a moment did she believe the last book had been for father. He knew Mary would like it, and had only conjured an appropriate way to extend the gift to her in such a way she might accept it. He was confident in his gift, and his thoughtfulness toward her oft-neglected sister did not go unnoticed by Elizabeth. She pulled back the brown paper, holding her breath. Mary had received a gift. Had Mr. Darcy selected this novel especially for her? Palmyra by Thomas Love Peacock? She held the book of poems up, puzzled. I had the good fortune to meet Mr. Peacock during a spell in Wales last year. He is certain to become a great political satirist, and I thought Mr. Bennett might enjoy some of his first works before they become popular. Elizabeth tried to hide her disappointment. The book really was for father. He would take great pleasure in being amongst the first in his small circle of philosophical friends to discover another great thinker before his works became well known. Mr. Darcy shuffled through the remaining books, handing another to Elizabeth and returning the rest to his groom. Mary had a firm grip on her gift, and he did not attempt to remove it from her possession. Or do you think Mr. Bennet would prefer this one? The glint in his eyes drew Elizabeth in, filling her with expectation. That emotion, which too often led to disappointment, gave her pause. Books were a personal gift. Since she was a child, she had dreamed of a handsome gentleman who possessed a wondrous and special insight into her soul, a man with whom she could laugh and share her secrets and confidence, a man capable of selecting the perfect book for her to read. Though Mr. Darcy showed amazing promise, the likelihood of that happening made her hesitant. Open it, he insisted. This book was heavier than the last, most certainly a novel instead of a book of poetry. She held her breath once again. She loved novels. They were her weakness. Would it be Shelley's latest Gothic novel? Elizabeth enjoyed them, but that was too easy a selection. It would hold no meaning. Would it be something to challenge her intellect? Also too easy. He knew her well enough to know she enjoyed a challenge and was not intimidated by debates or new ideas. The paper was loose and only required her to pull it away to soothe her aching curiosity. She looked at him again. He leaned forward, his intense eyes blazing against her face. Did he realise how important this was to her? Was it as important to him? Out of the corner of her eye, she saw Colonel Fitzwilliam shift his weight. She'd nearly forgotten his presence. Mary, too, looked at her between flickering glances to her cherished volume. It would be a struggle for her to maintain a social presence with a new book to tempt her, as it would for Elizabeth if Mr. Darcy had been wise in his selection. With a deep breath, she pulled the paper away and looked at the book. The female Quixote, she read aloud, for the benefit of everyone present. Her breath shook in her effort to control it. Colonel Fitzwilliam roared in laughter. If that is meant for Mr. Bennet, then I am an ape's uncle. 
Elizabeth bit her lips together, but she could not gain mastery over her smile. Mr. Darcy's selection was perfect. Such merriment filled her she played along with the farce of Mr. Darcy's own creation. I have read Charlotte Lennox's works before. In fact, Mr. Darcy had caught her reading one of them in Mr. Bingley's library when Jane had fallen ill at Netherfield Park the month prior. However, my father, I am confident to say, has not been so fortunate. This is reported to be a powerful depiction of the real influence of females. I wonder why you think my father holds any particular interest in this subject. Mr. Darcy stood erect, raising his head to his normal lofty posture. They had argued about his arrogance before, but at this moment his display of pride was earned. Was it, in fact, pride, when used for the benefit and enjoyment of another? Some dismiss the heroine as a coquette who simply uses romance as a tool. Others say that Arabella's unconscious use of charm stems from her earnestness. Her genuineness of character gives her immense power and ultimately leads to a happy conclusion to her turbulent story. Any man with five daughters would do well to gain what insights he can into such a lady. Elizabeth did not need to ask in which camp Mr. Darcy firmly planted his feet. She had never encouraged him. In fact, from the beginning, she had opposed him. If she used feminine devices, she was unaware of them. But he thought a man might gain insight into the workings of a lady when indeed most ladies themselves were unaware of themselves enough to have opinions of their own or a society to dictate their behaviour for them, was laughable. And laugh she did, with enthusiasm. Colonel Fitzwilliam joined her immediately, as did Mr Darcy, whose laughter was more difficult to earn and, as such, infinitely more rewarding. Mary looked at them as if they had lost their wits. We had best continue our walk. Miss Lucas will want me to lend this novel to her as soon as uh, my father has finished reading it, Elizabeth teased. With a loud guffaw, Colonel Fitzwilliam slapped Mr. Darcy on the back, sending him forcefully down the road. Indeed, Mr. Bennet will benefit greatly from such a work of art. Mr. Darcy turned on him. Novels have a surprising amount of truth in human nature hidden in their pages. You may want to consider reading one sometime. You might find you gain more insights into the nature of the men under your command than you stand to benefit from the drab tomes on military history and strategy you prefer to read. Elizabeth was shocked. The colonel was too lively a gentleman not to indulge in humorous or slightly scandalous reading. Mary voiced her opinion aloud, offering an explanation. Perhaps the colonel takes his responsibilities and lot in life more seriously than most do, and thus prefers to lighten his load by performing them more effectively. There is time enough for joviality and cheer, but that will not lengthen the lives of those under his command, nor keep bread on the table. Colonel Fitzwilliam cackled, raising his eyebrows at Mary. You understand my views clearly, Miss Mary. I am of a practical, decisive nature, and see no reason to add to my burdens by lamenting my fate or neglecting them, thus leading to a lowered respect of myself and my values. Perhaps Mother had been correct about him. He sought a serious wife. But Mary? Your views are commendable, Colonel. It is only a pity your career should lead you down a path of bloodshed. Mary pursed her lips in disapproval. No, Mother had been wrong. As much as they might have in common, Mary would never compromise her standards. She had said so earlier. She would never attach herself to a man of war when peace was what she sought. The Colonel merely smiled. I could argue that... Men such as myself seek to prevent bloodshed by protecting those who would suffer harm should an enemy attack our shores. However, I am of a mind that we will have to agree to disagree on the subject. Or am I wrong? 
to that, Mary smiled slightly. I appreciate your insight, sir. Disturbance and discord rarely solve the issues being discussed. And so I find them fruitless and a waste of breath. Well, I might disagree with your profession. I am not ignorant enough to take you to pains for it. God will judge you for your works, not me. And with her otherwise sensible speech brought to a pious end, they continued down the road to Lucas Lodge. If Colonel Fitzwilliam appreciated Mary's practical comments, what would he think of Charlotte? Chapter 4 Miss Lucas, as Mrs. Bennet had tactlessly stated, was not a beauty. Neither was Richard handsome, for that matter, not that Darcy considered interfering in the affairs of his cousin's heart. However, Miss Lucas's sensibility and polite manners would do her credit in any level of society. Her kind nature and notable friendship with Miss Elizabeth enhanced her features, so that by the time the tea was poured, she was pleasant enough to the eye. Unlike Miss Mary, she took no offence in Richard's profession. Instead, she commented on how fortunate he was to be able to travel so much, causing his cousin to sit taller in his chair. If he puffed his chest out any further, the shiny buttons on Richard's waistcoat would burst. I have only recently returned from London. I fear my knowledge of England is limited to my family circle. I once attempted to convince my aunt to acquire a home in Scotland for the sole purpose of visiting her there, but it was to no avail. Miss Lucas spoke with such a straight face. Darcy was uncertain if she teased or not, until Miss Elizabeth bit her lips to control her reaction. What a contrast these two women were, and yet they were dear friends. Without words, they understood each other, and the conversation between them was both entertaining and intelligent. While Miss Elizabeth tended to say whatever was on her mind, Miss Lucas was more reserved. However, Miss Elizabeth seemed to know her thoughts, on a few occasions voicing them for her cautious friend. And it did not take long for Darcy to feel comfortable in the company of Miss Lucas. That Richard was pleased with his current associations was made quite obvious by his frequent comments and easy smiles. And did you have a pleasant trip to London? Darcy asked Miss Lucas. I did, thank you. My aunt is a widow in circumstances comfortable enough to suffer constant boredom. She sent for me to appease her ennui. The plague of the wealthy, added Richard. "'Tis a pity ladies are not allowed to occupy their time and minds as gentlemen do.' "'Miss Elizabeth chuckled. "'At fencing matches or drinking sherry at an exclusive women's club? "'Do such clubs exist? I should like to see one,' added Miss Lucas. "'Darcy kept his face straight. "'So long as the two are not combined, "'I see no problem in a woman participating in such activities.' Rewarding him with dimpled cheeks, Miss Elizabeth said, I doubt you ever suffer from a lack of occupations, leisurely or obligatory. A gentleman who takes his responsibilities seriously has many demands on his time. Miss Lucas nodded. While I agree for the most part, I do believe a lady who takes proper interest in her household has as much to occupy her time. Only her work often goes unnoticed. And unappreciated. Darcy had not considered the issue from a lady's perspective, not having had the advantage of his mother's presence at the age he ought to have noticed such efforts. He would never want his wife to feel that the few duties society allowed her were insignificant, nor would he restrict her if she really did want to learn fencing. He would take pride in teaching her. Miss Elizabeth crinkled her nose in displeasure. Both unfortunate and true. On the other hand, most ladies of fortune are only interested in hosting parties and the other superficial arrangements which give little satisfaction to a smoothly running household. Their only hope is to have the help of a capable housekeeper. 
which to my good fortune my aunt has, otherwise she would be much too busy managing her own affairs to remember me, Miss Charlotte added, restoring humour to their group. That is a practical outlook, and a positive one, commended Richard. As much diversion as London offers, I am happy you are home. I missed you, said Miss Elizabeth. How Darcy wished she could speak so plainly to him. Miss Elizabeth was not the sort of lady to hold back when she wished to express herself, but she had enough propriety to prevent her from doing so in front of her mother or their present company. Had she missed him as much as he had missed her? Even now, though she sat across from him, he ached for her. He felt her gaze. She looked at him from under her curly eyelashes, giving him a jolt. Was she including him in her statement to Miss Lucas? Dare he flatter himself? He had learned to be cautious in interpreting her. Too many times he had erred, convincing himself of her regard when she had held him in derision. That seemed like an eternity ago, and his confidence bolstered at the knowledge of how far her opinion toward him had changed. Darcy reached for his teacup, hoping its contents would settle his nerves. Last at all, he sounded like Mrs. Bennet. He had never suffered from his nerves, and he was not about to begin now, no matter how his heart fluttered and his stomach twisted in Miss Elizabeth's presence. Willing his hand to hold his cup steady, Darcy listened politely as Miss Lucas told them of the different diversions of which she had availed herself during her stay with her aunt. He heard enough to be able to give an answer where it asked of him, but every other sense in his possession was fully trained on Miss Elizabeth. Their walk had lent her complexion a flattering glow. The chocolate-brown irises in her eyes beamed with golden flecks. A spatter of light freckles, which were the bane of most ladies, but which Darcy adored for the meaning they bore of their owner's appreciation of being out of doors, dusted off the bridge of her nose and disappeared into her cheeks. If he were fortunate enough to win her heart, he planned to kiss every speck. He imagined riding over his property at Pemberley with her at his side. Did she ride? He would have to find out. He would take great pleasure in teaching her, or if she was averse to horse flesh, he would be content to walk beside her. A slower pace would give more time for conversation. Everything had its benefits. Before he knew what was about, Miss Elizabeth, Miss Mary, and Richard stood. He staggered to his feet in his haste to follow suit, and Richard noticed. The lout noticed everything. Darcy had hoped to engage Miss Elizabeth in lively discourse during the remainder of the walk to Longbourn, but his oaf of a cousin had other ideas, being intent on monopolising Miss Elizabeth's conversation so that Darcy could hardly get in a word. After some minutes, he kept his own jealous thoughts company, tiring of Richard's humorous remarks and gritting his teeth every time his cousin made Miss Elizabeth laugh, as he so dearly wished to... Miss Mary, her thoughts obviously elsewhere as her eyes looked blankly over the fields, did not seem to notice. If she did, she did not care enough to involve herself in their conversation or attempt to speak with Darcy. Not that he minded at all. He knew very well how stormy his aspect could appear when dark thoughts consumed him. His mind told him Richard was not a threat, how if Miss Elizabeth could find greater happiness with someone other than himself... He ought to be happy for her to have her heart's desire fulfilled. But that did not stop jealousy from consuming him. Darcy's vulnerability toward Miss Elizabeth concerned him. That he admired her more than any female he had ever met, that he respected her more today than he had on their first meeting, he easily admitted. That he loved her, he knew the growing suspicion that every future hope and happiness depended upon her proved to be disconcerting. Never had he allowed himself to be reliant on another, and he dreaded the uncertainty of allowing his love to deepen, as it would even without his permission. Without reassurances from the lady, his heart and mind conspired against him to choose. Yet he could not ask for her promise before she was ready to give it. 
He could not do her that injustice merely to appease his disturbed state, his need for her approval. By the time they reached Longbourn, Darcy was nauseated with emotion. Mrs. Bennet had his sympathy if this was the lot she claimed to bear daily. By a merciful turn of events, Mr. Bennet was not at Longbourn, and thus the temptation to prolong their conversation was no longer an option. He would call on the morrow to give Mr. Bennet the books. Waiting until the ladies were inside before mounting their horses to depart, he and Richard took their leave. Are you well, Darcy? Surliness does not suit you. Darcy glared at Richard. Richard reached over to tag Darcy in the arm, annoying him further. Come on, Darcy. I know your feelings toward Miss Elizabeth. As your favourite cousin and your elder. Darcy wished he could glare harder than he already was. I have your best interest at heart. I promised Georgiana I would keep an eye on you and ensure the worthiness of the lady before you gave your heart over completely. And what makes you such an expert? Darcy growled. If his little sister was so worried about him, she ought to come to Hertfordshire herself. Now that Wickham was gone and Meryton was safe again, he could write to her and arrange for her to stay with him at Netherfield Park. Miss Bingley would take greater care to behave around him with Georgiana there. The more he thought about it, the better the idea sounded. He would write to her as soon as they arrived at Tanner's Inn. I am in command of many young men who look to me for my superior wisdom, said Richard, with a smirk on his face. You give advice to your men about love and women, scoffed Darcy. That I would like to hear. Richard laughed. Oh, look at whose sense of humour has returned. When I am good, I am excellent. Do not let it go to your head, lest you have to sleep in the stables with the horses. Which is more your problem than mine, Darcy? This is what intrigues me most about Miss Elizabeth. I will admit she is more similar to you than I had originally supposed. He had Darcy's full attention. Continuing, Richard said... She has a strong personality. You will fight many battles over the years, but I have no doubt you will enjoy making peace all the more for it. Darcy felt a juvenile blush creep up his neck, but he refused to take Richard's bait. He would take far too much pleasure in it. Instead, Darcy said, I do not doubt the truth of your assumption. Miss Elizabeth has a mind of her own, and once she decides on something, she will defend her opinion with a tenacity worthy of a wine stain on a white cravat. Richard nodded. A kind way of saying she is as stubborn as you are. Darcy pulled his horse to a stop. Offend me if you must, but do not speak against Miss Elizabeth. Would you marry a woman content to mimic popular thinking to the exclusion of sincere expressions? Calm yourself, Darcy. You know I could never attach myself to such a woman or else I would have married some years ago. My standards are every bit as high as yours, with the added burden of my necessity to marry into a small fortune. Darcy's anger deflated like a silk balloon. I know it. I respect you all the more for it. And I you which is why I wish to ascertain Miss Elizabeth's character. What did you learn? As jealous as he was of Miss Elizabeth, he wanted Richard to praise her. Take care not to order her about, as you are accustomed to do. She will not take kindly to it. Also, take care not to introduce her to Aunt Catherine until after you are married. It is a tactical move which will save you a great deal of trouble. Darcy shivered. Aunt Catherine would not take kindly to his choice of a bride. Anyone other than his cousin Anne, Aunt Catherine's only daughter, would not suit her, though Darcy had told her numerous times how mismatched they were and how he was under no obligation to enter into a forced marriage. Anne, too, had assured him she had no intention of ever marrying. He had needed no further explanation, being pleased with her answer. Wise words, which I will heed, Richard. The sun soaked through his coat, warming him while the breeze carrying the bite of winter reminded him of the season. 
his Aunt Catherine expected him to visit in the springtime, and his greatest hope was to be away on his wedding tour with Elizabeth. There were many places he wanted to show her. Little was unfamiliar for him, but he anticipated the opportunity to experience all things new through her eyes. They slowed from a trot to a walk once they reached the edge of Meryton. Lawrence might be there already, or would be soon to pack his things and take them to Netherfield Park. Never was there a better valet than Lawrence. Bingley had insisted they return to Netherfield Park, assuring Darcy that his sisters were far too occupied with their new acquaintances in the village to be much of a bother to him. Several times a week, Mrs. Hurst and Miss Bingley rode into Meryton to meet with a group of like-minded women. Darcy's imagination offered him little help in ascertaining how Bingley's sisters would stoop to befriend anyone outside of their favoured London circles. But for his friend's sake, as well as his own, he wished it to be true. Bingley's tendency toward eternal optimism often made him underestimate his pernicious sisters. Richard reined in with a start, causing Darcy's horse to rear up on its hind legs. There was danger ahead. Darcy's sharpened senses smelled chimney smoke, but there was no fire in sight. However, what he saw was worse than a house fire for him. Stationed in front of Turner's Inn was a large imposing carriage with a familiar crest blazed on the side in gaudy gold leaf. So much for writing for Georgiana to come. He would never ask her to leave the piece of Pemberley for a lion's den. What could she possibly be doing here? She does not know, does she? exclaimed Richard. Raising his eyes to the heavens, Darcy heaved a prayerful sigh. Dear Lord, help him. Aunt Catherine had come to Meryton. Chapter 5 Darcy's first order of business was to search the streets for signs of Mrs. Bennet. Whatever happened, his aunt must not be introduced to her, not until Darcy could prepare. <sighs> prepare what? For Mrs. Bennet to act contrary to her nature and conceal her impertinence? How could he possibly convince Aunt Catherine to give up her delusion of an alliance between their households when he had been unable to do so since he had learnt of the supposed agreement? It was and had always been a figment of her overactive imagination. Can you imagine the fireworks if Aunt Catherine met Mrs. Bennet? chuckled Richard nervously. Darcy could and he wished to avoid it at all costs. He looked across the square to Mrs. Phillips' home, but he did not see the Bennet's carriage. Perhaps she has gone, and we have no cause for concern other than to wonder what has possessed Aunt Catherine to stop in Meryton. Of all places, Meryton. Is that optimism I hear? Richard harumphed. You have been spending too much time with Bingley. Be that as it may. I think the situation is safe for now. Let us not delay the inevitable. We must learn why she has come here before drawing any conclusions. He said it, but there was only one reason he could think of to merit a visit from his aunt. She had heard about Elizabeth. Darcy, being the master of his own fate, could not care less what his aunt thought about his choice of a wife. He was confident in his decision. However, he would not stand her interference and as well as Elizabeth would bear the imposing woman, it was not her duty to put up with his family members. Not yet. The groom silently took their horses, giving a nod of support before he turned toward the stables. Was it so bad even the servants dreaded Lady Catherine's reaction? He walked into an empty taproom. If there had been anyone in there before, they had cleared out. Only the wide-eyed Mrs. Molly and her barmaids scurried around the room, wiping tables and removing tankards to clean, casting concerned glances in the direction of Tanner's private rooms behind the bar. Mr. Darcy, Colonel Fitzwilliam, greeted Mrs. Molly, going to a hook behind the bar to retrieve Darcy's room key. She paused by the curtain, leaning in for a quick listen, then shook her head and returned with Darcy's key. Evidently, Lawrence had not yet arrived with his coach. Mrs. Molly, where is Tanner? Darcy asked, his concern mounting. If he thought Mrs. Bennet would be troublesome before his aunt, 
Tano would be much worse. Like all Darcy's, his patience had a limit, and Aunt Catherine was expert at pushing that limit. Mrs. Molly's eyes darted over to the curtain. He is with a guest. Lady Catherine de Bourgh? Her eyes widened more. Yes, she said, clutching her apron and wringing it between her hands. How long has Tana been in there with her? She swallowed hard. Long enough, she mumbled. Darcy nodded. He had better join Tanner before Meryton saw more bloodshed. He had no doubt Aunt Catherine would draw first, but Tanner was a force to be reckoned with. He despised the upper class, and his aunt's presumptuous manners would only light a fire under the ever-glowing embers of Tanner's resentment. Lady Catherine is my aunt. She must be here to see me. Your aunt! Mrs. Molly exclaimed. Clamping her hand over her mouth, she whispered, I apologise, Mr. Darcy. How uh, fortunate for you. She visibly struggled to finish her sentence. What was fortunate about being related to someone as entitled as Lady Catherine? Darcy put her out of her misery. It is fortunate the Colonel and I returned. Thank you, Miss Molly. If Lawrence arrives in my carriage while I am otherwise occupied, please have him pack up my things for Netherfield Park. Mr. Bingley is expecting Colonel Fitzwilliam and me today. Mrs. Molly bowed her head and bobbed a curtsy. Darcy crossed the room to the other end of the bar. He heard their voices before reaching the private parlour reserved for Tanner's most demanding guests. Tanner's low growl vibrated out of the room. It is not my custom to throw out paying guests merely for another's convenience. I could not care less who your father was or which title you claim. A gentleman is currently occupying my best room, and until he sees fit to depart from it, you will have to settle for the next best I have to offer. Settle? You ask me to settle? I could ruin you, Aunt Catherine hissed. Entering the room, Darcy saw the two standing three paces away from each other, Aunt Catherine clutched the sharp-tipped cane she used more to make a statement than for the stability it offered. Tanner's feet stood hip-width apart, his thick arms crossed firmly over his large chest, forming an impenetrable wall against which Aunt's pointy arrows bounced off. He was clearly unimpressed. Darcy needed to interfere before Tanner suggested she sleep at the stables with the other mules. Neither of them turned their heads to look at him and Richard as they entered the parlour. Anne sat in a chair by the fireplace, massaging her temples, while Mrs. Jenkinson fanned her and patted her arm reassuringly. Anne looked dreadfully pale despite the heat from the fire. Aunt Catherine, you must allow Mr. Turner to see Anne to a room. She must be fatigued after your journey, Darcy said, foregoing greetings and pleasantries when his cousin was in obvious need of assistance. Tanner's lips tightened. That is exactly what I have been trying to convince Lady Catherine de Bourgh of Rosings Park in Kent to allow me to do. He enunciated every syllable of her name, making it clear he knew precisely who she was. Mrs. Molly already has a suitable room ready, if only her ladyship would agree to it. I have offered to send for the apothecary, but she has refused that too. Darcy! You must order this man to give me the best room in his inn. I will settle for nothing less. Mrs. Jenkinson dared approach Aunt Catherine, saying, Pardon me, Lady Catherine, but Mr. Berg should rest. The softness of her voice was in direct contrast to the intensity of her stare. Aunt Catherine's pulse throbbed at her temples, but she nodded her head. Mrs. Jenkinson led Anne out of the room, and Darcy heard Mrs. Molly speak with them as the stairs creaked under the footsteps. Richard broke the tense silence with exaggerated cheer. Good afternoon, Aunt Catherine. How pleasant it is to see you here. To what do we owe the pleasure of your company? How he could smile at a moment such as this was incomprehensible to Darcy. Tanner looked like he would strangle Aunt Catherine if he uncrossed his arms. Aunt Catherine looked capable of poking Tanner with her pointed cane. You are grinning like a fool, Fitzwilliam. It does not suit you. 
or have the residents of Hertfordshire ruined you too? Here it came. You wish to know the purpose of my visit? Aunt Catherine turned her glare away from Tanner and Richard to focus on him. Great. Darcy took a deep breath and steadied himself. I am here to discredit certain rumours about my nephew forming an attachment to a young lady of inferior birth. What have you to say about that, Darcy? There it was. The accusation that Elizabeth was unworthy of their family. He thought he was prepared to hear it, but his blood boiled with more anger than he had imagined himself capable of. He closed the distance between himself and his aunt, looking down at her from his superior height. He was unafraid of her and her sharp cane. He felt Tanner's hand grasp his shoulder. Darcy was wound up as tight as a carriage spring, and his immediate reaction was to lash out against his brother, who dared restrain him. But he controlled himself. He looked at Tanner, who met his level gaze, and squeezed his shoulder as if to remind him to not lose his temper. Fine advice from one who was so often provoked. Darcy felt Richard move to his other side. Another reminder to hold his temper. Darcy took a deep breath and cleared his focus. He would do nothing to satisfy Aunt Catherine's curiosity until he first got the information he required. It was a much more humane and far more effective way of frustrating her. Who is the source of this rumour? You confirm it is merely a rumour, she snapped. He would not make it so easy on her. I neither confirm nor refute it. Who is the source of the rumour? He repeated. Mr. Collins. She offered nothing more. What did he tell you? He seemed to think I would be pleased at the news of your attachment to one of his country cousins, one Miss Elizabeth Bennet. Is her uncle not in trade? and her father's estate in a state of disrepair. Mr. Collins, Darcy should have known. The clergyman meant well, but he did not know when his assistance was unwanted, nor when to keep his mouth shut. Miss Elizabeth is the daughter of a gentleman, and as such she is my equal. Aunt Catherine gasped. You dare compare your elevated station to one so insignificant? Her name is unknown amongst the Burmond. You would regard her as insignificant because she's not recognized in society? Of what use has society been to us? Society could hang itself for all the value Darcy placed upon it. Aunt Catherine lived in constant fear of becoming the brunt of its malicious gossip, and his mother had accepted the dalliances of his father because society had taught her to look the other way while pretending to be the adoring wife. It had killed her. And how did society reward its handiwork? His father had died miserable and friendless. No, Darcy cared not for what society thought of him, nor Elizabeth. The fact that she refused to be impressed or intimidated by those who would look down on her only served to reaffirm his decision to make her his wife. As soon as he could convince her to have him, there was that small detail, though his patience grew thinner by the second. You dare defy society when you were born into it? Your position in the first circles demands the consideration of your peers. Aunt Catherine's lips pinched together so tightly they were rimmed in white. I will choose what is best for me and those for whom I am responsible. It is my decision, and mine alone. I will permit nobody authority over me when I am able to make up my own mind. And is that what you have done? Have you chosen to forsake your own cousin and bring reproach on the Darcy name by marrying a nobody? He would bring no more reproach, not even close, than what his own father had brought on the Darcy name. I cannot forsake Anne when I have given her no promise. He stopped, the words choking in his throat when Miss Molly rushed into the room with a complexion the colour of his aunt's powdered hair. The rim of Miss Molly's cap trembled, looking anxiously between Tanner and Aunt Catherine. She said, Please, uh, Mr. Berg is... 
She wrung her apron in her hands, looking down at the floor. Tanner stepped forward, reaching out for her. She is what? Calm yourself and speak plainly, Mrs. Molly. Aunt Catherine's cheeks had lost all their colour. She stood frozen in her haughty posture in defiance of bad news. Mrs. Molly looked up, her eyes shut like a child, believing herself to be invisible so long as she saw no one. Miss de Berg has suffered an... Enough, interrupted Aunt Catherine. I will say to my daughter. No doubt she was overly fatigued from our journey and merely needs a dose of tonic from our family doctor. There is no need for talk, do you understand? She eyed Miss Molly with a stony glare until the nervous housekeeper cracked her eyes open. And then Aunt Catherine did something Darcy had never known her to do. She pulled out some coins and handed them to Miss Molly. For your silence, she said as she marched out of the room. When Miss Molly followed her, Aunt Catherine astonished them further by refusing her assistance and ascending the stairs alone. Tana moved a chair over to Miss Molly, who looked like she might collapse at the slightest provocation. She slumped into it and rubbed her free hand over her face, shaking her head back and forth. Finally, after some time, she straightened her spine, and with a firm nod, she held out the coins for Darcy to take. I cannot accept these, sir. I understand her ladyship's reason for giving them to me, but I am now well aware it is not merely her daughter's future at stake. It is yours as well. My conscience will not allow me to remain silent when you should know what I just saw. Darcy's pulse hammered in his head. She spoke as if her news could adversely affect his future. It must be horrible news for Aunt Catherine to separate from her precious coin to hide whatever it was she wished to bury. Very well, but I insist you keep the coin. I cannot, Mr. Darcy. You cannot return it to Lady Catherine. So long as what you have to tell me remains a secret within these walls, I see no reason why you cannot dispose of the coin for the benefit of another, and thus appease your conscience. The trimming on the front of her cap bobbed up and down as she nodded enthusiastically. Mrs. Thorne will use it to assist a family in need. She is a good woman. Mrs. Molly took a deep breath. I pity your aunt, as will you, once you understand why she insists you marry her daughter. Are you certain you wish Colonel Fitzwilliam and Mr. Tanner to stay? They are my family. They stay. The longer Miss Molly took to reveal Aunt Catherine and Anne's horrible secret, the more convinced Darcy was that he needed his best friends by his side, Lord knew they could be trusted to keep a secret. Chapter 6 Dinner at the Bennet household was an excited affair. After spending a good part of the afternoon planning Kitty's upcoming wedding feast with Aunt Phillips, making plans to stitch the acquired lace on her gown for the ceremony, and the return of Mr. Darcy with Colonel Fitzwilliam, there was much to discuss or rather much to listen to, while Mother chattered endlessly about how all of her girls would be engaged by the end of the year. It was December. It would take more than an act of Mother to see her dream come to pass. Elizabeth retired into the drawing room with her mother and sisters, leaving Father at the table to sip his port at his leisure and read what remained of the newspaper after Lydia and Kitty had attacked the gossip columns. Settling in with a novel and wishing it was The Female Quixote instead of the book she'd already read twice, Elizabeth observed Mary struggling to concentrate on the sermon she normally devoured. Her mind was clearly on rose bushes. Oh, if only Father had been home to receive his gift. Occupying herself in various ways to hasten the hours until Mr. Darcy would call the next day, Elizabeth stared into the fire. Mrs. Hill came in to stir the logs. The dear housekeeper, old enough to be her grandmother, winked at Elizabeth when she returned the fire iron to its stand. With a cautious glance to mother, Mrs. Hill signalled for Elizabeth to follow her out of the door. Mrs. Hill's company being preferable to her book, Elizabeth was more than pleased to join her. What was the housekeeper up to? Mrs. Hill! Mother's voice pulled them back from the doorway. If you are helping Elizabeth plan a secret meeting with Mr. Darcy, I should very much like to know about it. 
as if Mr. Darcy would agree to sneak around when he could court her openly and honestly. Shaking her head emphatically, Mrs. Hill said, "'No, ma'am, I merely heard some news concerning Miss Elizabeth, "'and I thought it best to share it with her in private. "'I did not wish to bother you.' "'News? Concerning my Lizzie? "'Well, it must be about Mr. Darcy, "'and so I must insist on hearing it.' "'Mother clambered to her feet from the settee. "'Oh, I do love to hear gossip,' added Lydia, rising to join them. Poor Mrs. Hill's crestfallen face reflected her distress at their unwanted company. Looking apologetically at Elizabeth, she sighed. Mrs. Hill could not discourage Lydia from hearing whatever her news was, and Lydia would pay no heed to anyone other than Mother. And even then it was debatable. Mama, do you not think it best for Mrs. Hill to relate her news to us in private? After all... If she has heard something regarding Mr. Darcy, of what benefit would it be to anyone but us to hear? Elizabeth did not attempt to exclude Mother from the conversation, knowing very well her persuasions would fall on deaf ears. If it is a matter of delicacy, which I suspect it is from Mrs. Hill's direct approach to only me, then we need not worry about it being spread needlessly. Proposals have been hindered for lesser crimes. That would get Mother's attention but Elizabeth knew better than to leave her without a good reason to leave Lydia behind. On the other hand, if it is worth repeating, we may do so for all in the room to hear this same night. That decided Mother. Lydia, wait just a few minutes, dear. I dare say you will find out what is happening soon enough. Keep your sister's company until we return. Mrs. Hill's closed lips and downcast eyes contradicted Mother's reassurances. Curious. However, they were able to leave the room without Lydia. Not knowing what to expect, Elizabeth followed Mrs. Hill and Mother into the kitchen, where Mrs. Hill proceeded to look along the hall to ensure they had not been followed, and closed the door. Curious, sir. Mother, unheeding of Mrs. Hill's efforts to ensure they were not overheard, asked in a loud shrill, "'Mrs. Hill! Whatever is this about?' Shh, please, Mum, first, before I reveal anything, I must have your promise that you will not reveal this bit of news to anyone. She looked pointedly at Mother. Not your sister, nor your other daughters. Please understand, if it becomes known, you are in possession of this information, and it is tracked back to me. I will not hesitate to deny it, even at the loss of my place here. Her determination silenced Mother and left Elizabeth speechless. This was serious. Elizabeth could not pretend not to be interested in Mrs. Hill's news, but she would never ask their faithful housekeeper to divulge information which endangered her living. Are you certain you wish to tell us? Is it a secret worth telling? That is the only reason I am willing to tell you, Miss. I have watched you grow since you were brought into this world— my greatest wish, not having been blessed with living children of my own, is to see all of you happily settled. Her eyes flickered over to Mother, her eyebrows knitting together before she pulled her gaze back to Elizabeth. No wonder Mrs. Hill had sought to speak to her alone. Mother clucked like a hen. Of course I will safeguard your secret, Mrs. Hill. You know how my every thought and action is for the happiness of my girls, and Lizzie has caught the attention of the best gentleman of all. I would do nothing to put her chances with Mr. Darcy in peril. Elizabeth held her breath and forced her eyes forward so as not to roll them. Clearly, Mrs. Hill was not entirely convinced either. Mother, though, in her own mind, considered herself solely responsible for the successful matches of each of her daughters, and nothing they could say would convince her otherwise. Mrs. Hill motioned for them to sit at the small table. Clasping her hands together, she said, Mind you, I do not know the details. Mrs. Molly only told me what she must, and so, while my information is disturbing, it is vague. In the wrong hands... It could do a great deal of damage, and it would certainly affect Mr. Darcy's feelings toward Miss Elizabeth. Elizabeth's heartbeat vibrated in her ears, and worry settled like sour milk in her stomach. 
To her credit, Mother looked concerned. In a grave tone, she answered, We cannot have that. I would never do anything to discourage a gentleman. And thus I am pleased I insisted on forming a part of this discussion, Mrs. Hill. I will guard your secret to help my Lizzie secure Mr. Darcy. Elizabeth saw the conflict in Mrs. Hill's furrowed brow. She had something of importance to relate, but it was plain she did not wish to do so before her mistress. By now, Elizabeth was on pins and needles. If Mr. Darcy had a secret, why had he not told her? He had freely told her about his sister's near brush with ruin at Ramsgate. She had assumed, prematurely from the standing of things, that he trusted her. Mrs. Hill, speak! We do not have all evening, complained Mother, as eager to hear the news as Elizabeth was. Clasping her knobby hands together, Mrs. Hill said slowly, As you know, ma'am, Miss Elizabeth is as dear to me as a daughter, and she is well liked in the village. It is known that Mr. Darcy prefers her, and there is not one person who has watched Miss Elizabeth grow into a confident, fine young Miss who would object to her union with such an honourable gentleman. Mrs. Molly is no different. She emphasised to me her motive in revealing what she must so clearly. I have no doubt of her sincerity and loyalty to the happiness of Miss Elizabeth. Relief rushed over Elizabeth. Mrs. Hill still considered Mr. Darcy honourable. That was enough for her. In giving my affairs too great an importance... I hope Mrs. Molly is not putting her position in danger. I would rather not know of it and trust Mr. Darcy to reveal matters pertaining to me directly. Please, Mrs. Hill, say no more. Mrs. Hill smiled, but Mother pinched her arm. Elizabeth bit her tongue to keep from yelping aloud. Nonsense! Her loyalty is well placed and will be rewarded all the more when you become the mistress of Pemberley. Mother said, releasing her hold. Elizabeth rubbed her throbbing skin. Be that so or not, for nobody can induce Mr. Darcy to propose to a lady unless he wishes it. I would not be able to live with my conscience if it became known Mrs. Morley or Mrs. Hill had any part in betraying a confidence. Mrs. Hill shook her head. Oh, no, miss. She was particularly careful to keep from doing that. Let me tell you what she told me, and you can be the judge. You may not have heard, but Mr. Darcy's aunt has come to Meryton, Lady Catherine de Bourgh of Rosings Park in Kent. The Lady Catherine, of whom Mr. Collins spoke with elevated reverence, Elizabeth had no desire to meet the lady. Mother, however, clapped her hands together and began scheming. Mrs. Hill continued, Mr. Berg is quite sickly and would make an unsuitable wife for Mr. Darcy. Of that fact, Mrs. Molly was clear, and she repeats nothing of which the people of Meryton would not ascertain for themselves in a short time. What is of more concern is Lady Catherine de Berg's claim that Mr. Darcy is these many years engaged to Mr. Berg. Mrs. Hill clamped her lips shut, her eyes darting between Elizabeth and her mistress. Mother gasped, covering her mouth with her hand, then falling into noisy contemplation, frequently emphasised with sighs, gestures and more clicks of her tongue. Elizabeth did not believe it. Mr. Darcy would have never encouraged the affections of a lady if he were not free to do so. There was yet much she had to learn about him, but she did not doubt his honour. It simply could not be true, and unless he told her of the attachment himself, she would give it no credence. It must merely be Lady Catherine's fantasy. And Elizabeth did not doubt that Mr. Darcy would act as he wished, despite the delusional wishes imposed upon him by his relatives. Mother raised a finger into the air as inspiration crossed her. I know just what to do. If I arrange to be introduced to this Lady Catherine, after all, Mr. Collins is the rector for her parish, I could reason with her. Surely I could make her see the advantages of allowing her nephew to marry my daughter. Elizabeth coughed to cover her gasp. Though she did not believe herself inferior to Mr. Berg, she had sense enough to know which match society would favour. 
no doubt Mr. Berg would bring a fortune to her marriage, and, if Mr. Collins was to be trusted, she stood to inherit Rosings, a grand estate by anyone's standards. Elizabeth had little more than herself to offer. Mrs. Hill's eyes opened as wide as an owl's. Mrs. Bennet, I beg you not to interfere. Lady Catherine is every bit as determined as you are to have her daughter marry Mr. Darcy. If she spreads us around the village that he is attached to Mr. Berg, Miss Elizabeth's hopes will be forever dashed. Please, Mrs. Bennet, I implore you to say nothing to Lady Catherine. Mother did not take kindly to Mrs. Hill's interference. Puffing out her chest and lifting her chin, she said, Do not forget your place, Mrs. Hill. I will do as I see best for my daughter. Now, I will not remain cross with you, as you have done your duty well in sharing this information with me. But I am not in need of your counsel. A stubborn defiance crossed Mrs. Hill, so that Elizabeth thought for a moment that the housekeeper would contradict Mother. But it passed as soon as it had appeared. Bowing her head, Mrs. Hill nodded in servile acquiescence. The housekeeper cast a look full of pity at Elizabeth before she left the room after Mother dismissed her. Elizabeth knew that even if she implored Mother not to involve herself, she would only get the same reply as Mrs. Hill had. She was decided. Mother would try to speak with Lady Catherine. Elizabeth secured Mother's silence from her sisters, being unable to secure anything more, and went upstairs, pondering ways to prevent Mother from going into Meryton on the morrow. What if a wheel fell off the carriage? No, someone might get hurt. A purgative in Mother's tea? No, that was akin to poisoning her own relative, and Elizabeth had to draw the line somewhere. A small fire in the house? No. Nothing would stop Mother when marriage was on the line. Chapter 7 After a fitful night of tossing and turning, Elizabeth woke before the sun to venture outdoors. Not many more days without rain could pass, and Elizabeth meant to enjoy them before the inclement weather trapped her indoors. If she was honest with herself... The reason she directed her steps toward the hills surrounding Netherfield Park was in hopes of seeing Mr. Darcy. While she did not doubt him, she had many unanswered questions. A word from him would restore her peace of mind. Why did Lady Catherine assume he was engaged to Mr. Berg? From what malady did she suffer? Would Mr. Darcy have married her had she not been in such a delicate state? What influence did Lady Catherine have over Mr. Darcy? Her influence could not be very great, otherwise he would have married her daughter years before. And most important of all, how could she keep Mother from speaking with Lady Catherine? Elizabeth shivered. The consequences of vexing someone such as Lady Catherine de Bourgh would not be favourable toward the Bennet family. Elizabeth had not met the great lady, but she had heard enough about her from Mr. Collins to know she was not one to be crossed. Wandering through the fields, Elizabeth prayed Mr. Darcy would canter toward her on his dark stallion and rescue her from her disquieting thoughts, just as he had rescued her from the murderer's carriage weeks before. But it was not to be. She walked until the sun's rays lightened the horizon and reflected its warmth in the red clouds surrounded by pink haze, Mr. Darcy did not appear. Returning to Longbourn, the residents of the house were recently awakening to receive another day. Father raised his teacup to her before closing his study door behind him, which reminded Elizabeth of the books. Mr. Darcy would have to call soon. Would he present his gift to Father today? Undoubtedly. Thus cheered at the prospect of seeing Mr. Darcy, Elizabeth was better suited to see the more urgent predicament before her, namely to ensure Mother did not go to Meryton, to Lady Catherine. Convinced Mr. Darcy would call, Elizabeth was unwilling to leave Longbourn until he had the opportunity to do so. She knew from Jane that Mr. Bingley planned to call. Elizabeth smelled the mouth-watering cinnamon aroma wafting from the kitchen. Mrs. Hill was preparing for callers. Not having settled on a satisfactory plan to prevent Mother from going into the village the evening before, 
All of her ideas had been much too fanciful, though they would have made a fantastic novel. Elizabeth was startled from her thoughts when Kitty greeted her. Good morning. You are awake early. Elizabeth kissed her contented sister on the cheek. Kitty bobbed excitedly up and down on her toes. I have so much to do. We were unable to do any stitching at all on my gown at aunt's yesterday, and I worry my trousseau will not be ready in time for the wedding. Oh, I do hope we receive confirmation from Denny's parish soon. I can hardly wait to marry him and travel to Bath. Continuing without pause for breath, Kitty added, I had planned to go into Meryton today. Mrs. Burke told me she would have some new gloves soon, and I had hoped to get them for Denny. However, my gown is in desperate need of my attention. Mary and Lydia will have to go without me. Mary and Lydia may not want to go into the village without you. Perhaps you can convince them to stay at home and help you with your dress. It was the perfect solution. Mother would be every bit as concerned that Kitty looked her best for her grand day and might be persuaded to stay to offer her assistance. True, Mary was only going to walk with us in order to meet Mrs. Thorne anyway. She has been accompanying her on her calls to the poor. When I am married, I plan to help others more than I have done. Denny says that his mother often does charitable work. Elizabeth wrapped her arm around Kitty's shoulders. She would make Mr. Denny a creditable wife, and she was inclined to think Mr. Denny would work equally hard to prove himself a worthy husband. They would only be one step above poor, but they would be happy. Help me convince Mama to stay home then, and we will all help you with your gown today. Kitty turned to squeeze Elizabeth. You are the best sister. Thank you, Lizzie. You may have to tear out most of my stitches and thus regret my offer of help, but the lace shall be attached to your dress today. That I can offer. You tease me. You are not entirely helpless with a needle when you decide to do the work properly. You are much better at it than Lydia. Elizabeth groaned. Lydia was much better at disassembling her sister's dresses for the few frills adorning them for her own gowns. We shall let her do the hem. With a giggle, Kitty ran back upstairs to fetch her gown and its trimmings while Elizabeth settled into the front parlour, content she had taken a long walk that morning. It looked to be a long, dull morning, and the sun beaming through the windows taunted her for choosing to punish herself by sewing all day indoors. Elizabeth chose a spot on the settee with her back to the window and selected a needle for her morning's work. Sacrifices must be made. One day indoors would not harm her. If anything, it would improve her complexion. She had too many freckles. Convincing herself of the advantages of staying out of the beckoning sun, she reasoned she would not meet Miss Bingley or Mrs. Hurst by chance and thus be forced to converse with them. There were many benefits with which she attempted to persuade herself of the advantages of her plan. However, the only one which held any weight was the possibility Mr. Darcy might call. The conversation around the breakfast table was full of lace, buttons, and other concerns suitable to a wedding. Elizabeth contributed more to the conversation than she would have under normal circumstances, earning several raisings of the eyebrows from both Mary and Jane. But Elizabeth was too satisfied to give the matter too much care. Her plan met with success. Jane would not leave when Mr. Bingley would call anyway, and Mary was perfectly happy to go into the village accompanied by the maid, who offered to call at the haberdashery to check on Kitty's gloves for Mr. Denny, as well as run some errands for Mrs. Hill. Mother, in the hope Mr. Darcy might call, along with Mr. Bingley, cleared the parlour of every evidence of their work of the morning. Do you suppose Lady Catherine will present her card with Mr. Darcy? she asked, picking pieces of thread from the carpet and flicking them into the fireplace. Elizabeth certainly hoped not. Mary, whom Mother had obligated to stay long enough to see if Colonel Fitzwilliam might accompany Mr. Darcy on his call, said, I should very much like to meet Lady Catherine. Mr. Collins spoke highly of her. Elizabeth admitted to a certain curiosity about Lady Catherine. Could Mr. Collins' claims about the greatness of the lady possibly be true? 
that she was an imposing figure, she surmised from his accounts, as well as Lady Catherine's connection to Mr. Darcy, only a woman accustomed to getting her way would insist on an engagement he could not have entered into. Carriage wheels and crunching gravel under horses' hooves caused the usual mad rush of pinching cheeks, adjusting ribbons and curls, and shoving any unwanted items under cushions. By the time the callers were announced, skirts were straightened, cheeks were bright pink, bruised and raw, but pretty nonetheless, and each member of the family posed to their best advantage to receive them, lest Mother attack their cheeks again. The butler announced, Mr. Darcy, Colonel Fitzwilliam, and Lady Catherine de Bourg are... Mother interrupted him with the impatient clapping of her hands. Elizabeth wished she could share in her enthusiasm, but she did not trust Mother not to say something unfortunate. Father raised his bushy eyebrows, grinning mischievously. Oh, people, see them in. He winked at Elizabeth, and she wished, not for the first time, that he could be trusted to keep Mother in check. He took too much enjoyment in her blunders, though, and she knew he would be no help at all. Three shadows darkened the doorway before the lady who could only be Lady Catherine de Bourgh filled the small room with her puffed, powdered hair and swishing silk skirts, the picture of a duchess from another era. Elizabeth doubted her outdated style was not done on purpose, but rather of a clearly calculated and impressively persuasive desire to emit a sense of grandeur. Her coiffure was as high as her sense of self-importance, suggested by the tilt of her chin and the look of disdain with which she regarded Elizabeth down the length of her aristocratic nose. Lady Catherine could impose or demand whatever she pleased. Elizabeth's courage always rose with every attempt to intimidate her. She could handle it with a sense of humour. The real challenge would be not to laugh while she did so. Colonel Fitzwilliam seemed to share in her glee. Entering the room behind his aunt, he only slightly attempted to conceal his large grin. His cousin, on the other hand, did not look amused in the least. Dark thunderclouds hung over Mr. Darcy, and the sight of them made Elizabeth determined to behave herself. Mother rose to receive them, curtsying so deeply and enthusiastically She had to use the table to prop herself up before she landed unceremoniously on the floor at Lady Catherine's feet. Lydia giggled. Father cleared his throat to conceal his reaction, and thus began what could only prove to be a call about which Elizabeth would laugh years from now. At that moment, however, the full gravity of her situation came crashing down around her with the weight of Mr. Darcy's scowl. Wobbling up to her feet, Mother had hardly asked Betsy to bring in the tea set, with a meaningful arch of the eyebrow to imply that the best china be used, when Lady Catherine crossed the room to stand in front of Elizabeth. You must be Miss Elizabeth, she accused. Elizabeth met Lady Catherine's glare with confidence as the great lady inspected her from head to toe. I am. Mr. Darcy stepped forward to interfere place irons on his aunt's hands before she clawed her with her fingernails, or politely do what was most expected and perform introductions, Elizabeth would never know because he was interrupted. Are the rumours true? Have you used your feminine devices against my nephew in order to seduce him into an uneven marriage? The elderly woman's acrid breath reeked of stale coffee. Mr. Darcy boomed authoritatively, Lady Catherine, I must insist you behave with the decorum expected from one of your station. He stepped forward to take his aunt's arm. Colonel Fitzwilliam stood at her other side. His smile was gone. Elizabeth was grateful the colonel did not wear his sword, nor any other weapon, for she believed Lady Catherine capable of running her through in the middle of her family's parlour. Consequences be damned. Lady Catherine trembled in her ire, small red veins running through the whites of her cold, grey eyes, reflecting the blood she wished to draw. Father's smile, like the colonel's, had disappeared. Not even he could ignore the tension in the room. Please, be so kind as to have a seat. We are pleased to welcome you into our home. 
This he addressed principally to Mr. Darcy and Colonel Fitzwilliam in a quiet voice. A subtle cut, but a cut nonetheless. Well done, Papa. As for herself, Elizabeth stood still and calm, seemingly unaffected by Lady Catherine's tirade. No one else could see how rapidly her heart beat against her ribs, nor would she give the lady the satisfaction of observing any reaction other than disinterested coolness. The gentlemen flanked their aunt on the sofa nearest the fireplace. Lady Catherine was going to great lengths to express her discomfort on the lumpy furniture with multiple sighs and huffs. Betsy brought the tea tray in, the cups clattering against the saucers in her shaking hands, and Lady Catherine pursed her lips in disapproval when Mother poured. Nothing they could do would meet her impossible standards. But there was a silver lining in that knowledge. It made her criticism bearable, for if Elizabeth was certain of anything, it was that there would be criticism. Mr. Darcy shifted his weight, accepting with a quiet mumble of gratitude the tea offered him. Lady Catherine took a sip, wrinkled her hawkish nose, set her cup and saucer down on the table, and said, "'You can be at no loss to understand my motive in paying a call.' Her narrowed eyes focused solely on Elizabeth. "'You are mistaken, your ladyship. I cannot fathom the purpose for your call unless you bear news of my father's cousin, Mr. Collins. Is he well?' Elizabeth added a hint of a smile. She knew it would provoke Lady Catherine further, but she could not help herself. From the corner of her eye, she saw Colonel Fitzwilliam's appreciation of her reply, even if Mr. Darcy did not. What was he thinking? He brooded in surly silence, but he sat forward on the sofa as if ready for action, as if he deeply regretted this call. You are an insolent girl. A country bumpkin too insignificant for any one of worth to notice, observed Lady Catherine. Aunt Catherine, Mr. Darcy warned. The venomous words had no effect on Elizabeth, for she could not fail to appreciate their irony. She was not as insignificant as Lady Catherine supposed if her own nephew had taken notice of her. Father cleared his throat. My daughter possesses a strong character earned through extensive reading on a variety of subjects. It is more than can be said for most young ladies who see no benefit to improving their minds as she has. Elizabeth inwardly applauded her father's defence. Even though she knew society would be shocked, he took pride in having an intelligent daughter. Lady Catherine clearly upheld society's views. You would praise your daughter for making herself a blue stocking. Turning to Mr. Darcy, she asked, Are the halls of Pemberley to be thus polluted? Mr. Darcy rose, holding his hand out to assist his aunt up. To father, he said, I apologise, Mr. Bennet. We will take our leave immediately. Father gaped at them. To their credit, Elizabeth's sisters remained silent. Jane reached over to squeeze Elizabeth's hand but Elizabeth knew her sweet sister would never engage in a confrontation unless she felt she could dissolve it. Her strengths lie in comforting after the damage had been done, but Elizabeth would need no comfort. She was too angry. She felt her nostrils flare out and her blood boil. Why had Colonel Fitzwilliam not worn his sword? T'was a pity. Lady Catherine looked at Mr. Darcy defiantly as Colonel Fitzwilliam rose and held his hand out expectantly to his aunt on the opposite side. She gave no indication of being willing to leave. It was all Elizabeth could do not to burst out in laughter. The relief she felt knowing Mr. Darcy's family was as far from perfect as her own was tremendous. The image of him and the colonel carrying Lady Catherine out of the parlour by force, tossing her over their shoulders like a sack of potatoes, was precious. She would remember this moment every time she saw Lady Catherine, which she prayed would not be often. Lady Catherine was spared a humiliating departure when Mother stood. With a calm composure Elizabeth had never seen in Mother's possession, and which as a consequence shocked Elizabeth, her father and her sisters, Mother said, Elizabeth, you stay. 
Jane, Kitty, Mary, Lydia, would you be so kind as to go about to the rose bush and select the finest blooms to adorn our table for dinner this evening? I want a word with Lady Catherine before she leaves Longbourn forever. Only Lydia and Jane hesitated. Lydia, no doubt, because she wished to witness the dramatic comedy of errors playing in the parlour. Jane only closed the door behind her when Elizabeth nodded at her. She would be well. She could take care of herself before the likes of Lady Catherine. She was not certain Lady Catherine would fare so well before Mother. The door clicked and Mother continued. You come to my home, attack my daughter before even being presented, accusing her of being anything but honest with Mr Darcy and all the while belittling us with your sarcastic remarks. I understand you are under the false assumption that Mr Darcy is engaged to another. Dare you question his honour to his face before witnesses? Elizabeth held her breath. What Mother said was bold and brave and wonderful. However, it could not continue, not with what she knew. Lady Catherine was above answering questions which did not suit her. She lifted her chin and looked regally off to the side, as if the conversation were too dull to participate in. Mr. Darcy answered, I am under no obligation to Mr. Berg. I would never pursue a courtship with another were I not free to do so. Elizabeth had known it, but still her breaths came easier on its confirmation. Lady Catherine whipped her face around to face him and commenced a staring match from which neither of them would back down. You have been engaged these many years to Anne. It was agreed upon at her birth. Mother ignored her. Of course not, Mr. Darcy. We know you to be an honourable gentleman and above such underhanded dealings. A self-satisfied smile brought a happy flush to Mother's cheeks, and she flicked her fan out, her wrists waving her accessory with a superior air. When a smile crept up one side of her mouth, Elizabeth saw the accusation coming. She had to try something. Is Mr. Berg well? Elizabeth asked. Her question was met with silence. Mother continued, If Mr. Berg is engaged these many years to Mr. Darcy, why does she not appear? Is her health so poor she cannot defend herself and must rely on her mother to arrange her affairs? Would the halls of Pemberley support such a weak mistress? My Lizzie will fight for the gentleman fortunate enough to win her heart. I pity you and your daughter if you think you can come here and intimidate her. She closed her fan, smacking it against her palm. Father set his untouched teacup on the table, not even noticing an open book was there. Well put, my love, he said, for once giving more attention to mother than to his reading material. Elizabeth was filled with both pride and shame. Pride in her mother's defence of her. Shame it had not been her father to do so in a more tactful manner. Pride in the rational argument Mother had presented, as well as her uncharacteristic use of sarcasm to prove her point. Shame at how effectively the rude comment had cut Mr. Darcy's aunt. It was something Elizabeth would have said, only to wish it unsaid. She felt Mr. Darcy's eyes burning on her skin and looked up to meet his stare. She could not bring herself to pretend to be anything but what she was. Trapped in a tower of conflicting emotions between two fire-breathing dragons at cross-purposes. Chapter 8 Darcy wanted nothing more than to profess the ardour of his affection to Elizabeth. Had she not asked him for more time, he would have thrown caution to the wind and dropped down to one knee on the worn carpet in Longbourn's front parlour, there was no room in his heart for anyone other than her. He appraised the mix of emotions fleeting across her face. He wished he could be more like her. A world of pride, embarrassment and uncertainty, enough to fill a fashionable novel, could be read in her expression. She had not learnt the necessity of disguise, a loathsome skill he despised to mask her vulnerabilities. He prayed she never would. Mrs. Bennet's reply to Aunt Catherine had been deserved. 
and he could not fault her in saying it, when a daughter of an earl who ought to be exemplary in deportment had acted abominably in a stranger's home. However, he did not wish for Miss Elizabeth to suffer for her mother's plain speech. She was no more responsible for her mother's words and deeds than he was for his Aunt Catherine's. But the uncertainty? Did Elizabeth doubt him, or was she merely curious? An inquisitive mind such as hers would want to understand how such a misunderstanding had come about, how it had endured the passing of the years, and why his aunt would even consider a sickly young lady as a suitable wife for him. He, too, had questioned it. Until yesterday. Now he understood completely, and it pained him. It would not change his future nor his choice in a wife, but he would have to delay his happiness until he could do what he could for Anne. His honour demanded as much. I know of your daughter's illness. Mrs. Bennet spoke the damning words softly, but their effect penetrated Darcy to his bones. Aunt Catherine gasped before she composed herself. Richard went completely still. In a forcibly casual voice, Aunt Catherine said, "'What do you know of her illness? "'Mr. Collins has not bored you with the details of her concerns, has he?' "'Mrs. Bennet's face was unchanged. "'Crossing her arms and tapping her fan against her arm, she said, "'I know enough.' "'Did she really know?' "'Darcy dared not react on the chance she knew no more than anyone else. "'Anne had always suffered from poor health.' That fact was well known. Could Mrs. Molly have revealed her secret? Why would she do so at the risk of her employment? He and Tanner had been agonisingly specific what the consequences would be. Darcy would ask Elizabeth. If Mrs. Bennet's words were merely a bluff, he could confide in her, trusting her to keep his family secret safe, just as she protected Georgiana's reputation and her sister's happiness. "'You know nothing,' Aunt Catherine said, her unwavering glare focused intently on Mrs. Bennet. Her intimidating look only encouraged the matron, who seemed to enjoy the attention and recently acquired power. "'I assure you I do. <laughs> However, I am able to keep a secret.' All I ask in return for my silence is for you to keep your peace about this imaginary engagement between your daughter and Mr. Darcy. <laughs> Let us leave the decision for Mr. Darcy to make. It was not a bad idea, and Darcy had to admit to a small amount of admiration for how well Mrs. Bennet manipulated the situation for the advantage of her daughter. However... Aunt Catherine also acted on behalf of the best interest of her daughter. Two women with the same purpose, neither of them willing to back down until their goal was met. This could not end well. As Darcy knew she would, Aunt Catherine balked. The decision was made long ago. If Darcy refuses to honour it, he will have to live with the consequences. Mrs. Bennet sucked air through her nose and sat back in her chair. Then you leave me no choice but to spread word all over Meryton about Mr. Berg's illness. It is a marvel you have been able to keep it a secret this long. It was a marvel, but it explained so many things. Darcy searched Mrs. Bennet's face for any sign indicating a lack of confidence in her knowledge. But she was an excellent actress, and very convincing. He took notice of Elizabeth again, but he only observed frustration. Had Mrs. Bennet confided her knowledge, if indeed she had any, to her? Elizabeth turned her attention away from her mother to him. Their eyes met. How he wished he could speak with her alone. He would ask her directly about Anne, although from the way she chewed the corner of her lip and arched one of her eyebrows in a question mark... She was as uncertain as he was about what Mrs. Bennet knew. He would tell her. He would soothe her brow and explain the actions he must take so she would have no cause to doubt him. Aunt Catherine pounded her cane against the floor, interrupting his flashing thoughts. 
Extending her cane and pointing it at Mrs. Bennet, she said, "'The world would be a better place if you did not occupy space in it, madam. I curse the circumstances which brought you into my acquaintance and have determined to treat you as if you are dead to me. Nothing you can say against the Darcy family or the house of de Berg will stand. It will be your word against ours, and believe me when I tell you how badly you will fail.' We are too far above your influence. She turned, offering no curtsy or words of departure to soften her threats. Darcy pinched the back of his neck. It would take a miracle, or several sought-after antiquated tomes, of which Darcy was gratefully in possession, for Mr. Bennet to allow him to call at Longbourn after today's disaster. Darcy had assumed Aunt Catherine would behave herself, that his presence when she called was preferable to her calling alone. He had underestimated her desperation. Aunt Catherine was two paces from the door when it opened, and more callers were announced. Mr. Bingley, Miss Bingley and Mrs. Hurst wish to know if the family is in, said the house servant. Obviously they were in. It would shock Darcy if they had not heard Aunt Catherine's heated threats from the threshold. He hoped Mrs. Bennet had the grace to send them away. When her cheeks turned red with pleasure and she clapped her hands together, Darcy groaned. Gloating at Aunt Catherine, Mrs. Bennet instructed, Please see them in. We always welcome our friends with open arms and call my girls indoors. Mr. Bingley will want to see my beautiful Jane. Aunt Catherine was forced to move out of the way when Bingley entered the room, looking as if he would rather be anywhere but where he presently was. Lovely. All of her favourite people in the world were gathered in their crowded parlour. Elizabeth had never been in a room with so many uncomfortable people in it before. She was certain she would laugh about it at a later date, much later, she was inclined to think. Father jumped up from his chair, motioning for their newly arrived callers to have a seat and making Mr. Bingley feel all the more uncomfortable when he insisted that the young man take his chair. Rubbing his hands together and grinning, Father said, Ah, more people. Welcome, welcome. This has been the most diverting afternoon, and I welcome you to join us in the entertainments. Was everything a parody to him? While Elizabeth could appreciate the humour in most situations, this most assuredly was not the time to laugh. Had not Lady Catherine threatened Mother's life only moments ago? Mr Bingley's pink face darkened to a brilliant shade of red, and his eyes latched gratefully onto Jane when she entered the room. It is about time we were allowed indoors. It will be a miracle if we do not catch our death from a chill, complained Lydia, turning her back to their company, there being no wholly unattached gentleman present to tempt her charm, and taking a place close to the fire. Not everyone in the room was acquainted, although Elizabeth imagined Miss Bingley knew very well who Lady Catherine was. She would leave no important details such as that to chance, and so it fell on Mr. Darcy to perform introductions, which he did civilly. With a sickeningly sweet smile and a breathy voice, Miss Bingley said, Lady Catherine, it is an honour to finally make your acquaintance. You are spoken so well of in the highest circles. It truly is an honour. Lady Catherine responded to her flattery with a queenly nod. Mrs. Hurst continued, and Mr. Berg, is she well? We would so love to improve our circle by making her acquaintance. Flattery softened Lady Catherine further. She was fatigued from our recent travels and is resting at the inn in Meryton. To that, both of Mr. Bingley's sisters raised their hands to cover their gasps. Miss Bingley recovered from her exaggerated shock first. Oh, no, that will not do. A great lady such as you staying at a common inn? No, it will not do. You simply must allow us to extend our hospitality to you. Please do us the honour of receiving you and Mr. Berg at Netherfield Park, she implored, 
without so much as an inquiring glance at her brother, the master of the house. The gentlemen in the room shifted their weight in their chairs. Even Mr. Darcy, who Elizabeth knew had recently returned to Netherfield Park, a guest at Mr. Bingley's request. What was Miss Bingley thinking in inviting Lady Catherine without the permission of her brother? Did she hope to befriend the elderly woman and fall into her good grace with the hopes of acquiring her blessing for her to marry Mr. Darcy? Elizabeth could think of no other reason. Miss Bingley was in for a rude awakening. Poor Mr. Bingley was backed into a corner, and he was much too polite to claw his way out of it. Fortunately for him, Mr. Darcy gave Lady Catherine a reason to refuse Miss Bingley's offer. My aunt's visit to Meryton is so brief. Another move would hardly be worth the trouble. Lady Catherine arched her head back to better look down at him from the tip of her nose, before turning her attention to Miss Bingley. Your family is in trade, are they not? Miss Bingley jutted out her chin, the bane of her existence having been vocalised by her social superior. Her mottled complexion exposed the depth of the cut, but her tone revealed nothing untoward. Her father dabbled in trade, but he soon grew bored with it when our fortune doubled. Elizabeth bit her tongue and her lips, too, for good measure. For all she knew, Mr. Bingley's father was still involved in trade, and while he sought to give his children all the advantages of the gentle class, the taint of trade loomed over them, no matter how badly Miss Bingley wished for it not to. Lady Catherine paused, considering long enough for Mr. Bingley to lose his blush and relax his shoulders. Mr. Darcy's countenance remained unchanged, but Elizabeth noticed how he controlled his breath. She would learn to read him yet. "'Very well. I accept your offer,' snapped Lady Catherine." Elizabeth swore she heard teeth grinding, but she was too busy watching Mr. Darcy to notice from whence the sound came. His fists clenched at his sides, and the muscles at his jaw flinched. He was not pleased. Jane said, There is no better place than Netherfield Park for one who feels the slightest onset of an illness. Mr. Berg will be comfortable there. She would focus on the positive. Mr. Bingley smiled at her, and her soft-spoken calmness gave him boldness. We will do our best. I will have my housekeeper ready the rooms immediately for Lady Catherine and Mr. Berg. Miss Bingley added, You must have her prepare the guest room where Miss Bennet stayed. The view of the lake is incomparable. Mr. Bingley shook his head, widening his eyes, but Miss Bingley gave him no opportunity to explain her suggestion nor his averse reaction to it. It did Miss Bennet well, and we shall give Mr. Berg every advantage we have given our other guests, she added with a pointed look at Jane, who, Elizabeth noted with pride, met her haughty gaze levelly. Of course, Mr. Bingley would treat all of his guests with the same generosity he has always bestowed on his best of friends, said Jane in his defence and her own. Mr. Bingley dabbed his forehead with a handkerchief while his sister sneered at Jane. He said, I will leave it to Mrs. Harris to decide which rooms best suit our new guests. Elizabeth tried to imagine why he would become so upset at the suggestion that another lady stay in the same room Jane had occupied. Or was he upset because Miss Bingley suggested Jane was sickly? Lady Catherine not caring about anyone's comfort but her own, said, I will have my servants pack my things to depart for Netherfield Park on the morrow. I do not want to disturb Anne until she is sufficiently recovered. The decision made, the first party of callers rose to take their leave, as did Miss Bingley and Mrs. Hurst. Mr. Bingley remained seated, his eyes fixed on Jane. He only realised he was the only person sitting when Miss Bingley hissed at him. Charles, we must return to Netherfield Park. There are many preparations to be made. Lady Catherine is not coming until tomorrow. Mrs. Hurst insisted. There is much to do. 
Mr. Bingley appeared willing to defy his sisters and stay for the remainder of his call, but they were already walking out of the parlour. Elizabeth could not hear what Jane whispered to him, but it returned his good humour and he joined his family. Mr. Darcy stood to one side of the door, his gaze beckoning Elizabeth to draw closer. Does Mrs. Bennet know the nature of Anne's illness? He asked in a voice so quiet, Elizabeth strained her ears to hear. She was quick to reassure him. No. Before she could say anything more, Lady Catherine's shrill tone echoed to them from the front of the house. Darcy! Darcy! I need you! His eyes searched her face, just as she searched for answers he could not give her then. And with a bow, Mr. Darcy left her to attend to Lady Catherine, leaving Elizabeth to wonder at the success of her plan. Betsy entered the room, her arms laden with wrapped packages. Mr. Darcy left these for you, Mr. Bennet. Father cheered greatly on removing the paper, although some of Mr. Darcy's selections were decidedly odd in his opinion. Mary and Elizabeth were quick to take said tomes off his hands. Now that the prized novel was in her possession, she tried to take as much pleasure in it as she would have the previous evening. Sitting closer to the light of the fire, she read the first paragraph several times before giving in to the meditations of her heart to stare blankly at the page until the words blurred and she saw only Mr. Darcy. Chapter 9 Elizabeth sipped her cooling tea and pushed her breakfast roll around on her plate. Excitement buzzed around the table. The day of the regimental parade had finally arrived, but she could not share in Mother's and her sister's anticipation. Father, having the excuse of new literature to peruse, would stay home with his books. A piece of bread flew across the table and bounced off her forehead. Only Lydia would be so indecorous as to throw food. Be happy, Lizzie. You are being a killjoy and shall ruin our day, Lydia pouted. She, of course, held hopes that an officer who was secretly rich and titled would see her at the parade and sweep her off to Gretna Green so they could marry before Kitty, then continue on to his castle where servants would wait on her hand and foot all day. Elizabeth forced a smile. There was no need to spoil everyone's fun merely because of her momentary lapse of cheer. Mother considered her, growing more serious the longer she did so. If only Mr. Darcy would propose. I do hope Lady Catherine took my warning seriously and does not spread the news of his engagement to Mr. Berg around the village. He is not engaged, Mamma. Elizabeth said though the damage that could be done if the falsehood spread through Meryton was ever present in her mind, he would be pressed to honour it. It only remained to be seen whose expectations he chose to honour, his family's and society's demands, which he had been raised to hold of the highest importance, or his own feelings and hers, of which she had given him precious little encouragement. Well, I declare, I would be very put out in her situation, said Lydia, greedily drinking her chocolate. Why is that? Mother poured more tea around the table. With Lady Catherine and her sickly daughter as guests at Netherfield Park, they have the perfect opportunity to arrange a compromise. Nothing can stop them from trapping Mr. Darcy and taking the choice of his bride away from him entirely. The bite of sausage Mother held dropped from her fingers, landing in her chocolate and staining the white tablecloth. Why had I not thought of that? she exclaimed, dabbing at the front of her dress absent-mindedly. Oh, if I could have arranged for Lizzie to fall ill at Netherfield Park as I did Jane. Oh, it worked out quite well for you, dear. She beamed at Jane, who looked horrified Mother would compromise the health of another daughter for the sake of an engagement. At least that was what Elizabeth thought. Mother, I doubt Lady Catherine is as mercenary as you are in your efforts to marry her offspring. Now, that was not entirely true. Elizabeth had seen the cold glint in Lady Catherine's eyes and the manipulative calculating when she accepted Miss Bingley's presumptuous offer of hospitality. She just might resort to something desperate to trap Mr. Darcy to do something he would not otherwise do. 
Elizabeth's heartbeat echoed through her empty chest. Mother stirred her spoon in her cup, the forgotten bit of sausage bumping against her upper lip when she sipped her chocolate. Draining the contents of her cup, meat and all, Mother announced, I will simply have to ask Miss de Berg what her intentions are toward Mr. Darcy. Suppose she is opposed to the match, and she would not participate in her mother's schemes. No, Mamma, you must not. You have not been introduced, and she would take offence if you speak of her affairs. Elizabeth could only imagine the repercussions of such a bold act, no matter how poorly Lady Catherine had behaved. And Elizabeth knew she would have been much worse without the presence of her nephews to subdue her. They ought not return like for like. Mother waved off her warning. Nonsense, Lizzie. Today is the parade, and surely Mr. Berg will take pleasure in watching the handsome officers march down the street in their dashing uniforms. It would be nothing for me to chance across her path, make her acquaintance, and mention Mr. Darcy. Mary asked, How do you plan to rid her of Lady Catherine? Mother's eyes widened, but she shrugged. I will think of something. I usually do. After an initial burst of panic, Elizabeth gathered her wits. She knew Mother too well to believe she could be dissuaded once she set her mind on a purpose. She had to intercept. She would have to beat Mother into Meryton and convince Mr. Tanner to encourage Mr. Berg to watch the parade from the comfort of her room. So long as her room faced the street, oh, she would have to find out. Mother hurried to finish her meal, and Elizabeth pushed her plate away. She could not eat a bite with the knots tying up her stomach. One altercation between Mother and Lady Catherine had been enough. Elizabeth dreaded to think of what would happen should the two ladies meet again. Her sisters, wearing their best dresses and looking their most presentable, would ride in the carriage with Mother. They would arrive before the parade to give Mother enough time to go to Aunt Phillips and then to the haberdashery to discern what the gossip concerning Mr. Berg was. Like a predator, Mother was sizing up her prey so as to better take her down. Elizabeth dashed upstairs to change her dress and on her pelisse. The sky was blue, but the air felt heavy with humidity. Looking out of the window, Elizabeth saw storm clouds coming their way. She hoped it would not rain until after the parade. It would be a pity to muddy all those polished boots the militia prided themselves in shining into mirrors, reflecting everything and everyone they walked past. Straightening her bonnet and tying the ribbon loosely around her chin, she skipped down the stairs and nearly ran into Mrs. Hill as she passed the door to the dining room. She reached out to ensure herself the elderly woman was unharmed. "'I am sorry, Mrs. Hill,' I did not expect to find you here. It is I who should apologise, Miss Elizabeth. I never intended for Mrs. Bennet to use Mr. Berg's illness against her, nor of the supposed engagement to Mr. Darcy. I fear this is all my fault. She will ruin everything for you. Mrs. Hill twisted her hands together, her chin quivering. It is hardly your fault, Mrs. Hill. Please do not concern yourself. She must be stopped, all the same, or she will ruin everything for you and Miss Jane. Think nothing of it, I beg you. I plan to speak to Mr. Tanner to encourage Mr. Berg to observe the parade from the comfort of her room. Does her room face the street? asked Mrs. Hill. Elizabeth did not know, but she was not about to admit as much to Mrs. Hill just when the housekeeper had begun to calm herself. I suspect it does. If not, I can inquire if there is an unoccupied room at the inn which could serve as her private observation room. Mrs. Hill nodded slowly. It could work. It has to, and so it will. Very well, Miss Elizabeth. You have calmed my worries, and I thank you for it. When you return, I would love to hear about the parade. I am unable to get away to see it. But I should very much like to hear your account of it, if you do not mind indulging an old woman. Elizabeth smiled at her. Of course, I shall remember every detail and relate them to you over cake in the kitchen. Mrs. Hill bemoaned. Miss Lydia raided the larder last night and ate what was left. 
I had hoped to save some for Mrs. Thorne. Oh, she loves my cakes. Cook's meals were delicious, but the cakes Mrs. Hill's grandmother had taught her were better. Elizabeth laughed. No matter. Too much cake would only give me a stomachache anyway, and Mrs. Thorne is forever saying to resist our weaknesses, of which your cake is decidedly her weakness. With that, Elizabeth left Longbourn feeling much more optimistic about her plan to keep Mr. Berg indoors, and thus prevent Mother from interfering where she did not belong. Thunder boomed and echoed over the fields. Elizabeth looked up at the dark clouds rolling toward Meryton. While rain would suit her purpose perfectly, she was not ready for the good weather to depart them yet. The ominous clouds filled her with a sense of foreboding, so that she wished them away all the more enthusiastically. Her plan would meet with success, and that was all she would allow herself to think. What could possibly go wrong? Darcy saw her slender figure ahead, and he tapped the sides of his stallion with the soles of his boots. Richard kept up with him, and soon they had overtaken Miss Elizabeth. While Darcy had hoped to meet her, he would have preferred for her to walk with a companion. Meryton was a quiet village, and Miss Elizabeth was liked by all. But the militia had brought their usual troubles with them. Was Wickham's murder not enough evidence of that? And they had yet to depart. Until they did, Darcy wished Miss Elizabeth would not expose herself to unnecessary danger. She turned to look at them, her cheeks dimpling and her eyes sparkling when she saw him. It was a welcome sight after his disastrous call with Aunt Catherine the previous afternoon. Unfortunately, in true Darcy fashion, he said what was on his mind instead of what he ought to have said. What are you doing walking unaccompanied? He heard Richard cluck his tongue. Miss Elizabeth seemed to understand his meaning. Instead of assuming he meant the worst, as was her fashion, she widened her smile. I am not doing anything I have not done before without harm befalling me. Good. She had understood his intention. I do not doubt your ability to defend yourself. I know you to possess an ear-piercing scream and a set of sharp teeth. He rubbed his fingers, which had fallen victim to her fierce bite in Bingley's library only weeks before. I do, however, wish you to always be safe, and you cannot deny that there is strength in numbers. It is kind of you to concern yourself over my safety, Mr. Darcy. Thank you. Now, tell me, please, what brings you two gentlemen to Meryton? It is too early for the parade. Darcy scoffed. The mischievous arch in her brow told him how aware she was of his disinterest in anything related to the militia. I must pay a call on my cousin. The joy which he had grown accustomed to seeing adorn her beautiful face disappeared. You aim to call on Mr. Berg? she asked in a hushed voice. Yes, I have some matters of a personal nature to discuss with her. Now she wore a frown. Richard sighed loud enough for Darcy to hear it. What? He spoke the truth, nothing more and nothing less. Elizabeth looked directly in front of her as they walked. Lady Catherine will be content to receive you, no doubt. I aim to placate her while attending to Anne. If they would ever have peace in their household, assuming Elizabeth would eventually agree to marry him, he must put Aunt Catherine in her place in such a way she was content with it. There was no other way. Richard groaned. What? It was to Elizabeth's benefit that Aunt Catherine lose interest in persecuting her. She would make Elizabeth miserable, and Darcy was not willing to risk losing her due to his misbehaving relatives. Elizabeth pinched her lips together. The bite in the winter breeze kissed her face with charming vivacity. That will please your aunt as well as it will please society. I wish you all happy. Her words were as sharp as a sword and cut his pride where it was most vulnerable. You do not believe my will to be stronger than the impositions put upon me by my aunt, or a society for which I could not care less? 
Perry for Perry, Miss Elizabeth. The buildings around the square faded into a blur, but he noticed every stray hair escaping from Elizabeth's pins and every fiery gold fleck in her smouldering eyes. She judged him now, just as she had judged him at Bingley's ball. Once again, he had misread her reaction to suit his preference. What he had believed to be her lively nature was now clearly anger. But two could play at that game. I believe your responsibility for others will outweigh your own desires, whatever they may be. You doubt my wishes when I have stated them plainly to not only you, but to your father? Do you think me so weak? Weak, no. The binds your family places on you. Darcy shoved his fingers through his hair. Family ties such as you describe have no power over my spoken promise. Promise? If you have spoken a promise, it was not spoken to me. Infuriating woman, he had repeated the promise so many times to himself, it was as real to him as if he had said the words aloud. And why had he been unable to voice them? Because she had prevented it by wanting more time. Blast it all! He had granted her time, and now he paid the consequence for giving it to her. Thunder and turf that deteriorated quickly. Richard stood in front of the door to Tanner's Inn, looking between him and Elizabeth, his arms folded over his chest and his feet planted widely in preparation for an attack. Come inside before the two of you make more of a scene and add unnecessarily to your difficulties. If Richard continued his scolding, he would need more than just a wide stance to defend himself. Chapter 10 Tanner took one glance at their party and, without a request for explanation, he led them into the private parlour Aunt Catherine had occupied the day before. He stood by the door with one eye looking out into the hall and the other trained on their group. Just in case Her Majesty returns, Tanner explained. Aunt Catherine was out? Good. Richard stood beside Tanner, cackling. They looked ridiculous guarding the door like that. Darcy resented them, but he could not ask them to leave lest he compromise Elizabeth yet again. Once had been more than enough. Looking at the source of his ire, he said, You refuse to answer my question, Miss Elizabeth. Do you believe me so weak? Does it merit an answer? She took a step forward, and the wave of lavender reaching him nearly soothed his mood. Nearly, but not quite. It was not an appropriate scent for Elizabeth. Cinnamon, now... Wait, wait! She believed him a weakling. Such an accusation could not go unchallenged, nor be distracted, no matter how good she smelled. Breathing through his mouth, since it was much safer than his traitorous nose, he said, It does. You have questioned my constancy. By implying I might be persuaded to act contrary to my own wishes by my relatives and the society with which you equate them. Do you honestly believe me so weak-willed you fear I might succumb to their influence? She did not back down, nor did she pause to think before she spoke. You tell me. You have told me how poor a judge of character I am, and yet you have given me every reason to doubt you this morning. And what is your purpose in coming here, if it is not to interfere with my family's affairs? Her nostrils flared, and her lips thinned into a sharp line. You assume I meant to interfere? Were you not attempting to do so? Is there any other reasonable explanation for you to walk alone into Meryton when you could have waited to travel by carriage with your family? Her eyes narrowed. You assume that because I prefer to walk alone, my sole purpose in coming into the village must be to interfere with your family? Are you still so proud you only think of how everything affects you? I apologise for my ignorance, but the last I checked, the sun and its planets do not revolve around Fitzwilliam Darcy. 
Darcy's temper darkened all the more when he heard chuckles from the ingrates guarding the door. It was time to put this discussion to rest. If I did not know you to be the most stubborn, curious, judgmental, maddening woman of my acquaintance, I would not have to assume what I do. But I know you well enough to give up hope that you will stay out of what does not concern you. Why can you not come into the village and enjoy the militia parade like normal women? Elizabeth's jaw dropped, her forehead furled, and Darcy sensed he was in trouble. He could have borne her wrath better than the hurt which next crossed her semblance. Her lip quivered, and he felt like a horse's rear end. Had he tried, he could not have acted like a worse brute. While Darcy attempted to form an acceptable apology, a difficult task from his lack of practice, Elizabeth spoke. I will admit my purpose in coming to Meryton was to prevent a scene between my mother and your beloved cousin. It is clear to me now that you neither need nor appreciate my help, and so I will take my leave. She strode to the door, and Tanner and Richard moved out of her path. Pausing by Tanner, she said, Please take care to keep Mr. Berg indoors. Perhaps her room, or one overlooking the street, would provide her a better view of the parade without exposing her to those who might poke their noses in others' affairs and bring Mr. Darcy more grief. We cannot have that now, can we? She left the room with her dignity intact and her head held high. Darcy wanted to kick himself. His brother and cousin did not help. As soon as the front door shut more firmly than was necessary, Richard exclaimed, Darcy, you buffoon! Tanner shook his head, expressing his disgust and pity as clearly as Richard voiced it. You realise what you have done, do you not? he asked. It is worse than you know, Tanner. You did not hear what the simpleton said before we arrived here. Darcy, being the socially inept being he is, gave Miss Elizabeth every reason to doubt his attachment to her in favour of Anne. Darcy opened his mouth to contradict him. That had certainly not been his intention. Richard interrupted him, pointing a finger into his chest as he spoke. Do you deny telling Miss Elizabeth that you came into Meryton with the express purpose of calling on Anne, placating our Aunt Catherine and seeing to Anne's welfare? Turner groaned and sank into a chair. You did not. Richard nodded gravely. Oh, yes, he did. Miss Elizabeth could not know how Darcy has been up since dawn, writing letters to knowledgeable doctors, inquiring in such a way as to not raise suspicion about Anne's illness. She does not know what is involved because this numbskull did not tell her. Richard dropped into a seat beside Turner, and both of them glared at Darcy while shaking their heads in horrified disbelief. Darcy clung to the only shred of dignity remaining to him. I could not very well discuss such a matter while we were in the square. If someone overheard, it could mean Anne's life. And did you not think to tell her once we led you into this private room? Why do you think I stood by the door if it was not to prevent anyone, especially her holiness, from overhearing your conversation? growled Tanner. Communication is the key to a happy marriage, Darcy. Richard added in a self-righteous tone that chafed against Darcy's pride. And you are suddenly an expert in marital bliss? What do you know of the subject? Obviously, I know much more than you do, you big oaf. I have not spent the last decade of my life in His Majesty's army in vain. I know how to earn the trust of my men, and any woman I choose as my wife deserves the same courtesy I bestow on them, and more. Any luck on that front? Tanner asked in a casual tone. Richard grinned. There is a certain lady who has caught my eye, and I shall pay a call on her as soon as I have seen Aunt Catherine to Netherfield Park. Well done, man. Tanner smacked him on the arm. Darcy glared at them. You two are pathetic. Not so pathetic as you, little brother. Tanner rose to stand in front of him, resting his calloused hand on Darcy's shoulder. Darcy, 
before you moved out to Bingley's estate, I listened to you ramble on in praise of Miss Elizabeth's independent spirit and strong mind. You praised her capableness as well as her strength under adversity. He could not contradict Tanner, though he wished to, just to be contrary. Tanner continued, Is it not ironic how the very qualities which have won your heart are the same which provoke you? The last trace of Darcy's anger melted away, leaving him exposed. It was a horrible feeling. Only one thought brought him comfort. I love her. Would you have her change? Never, he responded violently. I love her as she is. Then talk to her. Explain yourself. The only close male role model she has had is her father. She undoubtedly thinks you are as inconstant as he proved to be to Mrs. Bennet, as most men are. It pained him to think Elizabeth could compare the ardour of his affection to the fickle fancifulness of her father, or the numerous accounts of philandering gentlemen she read about in the gossip columns of the newspaper. But Richard and Tanner were right. That he had caused her anguish worse than he was experiencing at that moment, for betrayal was infinitely worse than bruised pride, gave him the courage to leave the inn in search of her. A thundercloud rumbled as the drums of the militia began playing for the villagers crowding the sides of the streets. He had best make haste. Elizabeth slammed the door so hard she hoped the glass would shatter into a million pieces, like her heart. She stopped, taking note of how the streets crowded with people, people who would pity her if they suspected how she ached. Tears stung her eyes, but she blinked them back. Lady Lucas stepped out of the shop, leaving the door open. Elizabeth must especially control herself in front of her friends. She would have difficulty concealing the depth of her disappointment to Charlotte and her mother. She had thought Mr. Darcy better than most high-born gentlemen. He was honourable still, perhaps to a fault. Was that the real issue? Could it be that his loyalty to his family was greater than his loyalty to her? Was she asking for too much? Her mind told her she desired more than a woman should expect, that her dreams were unrealistic and fanciful. But her heart demanded undivided love. She could not settle for less without losing a part of herself. One thing was for certain. She could not stand in front of Mr. Tanner's inn any longer. He had said he expected Lady Catherine to return at any moment, and with the sounds of the drums approaching, Elizabeth knew she would arrive sooner rather than later. She had no desire to see the great lady, the ruiner of her happiness. No, that was not fair. Lady Catherine was guilty of nothing more than what her own mother was, seeing that her daughter marry well. It was all Mr. Darcy's fault. Elizabeth looked across the square to the corner where Aunt Phillips's house stood. Lydia already waved her handkerchief, while Aunt Phillips shared in Lydia's excitement. Her remaining three sisters stood like statues beside them. Jane was deep in conversation with Mr. Bingley, who pretended to include Uncle Phillips in their conversation, but obviously only had ears for Jane. Of course, the growing noise of the crowd and the marching men with their flutes and drums meant he had to lean close to her mouth in order to hear anything she wished to communicate. He would feel her breath on his ear, just as she had felt Mr. Darcy's breath tickling her neck when they had been trapped in Mr. Bingley's library. Elizabeth sighed. Mother was nowhere in sight, no doubt spending too long at the haberdashery. Elizabeth really must find her before something dreadful happened. She crossed the street before the militia blocked her passage, covering her head and ducking when the sky cracked like a rifle. A fat raindrop plunked on the rim of her bonnet. The threatening clouds of the morning could not choose a better moment to keep their promise of doom and gloom. Elizabeth welcomed the storm. 
mother was not amongst the crowds lined along the sides of the streets. Elizabeth squeezed through the lengths of the footpath, her concern that mother had slipped through her fingers to cause problems with Mr. Berg weighing heavily on her mind. Looking for an opening to make her way into the haberdashery, Elizabeth had to pass directly by Miss Bingley and Mrs. Hurst. They pretended to be so consumed with the parade they did not see her. It was for the best. Elizabeth had no desire to exchange niceties with them when it was of the utmost importance she find mother. The drums and flutes grew deafeningly loud, and it was a relief when she ducked inside the shop. Nobody was there to greet her, but it was no matter. It would take no time at all to see if mother had fallen asleep in the cushioned chair in the corner. She had done it before, but it would be shocking for her to sleep through the malicious parting parade. Moving through the room quickly, Elizabeth saw the toe of Mother's slipper peeking out from below a collection of peacock and ostrich feathers. Mama, I have been looking for you, Elizabeth said, stepping forward as quickly as her exhale of relief, and promptly freezing at the sight before her. Her limbs too numb to cover her mouth when she screamed, Elizabeth's head swirled with the indelible image of blood dripping over Mother's glassy, unblinking eyes, staring across the wood plank floor where she lay. Chapter 11 Darcy opened the shop door just as a woman screamed, not the sudden, high-pitched shriek of one who had suffered a fright, but the gut-wrenching, heart-ringing bellow of one suffering great distress. It was a sound he would not be able to forget. It had come from Elizabeth. Running to her, he saw her profile. Her hands covered her mouth, and tears spilled down her fingers. When she shifted her weight, he rushed forward to catch her. Her face was ghostly white, and yet she did not move her vision away from the corner, nor did she swoon as he had expected. Darcy followed her gaze. Dear God! His stomach roiled in a wave of nausea. A trail of blood pooled near Elizabeth's feet, the trail of scarlet leading to Mrs. Bennet's bludgeoned forehead. He reached out to Elizabeth with every intention of turning her away, but in one swift whirl she faced his open arms, stepping forward to offer her comfort, Encouraged when her outstretched hand rested against his chest, he promptly jumped away when Elizabeth doubled over and covered his recently washed pressed breeches and polished boots with bile, and he had thought she would faint. Cursing himself for not knowing better, Darcy pulled Elizabeth into his arms, brushing her hair away from her face in case her heaving stomach should find more contents to empty. He could wash later. He would set things right with her later. For now... He must simply hold her. He offered her comfort and a clean handkerchief. When her body trembled, he pressed her firmly against his chest, offering all he had in the way of support. Lord knew she needed it. The arrangements, the selfish mourners who would seek her out when she was the one who must grieve her loss, the filling of the time and space the deceased had once occupied. All of death's responsibilities would fall on her quivering shoulders. And not just any death, a murder. Mere seconds had passed, but everything had changed. Darcy pulled her with him closer to the window, seeking relief from the heaviness surrounding them. The smell of lavender in her hair was a welcome alternative to the acrid aroma clinging to his legs and pooling on the floor. On any other day, the perfume lingering in her curls would have scrambled his senses as they nearly had before. But not now. If anything, her nearness sharpened his awareness. Mrs. Bennet had been murdered. There was another killer in Meryton, and the most obvious suspect was his own Aunt Catherine. Looking around Mrs. Bennet, he focused on what he could see, what could have been used against her as a weapon? Something heavy. The oak tables were heavy, but who could have lifted one and struck Mrs. Bennet as the killer had? The inkwells resting around the legs of the table did not look substantial enough. 
surrounded as she was by feathers, magazines, and embroidered cushions covering assorted pieces of furniture. Not one item on the shelves struck him as a likely weapon. He looked again. What was missing? Creaking floorboards alerted Darcy to the presence of others. So intently had Darcy been examining the area around Mrs. Bennet, he had not noticed Mr. Burke creep up behind them. Mr. Burke tugged on his side whiskers, his mouth wide open and his eyes visibly examining the state of his shop floor. Did Darcy imagine it? Or was he more concerned that the blood not stained the planks than in the loss of Mrs. Bennet's life? Mr. Burke, this has been done recently. Who else was in the shop before Miss Elizabeth arrived? Darcy asked, not bothering to hide the bite in his tone. Mr. Burke continued to examine his floor in a shocked stupor. He offered no condolences, nor did he appear overly aghast. Elizabeth stepped out of Darcy's embrace, leaving his arms empty and his chest cold. She dabbed at the beads of sweat covering her blanched face with trembling hands. Her eyes were red-rimmed and bright. He longed to reach out to her, to touch her, but he could see it would not be welcomed by the rigid set of her chin. Her determined face beamed with purpose, and her stony glare rested on Mr. Burke. Rubbing his hands over his face, Mr. Burke said, "'Nobody will want to enter my shop when this is found out. I will be ruined, and now I will never receive payment.' He cut himself short, but his meaning had been clear enough when his eyes flickered between the lifeless figure of Mrs. Bennet and her irate daughter. Elizabeth sucked air in through her gritted teeth, preparing to give an answer she might later regret. You will get what you are owed, Darcy growled. Now, answer my question. Who else was in the shop? Whom did you see? A bead of sweat trickled down Mr. Burke's temple. Nobody. Nobody was here besides me and the labourers unloading the cart. He straightened his posture and clasped his hands together. Once the parade began... I went to the back room to arrange some recently arrived tables and chairs from London. I swear I did not know of Mrs. Bennet's presence, nor that of anyone else. Are the men still here? asked Darcy. No, they just departed. The floor creaked, and a flurry of female voices reached them from behind the counter. Who was there? asked Elizabeth, moving closer to the source of the noise. There was nothing Darcy did not wish her to do more than involve herself in another murder, especially when her mother was the victim. However, he could not stop her. He knew that. Cold, impersonal facts were easier to manage than grief. But Darcy knew grief too well. Elizabeth might be able to put it off for a time, time enough to catch the murderer, if he knew her at all. But it would return with a vengeance and demand her consideration. One never forgot the loss of a mother. All that was left for him was to do all in his power to protect her and lessen her struggles. Darcy stepped out to see from whence the sounds proceeded and was disappointed to see three women come out from a room behind the counter. Mr. Burke had lied. So much for his word. Come no further, Darcy ordered, stopping the two tradeswomen and Mrs. Burke mid-step who he did not see enter the shop until it was too late to prevent her, was Lady Lucas. She looked past him to Elizabeth, who had stepped away to see the ladies as he had. "'My dear Lizzie, are you well? What has happened?' Lady Lucas rushed forward with outstretched hands. "'Please, Lady Lucas, I beg you to come no further,' warned Darcy. Her consideration for Elizabeth warmed his heart and his respect for her increased with the attention she gave her daughter's best friend, but he did not want a room full of delicate females on his hands either. Oh! She moved a hand to cover her mouth. It was too late. She had seen Mrs. Bennet. Darcy lunged toward her as Lady Lucas's eyes rolled back in her head and her body went limp. Mr. Burke caught her by the arm, slowing her fall enough for Darcy to reach her. The other lady stood frozen in the hall, 
each one of them looking as if they might imitate Lady Lucas's example soon. Is there a place she may be laid? Darcy asked. There were other, more important questions to ask, but he could not very well do so until the ladies were seen to. What a bother! Moving them back from whence they had come, Mr. Burke led Darcy into the parlour, where there was a settee and several cushioned chairs arranged around a circular table with a tea service on its surface. Placing Lady Lucas on the settee, Darcy ordered, Do not leave the shop. Better yet, do not leave this room until the hue and cry is done and Mr. Wimple can begin his inquest. To Mr. Burke, he asked, Do you have a boy you can send for the coroner? Mr. Burke, knowing better than to speak any more lies, nodded his head. Before Mr. Burke left in search of the boy, Darcy added, While that is being seen to, be so good as to ask Mr. Tanner to join us here. Addressing the ladies to whom Mr. Burke had sought to protect, and who thus appeared all the more guilty to Darcy, he added, Mrs. Bennet has been bludgeoned to death. We have a killer in our midst. The ladies collectively gasped. Mrs. Burke nearly tripped over her feet in her haste to get the key hanging from a hook behind the counter and lock the door to the shop after Mr. Burke. Already curious people peeked through the windows. Darcy watched Elizabeth struggle to hold back her tears. He wished for her the release a good cry aloud. Even though he had not been close to his father, he had still cried for him. Once had been enough. The death of his mother, on the other hand, he still felt a profound sadness for her, though his tears had dried up years ago. She would have approved of Elizabeth, even now, on what must surely be the worst day of her life. She knelt beside Lady Lucas and asked the upstairs maid lingering in the hall to bring a fresh pot of tea and spirits. Her strength of character in seeing to others, when she was the one needing comfort, strengthened Darcy's resolve to care for her as nobody else would. Elizabeth hated herself for being so weak. She would hide in Mr. Darcy's arms until the worst of the storm had passed if she had her way. He felt safe, but he was not hers. When she made the mistake of peeking over her shoulder at Mr. Darcy, the tears welled up in her throat and made speech impossible. His mask was gone, and she read the emotions of her heart written across his heavy-hearted features. He knew grief. He had lost both of his parents. Had he felt as she did when his father had died? No, she stopped herself firmly. These distressing reflections would add nothing but misery to her dismay. She needed answers, answers about her mother. No, not yet. She could not bear it. Answers for Mr. Darcy. Why had he entered the shop when he did? Had he followed her after their argument? Dare she hope? She hurt too much to deny herself the possibility of her hope. It was the silver lining in her storm cloud, and she clung to it, even though she knew it could ultimately hurt her worse than she felt at the sight of her mother. Guilt and hope... Mother would scold her for mottling her skin and reddening her eyes with tears, and in front of Mr. Darcy at that. But Mother was gone. Once again forcing her thoughts away from the woman whose counsel she had ignored so many times, and which she currently craved, she focused on Mr. Darcy. Nay, not Mr. Darcy any more. William. The small rebellion of thinking his Christian name infused her with courage. She raised William's handkerchief to her eyes, inhaling his calming scent. She should still be angry at him. She was still angry at him. The one person to offer her solace was the very person who could crush her. And yet she was foolish enough to hope. Stupid. A loud pounding on the front door of the shop made Elizabeth stand upright. Her eyes felt hot and swollen, but they were dry. Lady Lucas began to stir. She would wake shortly. The hue and cry? she asked William, moving to the hall. I have seen to it. The coroner? Did anyone send for Mr. Wimple? 
She now had a view of the front door. If she could just keep her mind busy, so busy she had no time to ponder what had happened, why it had happened. I have seen to that as well. Would William leave her nothing to do? Mrs. Burke opened the door and let in two sopping wet men. Mr. Tanner and Mr. Burke shook their coats under the eaves before they stepped indoors. What has happened here? asked Mr. Tanner, his eyes bouncing between Elizabeth and William. The lady stayed in the parlour, so Elizabeth pointed to the far end of the shop. She pointed wordlessly, unable to bring herself to describe the grotesque image which would forever haunt her mind. Mr. Tanner turned to Elizabeth the moment he saw. My deepest condolences, Miss Elizabeth, he said, in as much of a whisper as a man such as he was capable. Where is Colonel Fitzwilliam? I thought he would join you, said William. He stayed behind to assist Lady Catherine to Netherfield Park. His eyes widened as he crossed his arms. Mr. Darcy's jaw clenched. Lady Catherine, had she fulfilled her threats against Mother? Looking at Elizabeth, Mr. Tanner said, I suppose I cannot convince you to leave this investigation to the authorities. I take it Darcy will see a proper investigation is done. He looked at William for answers when she had been asked the question. She was about to respond when another knock rattled the door. Mrs. Burke had had the presence of mind to keep her key in her apron, and she was quick to open the door to admit the coroner. Elizabeth turned her attention back to Mr. Tanner, or anyone else who would attempt to force her to leave the room before she was ready. But a flicker of rose-petal pink and fair hair gave her pause. Jane had followed the coroner, and one step behind her came Mr. Bingley. Jane Spencer was soaked through from the rain outside, and the ringlets which had so elegantly framed her face earlier now clung to her skin. Elizabeth rushed forward to stop her. She must not see Mother as she was. Taking her by the arm, she led her toward the counter. What has happened? I saw the commotion outside the shop and grew worried when neither you nor Mother joined us outside Aunt Phillips to watch the parade. Mother would not miss it for the world unless some accident prevented it. Jane gracefully accepted the dry handkerchief Mr. Bingley pulled up from his waistcoat pocket and dabbed at the raindrops stripping down her face. Elizabeth tried. She really did. But smiles escaped her. William stood beside Mr. Bingley while Mr. Tanner welcomed the coroner who walked past them to Mother. The longer you wait to tell your family, the more difficult it will become, William said in a low tone, as if she did not already know that. Jane's breath shook, but her shoulders relaxed as she exhaled. Mother? she asked, with a strong calm Elizabeth envied. Her emotions were in a turmoil, as tempestuous as the weather beyond the shelter of the shop. Gulping the flurried mass of devastating words down, Elizabeth blurted, Oh, Janie, Mother was murdered! The change in Jane's complexion was not what Elizabeth had expected. Instead of blanching white, Jane's cheeks flushed, and her eyes flashed in what could only be anger, it was short-lived, her spark of wrath soon dampened by a flood of tears. But it had been there, and it brought Elizabeth comfort. The only sentiment she was willing to grasp onto, the only one which would help her family, was her growing anger. Someone had killed her mother. She would find out who it was or perish in her attempt. What sort of coward hits a matron over the head? Elizabeth hugged Jane to her, sisters united in wrath. What are all these ladies doing present? This is a delicate situation, and I cannot do my work effectively if I must also worry about offending their sensibilities. It simply will not do, explained Mr. Wimple, the coroner. Elizabeth felt her chin jut out and her nails bite into her palms. The women, indeed, what were they doing here? Why had Mr. Burke lied about them? What about Mr. Burke? 
How could he not have heard something? And where was Lady Catherine? Lizzie, you are squeezing me, whispered Jane, shaking loose of Elizabeth's firm hold. We will leave, Mr. Wimble. Elizabeth did not agree with her sister's placid obedience at all, but Jane tugged on her arm. Would it be too bold for her to ask William to allow her to stay? Mr. Wimple would never contradict his social superior's wishes. Mr. Bingley, please see the ladies safely to Mrs. Phillips' residence. They need to inform their family of what has transpired, and there are preparations to be made. William did not look at her. Maybe he was scared she would glare him to death. Thank you, Mr. Darcy. Mrs. Bennet cannot stay here, said Mr. Burke. Elizabeth turned her glare on him. You lied, she accused the shopkeeper. He knew something, and she did not want to leave until she knew what he hid. Miss Elizabeth, you must see to your family. I will do my best to inquire to your satisfaction until we can bring in a magistrate. There, William looked at her, pleadingly. It did not help her mood at all to know he was in the right. Her priority should be to attend to her family, but he was leaving her with nothing to do, nothing to help find her mother's murderer, and nothing to prevent the avalanche of emotion from burying her. Mr. Bingley and Jane joined forces against her, each of them taking an arm. Elizabeth would have shaken them off had they not been the only people innocent of her wrath in the entire room. Well, besides Lady Lucas. Elizabeth looked over at William before stepping out of the shop. He was deep in conversation with Mr. Tanner and the coroner, but he met her gaze as the coroner pulled out his pocket watch and pronounced the hour and estimated the time of death. Elizabeth had the sense William wished to say something of importance to her, but, as usual, she could not read his expression well enough to know for certain. Blast the man! She determined to stay angry with him on principle. He should have defended her. He should have known how desperately she needed to stay. He should have chosen her over Miss de Berg. Chapter 12 Darcy, I will stay with the coroner. There is not much to see here which is not blatantly obvious, said Tanner. Where I would appreciate your help is in asking those biddies in the back room why they were here and what they saw or heard. I do not have the delicate manners they would appreciate. And I do, Darcy scoffed. He was not interested in talking with a group of sentimental females when all he wanted was to hold Elizabeth. Tanner nodded. I, you do, much more so than me. Darcy straightened his shoulders. Perhaps they know something. Mr. Burke concealed their presence when I asked him directly if anyone else was in the shop. Mr. Burke, who stood guarding the door a few paces away, heard. Darcy had meant for him, too. The shopkeeper shuffled his feet and looked down at the planks on the floor. He stilled when Darcy added, and I aim to find out why he felt it necessary to lie. Come, Mr. Burke, I would like you to be present. Mr. Burke inclined his head to the coroner where Mr. Wimple stood. What about the body? True, it could not stay in the shop. Mrs. Bennet would need to be buried as soon as he could convince the nearest magistrate to come to Meryton and make arrangements. He was certain Mr. Bennet would draw the same conclusion, but it would take too long to come to it. Tanner tapped his finger against his chin. If we finish here quickly, you have sufficient time to ride to Lord Haversham's estate and return so he can read the coroner's formal findings and examine the body for himself. Mrs. Bennet could be laid to rest on the morrow. It would be a kindness to the Bennets for the burial to be done without delay, agreed Darcy. It was going to be a daunting night, but it would keep the vigil at Longbourn short. Darcy had never understood why it was considered inappropriate for women to be seen crying at a funeral 
when they were responsible for the preparation of the body, as if bathing and clothing a corpse was kinder to their sensibilities than being able to say their final farewells as the closed coffin descended into the ground. I agree. Mr. Wimple, will you see to it that Mrs. Bennet is cleaned and delivered in a cart in the finest lined coffin you can find? I do not want Mr. Bennet or his daughters to bear the burden of making any decisions regarding their deceased loved one. Mr. Wimple opened his mouth, a protest on his tongue. Treat Mrs. Bennet as you would your own mother, and I will trust your judgment will suit the Bennets. Spare nothing, and defer all costs to me. As Darcy suspected, that calmed Mr. Wimple's concern. Money usually did. Turning to Tanner, Darcy said, You mentioned Lord Havisham. You are certain he is the nearest magistrate? He did not know Lord Havisham personally. His family had seen to that. Darcy only knew he was a gentleman to be avoided. Yes, on horseback. You could ride to his estate in... Tanner calculated. And, uh, two hours in this weather. I would recommend you do so. He is an elderly gentleman and will no doubt want to return in his coach. Darcy nodded, departing from Mr. Tanner and Mr. Wimple to see the ladies. Darcy could not make them wait for the magistrate. Lady Lucas sat on the settee. She was as pale as a ghost, but she was awake. Without hesitation, she poured another cup of tea when he walked into the room. Thank you, Lady Lucas. He pulled a chair over to the door to better see all four of the ladies, as well as to spare their sensitive noses from the smell covering his attire. What had they been doing? Darcy could not imagine a commonly held purpose meriting concealment. Ladies often assembled to stitch bandages for soldiers or to knit baby clothes for an expecting family. You have suffered quite a shock today, Darcy said, feeling silly for stating the obvious, but he never had been very good with small talk. What would Richard say? He would get answers without sounding stupid or causing offence. Lady Lucas raised her teacup within inches of her lips, the steam swirled around her face. Mrs. Bennet did not deserve to die as she did, she said softly, and to no one in particular. It was no wonder she was still in shock. Darcy watched the ladies clutch their hands together, pinch their lips, and look at each other out of the corners of their eyes, as if they could reveal a great secret, but had made a pact of silence. It made him angry. If they knew something, anything, they ought to say it. Did you observe anything which might help us along in our investigation? He asked as nicely as he could. Mrs. Burke was quick to answer. No, we were in this room the entire time. We did not even know Mrs. Bennet remained in the shop, though I do recall seeing her enter. You did not wish to observe the parade? Darcy asked. Not much excitement befell villagers such as Meryton. It was an unusual occurrence when an individual would choose to miss an event such as the departure of the militia. I had some business to discuss with the ladies present, and they were kind enough to join me at a time. We knew we would have the opportunity to speak without interruption, answered Mrs. Burke. Fair enough. The parade was the perfect distraction. Perfect to discuss matters privately without being observed. Perfect to conceal a murder. The hair on Darcy's arm stood on end. The murderer had chosen his time well. The streets had been lined with people and potential witnesses, but the masses of people also offered protection. Did you hear nothing? A scream? A struggle? His questions were direct, but they must be asked. The milliner inched her cup around the saucer, staring blankly into it. It was so noisy outside, I did not hear anything untoward until Miss Elizabeth screamed. 
The memory of it echoed in Darcy's ears. It would have been difficult to not hear it, even over the drums and flutes in the street and the thunder in the sky, which could only lead him to conclude that Mrs. Bennet had been struck on the side of her forehead before she could sound a warning. Had she seen her attacker? If you remember anything, sights, sounds, smells, anything you believe might or might not be useful, I implore you to speak with me. I am riding this afternoon to the nearest magistrate, and I am certain he will have more questions for you. Now, the only remaining doubt I have is what you were doing here at the time of Mrs. Bennet's murder. Heads bowed and fingers fidgeted. What did they hide? Oh, how he wished they would speak! As I said before, Mr. Darcy, the ladies and I had some business to discuss. It was of a personal nature and had nothing to do with... She paused, choosing her words. The unfortunate incident in my shop. Lady Lucas burst into tears while the others nodded in agreement and scrambled to offer her comfort. Their failure to meet his gaze disturbed Darcy. You cannot reveal the nature of your meeting, he insisted. I cannot do so without betraying the confidence of my companions, said Mrs. Burke. Darcy sat in silence, observing the ladies, but they revealed nothing. When it became clear he would get no more information from them, he rose. They left him no choice. He would set Tanner on them. With a bow, he said, Thank you for your time. I need not remind you of the gravity of the situation, and I trust you will prove to be friends to those who are most affected by today's tragedy. Lady Lucas looked up, her eyes brimming with tears. However, she looked down again just as quickly. Taking his leave, Darcy made certain there was nothing else to be done for the Bennets or to assist Tanner, before he departed for Netherfield Park for a change of clothes, he stank. He had questions for Aunt Catherine, but they would have to wait for his return. Right now, it was of the utmost importance to bring the magistrate to Meryton. The stable boy brought out his stallion, and he rode against the tempest all the way to Netherfield Park. Requesting two horses to be made ready, one for himself and one for Richard, Darcy hastened inside to Lawrence. He would have clean clothes ready. Mercifully, he did not meet with anyone on the way up to his room. He took the stairs two at a time and shifted his weight to the balls of his feet to prevent himself from being noticed. There was no time to waste. Lawrence, please inform Colonel Fitzwilliam to prepare himself to ride. We must leave no more than a quarter of an hour. You do not require my assistance, sir. With a final tug, Lawrence freed Darcy's boot. I can manage until you return. It is imperative we leave as soon as possible. There has been another murder in Meryton. The shock must have been great to Lawrence, but he was trained too well to show it. Without another word, he left Darcy to fulfil his task. As Darcy expected, Richard was ready to leave, asking for no explanation. They met at the top of the staircase. There remained only one more matter to see to before they could take their leave. Bingley would not like it, but he would ensure the job was done. We need to speak with Bingley before we go. I will explain everything as we mount up. Darcy walked along the hall to Bingley's study, certain he would find his friend there hiding from his sisters and their guests. He heard a scuffle when he knocked, but the door opened when Darcy knocked again. Oh, good. It's only you, said Bingley, dropping the hand, tugging his disheveled hair and bending over to retrieve the bottle of brandy he'd hid on the floor behind his desk. It's bad enough to open my home to a woman who terrifies me, but I can no longer smell the scent of Jane's hair on her pillow because Mrs. Harris washed everything to receive your relatives. Enjoy your relief, Bingley, for it will not last long, Darcy warned. You had best take a seat and pour some of the brandy you hide from Mr. Hurst in a glass. 
Bing Lee sank into the chair behind his desk, and Richard eyed Darcy curiously, standing at attention. As you are aware, Mrs. Bennet was murdered in the haberdashery during the militia parade. As it stands, my own Aunt Catherine is the most logical suspect. I do not believe her guilty. However, she made the unfortunate mistake of threatening Mrs. Bennet only yesterday. She must not be allowed to leave Netherfield Park until her name is cleared and we have ascertained the identity of the criminal. Richard froze in stunned silence, his muscles tensing and ready for action. I should return to Jane. Bingley hopped to his feet, lunging at the door. Darcy understood. He wished to pass his evening at Longbourn too, but now there were other pressing matters. No, Bingley, you must keep a watch on Lady Catherine. She must not leave. Not having a chair behind him, Bingley sat on the desk and crossed his arms. I suppose that means I cannot ensconce myself in my study for the remainder of this miserable day as I had planned. Poor Bingley. Aunt Catherine took pleasure in tormenting kind-souled individuals who were easily influenced. I am sorry it has come to this. Richard and I must ride to Lord Haversham's estate and bring him back. I will ready another room, said Bingley. No, he must not stay here. Richard exclaimed, his shoulders rising to his ears. His ferocious reaction startled Darcy. He evidently knew much more than Darcy did about the gentleman. Very well, we will arrange for him to stay at the inn. Richard nodded gravely. Dear Lord, of all people, are you certain he is the nearest magistrate? There is no other. Tanner assured me he is the nearest by several miles. Running his hand over his face, a throaty, mirthless chuckle escaped Richard. I do not envy you, Bingley, for when Aunt Catherine finds out Lord Haversham is within shouting distance in Meryton, there will be fatalities, and if she is the prime suspect, there is no telling what he might do to make her suffer. They have been sworn enemies these thirty years. Great, more problems, more difficult personalities to manage. We must go, Darcy said, turning for the door. If you can keep this news from her, your task will be easier to manage, he told Bingley before leaving the study for the stairs with Richard. How is Miss Elizabeth? Richard asked as they hastened through the entrance hall. She was the one who found her mother. Her scream echoed again through Darcy's head, and he felt her trembling limbs against his body as surely as if he still held her to him. Her forehead was crushed, and there was a great deal of blood. Richard gasped, shaking his downcast head from side to side. That is dreadful. Do you have any idea who could commit such a violent act against a woman? It is most uncommon. From what you have told me and I have observed, Mrs. Bennet might not have been well liked amongst her neighbours, but no individual deserves such a violent end. That was my first thought. But someone must have hated her to hit her with such a force. That is my main argument in favour of Aunt Catherine, she does not have the strength to do what was done to Mrs. Bennet. Not even with her cane? No, the injury was too wide. A cane could not have done what I saw. He shivered. He needed to change the subject to get the image out of his mind. What can you tell me about Lord Haversham? Richard groaned. He is only Aunt Catherine's greatest enemy. She is the reason we have never made his acquaintance, though we run in the same circles. In fact, he and father were close friends before Aunt Catherine jilted him. Jilted him? Yes, in the worst possible way. I can only tell you what father told me, because I find the whole affair difficult to imagine. You see, Lord Havisham was the third son, a lieutenant general in His Majesty's army in India. While on an extended leave, his tactics worked their charm on Aunt Catherine, and they fell in love. Darcy tried to understand. 
Aunt Catherine would never allow herself to form an attachment with a third son. It would not have benefited her. The groom ran two saddled horses out to them, handing over the reins. I told you I found it difficult to believe, and yet I know my father to be an honest man. I do not know particulars, of course, but after offering Lord Havisham enough encouragement for him to believe he had a chance, Aunt Catherine refused his hand. Within a week, she was engaged to Sir Louis de Bourgh. The real irony here is that within the year, the heartbroken soldier inherited when his two older brothers died. He got everything, the title, the estate, the fortune. Richard mounted. No man would want to inherit like that. Darcy mounted beside him. Let us go then and pray for the best. Lord Havisham and Aunt Catherine could battle all they wanted, so long as they did not get in his way. Darcy would see Mrs. Bennet's murderer captured and brought to trial, if it was the last thing he did. Chapter 13 Elizabeth sat alone at the top of the stairs at Longbourn. She would have preferred to sit in front of the fire in the parlour, but she could not separate herself from her father, who sat staring at the wall in his study, or her sisters who wailed in their rooms. Mrs. Hill had brought her a cup of tea. She had mixed something stronger into it which warmed Elizabeth's insides and dulled her anguish. She needed to do something, but there was nothing left to be done. William had seen to everything. Had she not been so determined to stay angry with him, she might have been thankful. As it was, she felt useless. Every idea she had expressed had been met with a prompt response when Mr. Wimple delivered Mother to their home. Mr. Darcy has seen to it, was repeated time after time until Elizabeth grew sick of the words. Nothing, not even the smallest details, had been overlooked. William had even sent for flowers so Mother could be buried with something pretty. It was a thoughtful detail and would have made Mother happy. It should have made Elizabeth happy. Instead, her anger festered to the same degree that her love professed itself in her heart. Blast it all! Lydia's cries reached her from along the hallway. She had taken the news the worst. She had adorned herself in full bombazine mourning, complete with a black lace shawl to add a layer of drama to her ensemble. Mary, not having enjoyed a close relationship with Mother, was able to offer as much comfort as her pious soul permitted. She had played dirges on the pianoforte until Father begged her to stop. Jane accepted their changed life with the strength and quiet dignity Elizabeth admired. No doubt Mr. Bingley's constant support and comfort helped. Elizabeth thought with a pang of jealousy. Kitty cried with Lydia. Elizabeth was uncertain how deeply Kitty was affected, but anything which caused her dearest sister pain caused her pain as well. Officer Denny would distract her soon enough. Aunt Phillips occupied herself with the morning wreaths to place on their front doors until the morning was complete. Her manic oversight had her sending a maid to the haberdashery for extra lengths of black ribbon to adorn their dresses and trim their bonnets. Mrs. Hill silently stitched the ribbons and piping to bodices and collars when she was not busy running the tea tray up and down the stairs, not trusting the maid to do it. And thanks to William, they had enough tea, sugar and other delights to entertain a regiment of soldiers. Yet another thing he had seen to. Father, as was his custom, remained in his study. However, there was nothing normal about how he sat in stunned silence behind his desk. Elizabeth had seen a tear trickle down his cheek when they put Mother in the cool room by the cellar. As for Elizabeth, all she had left to do was see to the comfort of her family and wish she had something with which to occupy her hands and her mind. The images of Mother's glassed-over eyes haunted her, which only left one option for her. She would focus all of her energy to find the killer. Her first suspect was Lady Catherine. She had threatened Mother the day before. 
And while Elizabeth believed her morally capable of defending her own wishes to the detriment of another, she doubted the great lady had the physical strength to do the deed, nor would she expose herself to the gossip of the ton if she were discovered. She had too much at risk, and she held her family's name too far above reproach to take such a drastic action. Could she have paid someone else to do her handiwork? Mr. Burke? Doubtful. He was not the type of person she would condescend to speak to about such a matter. And why would Mr. Burke agree to throw away his life for her? Not even Mr. Collins, with his blind adoration, would accept that offer. She sighed. That was an unfortunate detail she would have to see to. Father was in no condition to pen a message informing Mr. Collins of their tragic news. She would have to write. If Father signed it, it would be enough. Tomorrow, she would write first thing in the morning. There was no hurry. Mr. Collins was not the type of man to offer comfort when he could try their patience and involve himself where he was not wanted. Miss Elizabeth, a message arrived for Mr. Bennet. He wants you to read it. Mr. Hill, his coat damp with rain, held up the cream-coloured paper. Why did I hear no one arrive? She would have welcomed the distraction. It was one of Mr. Bingley's new stable boys. He came to the back door not knowing any better. No doubt he got sent to spare his elders from the weather. Elizabeth took the note with a presentment of the source of it. The paper was smooth and thick. When she opened it and saw William's handwriting, her suspicion was confirmed. And when she read what he had written, her frustration increased all the more. Having no one to hear her complain, Elizabeth threw her arms in the air. Am I not to be allowed to do anything at all? Of course, she had to admit she had not looked forward to writing to Mr. Collins. Still, it had been something she could do. Now she did not even have that. Mr. Darcy had not only sent a messenger to inform Mr. Collins of their cause for mourning, but he had offered to send his personal carriage as soon as it was available, in a convenient three days' time. William's thoughtfulness added fiery coals to the blaze of Elizabeth's anger. She knew her reaction was unreasonable, but it was infinitely more comfortable to be angry with him than to allow herself to be hurt further when he declared himself to Mr. Berg. Or to dwell on her loss. She missed her mother. Wishing she had more of the magic tea Mrs. Hill had made her, Elizabeth leaned against the side of the staircase and wept. As the hours stretched mercilessly before her, and she wept until exhaustion prevented any more, Elizabeth rose from her post at the top of the steps and went into the kitchen to help Mrs. Hill with the sewing. Never again would she allow anyone to make her feel so powerless. She would discover the identity of the murderer and defy anyone who would attempt to stop her, especially Fitzwilliam Darcy. Darcy and Richard reached the edge of Lord Haversham's estate as nightfall dropped its heavy cloak around them. Soaked to the bone, Darcy alternated rubbing his hands against the coarse fabric of his greatcoat to warm them before they went completely numb. The grounds were well kept, and the house soon came into view, being situated on top of a knoll with hedged-in gardens around it. Though it was dark, a window on the ground floor was lit brightly. Gritting his teeth, Darcy urged his horse onward. There was no time to hesitate or to allow fear of the unknown to slow his progress. Elizabeth needed him, and he needed to see her. He had done what he could, but he needed to see she was well. Soon enough they were admitted into the entrance hall, tapestries in bold colours and paintings with equally impressive gold frames of imposing figures filled the papered walls. Darcy looked at Richard, his mouth unseemly open in awe. It was the image of Rosings. The butler took their coats to dry and showed them through an antechamber to a decadent room of red velvet, gold trim and murals over thick oriental carpets in rich hues. A large fireplace provided enough light to fill the immense room, but the addition of hundreds of beeswax candles flickered in candelabras throughout the space added their welcoming glow to the otherwise imposing room. 
a man some two inches taller than himself and built as thickly as Tanner approached them. His long silver hair was pulled back with a black ribbon, and he wore a damask dressing gown over his night attire. He was not at all what Darcy had imagined. Tanner had called him elderly, but the gentleman before him appeared stronger than many gentlemen half his age. Good evening, gentlemen. I am told you have come from Hertfordshire, the earl asked in a strong baritone. Darcy could easily imagine him barking orders to his subordinates in the army. His confidence inspired respect. Yes, my lord, Darcy bowed. With a scoff, Lord Havisham crossed his arms, his robe stretching over his thick shoulders. Shaking his head, he said, I detest titles, Mr. Darcy. Mine was won only by the death of two men better than myself. Address me how you must in public, but I never wish for you to speak those detestable words in my presence. Am I understood? Given what Richard had told him, it was understandable, and so completely opposite to the man Aunt Catherine had married. Darcy bowed his head and said, I understand, sir. Good, that will do for now. Now, tell me why you are here dripping water on my carpet when you should stand on the rug by the fireplace. Richard chuckled, apparently deciding Lord Havisham to be in the possession of a sense of humour. Darcy was not convinced, but the man's request was both reasonable and kind, and so he could find no fault in it. This afternoon, a gentleman's wife and the mother of five daughters was murdered during the militia's parade in Meryton. We are currently without a magistrate, and so we came here to ask for your assistance. What were the findings of the coroner's inquest? It was underway when we left, but it is most certainly a murder. Then it should go directly to trial. Who is the accused? Darcy shifted his weight. We do not know as yet. It is our wish to return with you this same night, so you may help in the investigation and the family may bury their deceased on the morrow. Hmm. I take it to understand you are the investigator of this investigation, Mr. Darcy. It usually falls to the family of the victim to seek justice. Yes, I will do what I must to reveal the truth. I cannot do otherwise. A glint in Lord Havisham's eyes spread to his lips, revealing a mouthful of large, healthy teeth. You said the deceased was the mother of five daughters. Unmarried daughters? Yes. What did it matter so long as they returned soon? Darcy kept his answers clipped, not wasting more time than necessary. You are enamoured with one of the daughters. Darcy answered with a blunt honesty which he would have tempered had his patience not already extended past its limits. Yes, I wish to marry Miss Elizabeth as soon as she will have me. Do you agree to return with us, or must we ride to the next magistrate? Lord Havisham bellowed loudly, As soon as she will have you. She sounds like a lady with a mind of her own. <laughs> well done, Mr. Darcy. Now, if you tell me she has the strength of character enough to withstand the pressures of society... I shall believe her perfect. Richard asked boldly, Is that what happened with Lady Catherine? While Darcy admitted to a sense of camaraderie with Lord Havisham after his favourable comments about Elizabeth, Richard's question was too intimate and a waste of precious time. Glaring at his nosy cousin, he said, What my cousin means is... Precisely what he asked. Do not think I am unaware of your connection to that woman. I admire the forthrightness and honesty. In battle there is no time for politeness, and my experience with Lady Catherine could appropriately be compared to a struggle of wills against expectations. 
one we both lost. She is in trouble, Richard continued, giving the details he heard in Longbourn's parlour the day before the murder and calling on Darcy to fill in the rest. Lord Havisham pinched the back of his neck and took a deep breath when the account concluded. I had hoped to live the remainder of my days without seeing that woman again, but never let it be said I would back down before an old adversary. We will leave immediately by coach. There is no sense riding on horseback in this miserable weather. We will arrive in time for your lady to bury her mother on the morrow. He charged through the room, leaving Darcy and Richard to dry their damp clothes by the fire. Within a half an hour, they sat inside Lord Havisham's coach. Aside from the occasional inquiry regarding the murder and any details Darcy had observed, Lord Havisham was content to travel the greater part of the journey in silence, strumming his fingers and staring out into the darkness as if plotting his revenge. Chapter 14 It was not the hour to retire, nor could Elizabeth sleep with the images swirling in her head and the sound of weeping surrounding her if it had been. Lydia and Kitty had yet to calm themselves, and Father had sent Thomas for a draught from the apothecary, who was accustomed to the fits of hysterics common in the Bennet household. Jane sat with her by the fire in the drawing room, finishing the final embroidery stitches on Kitty's wedding dress. Do you think Kitty's bands will be read on Sunday? she asked. Elizabeth did not hesitate to reply. Mother would have wanted it. There are three days until services, and I plan to encourage Father to speak to the vicar about it. The vicar is reasonable. I trust he will do at his best. The sounds of jangling harnesses and carriage wheels sloshing through the muddy road could be heard over the pit-pat of rain against the windows. The apothecary must have decided to call. She went to father in the study. He had not left the room all afternoon. The carriage is here, papa. Father looked away from the wall, focusing on her. It is Mr. Darcy and the magistrate. How could he possibly know that? Here, on such a night? Elizabeth had assumed he would come in the morning, thus delaying Mother's burial by a day. Mr. Wimple informed me of the plans Mr. Darcy had made as per his instructions. If Lord Havisham was agreeable to travelling this evening, he meant to bring him here immediately to see. He rested his forehead against his shaking hands. Elizabeth rushed to his side. Then it is a kindness they have come, if indeed it is them. Come, Papa, we must receive our callers. It was growing increasingly difficult to stay angry with William. Rubbing his hands over his face, Father nodded slowly and rose to his feet to follow Elizabeth to the warmer drawing room where they waited for their callers to be announced. Father had been correct. Lord Havisham, William, and Colonel Fitzwilliam were announced. Lord Havisham was a giant of a man, taller even than William. However, his gentle, unassuming manners soon put her at ease. What a relief he was not a stuffy aristocrat. He sat next to Father and directly in front of her. Leaning toward Father with his hands splayed out on top of his breeches, Lord Havisham said, Mr. Bennet. I am so sorry for your loss. I lost my wife five years ago, and it took some time to bear the loneliness. You are fortunate to have daughters at home, and from what I observe, they are of the sensible sort who will be of the most comfort. He smiled sadly at Elizabeth, Jane, and Mary. Kitty and Lydia had taken their drafts and were indisposed. Thank you, my lord. My eldest girls are the best daughters a father could wish for. Lord Havisham raised his eyebrows, but made no remark about the younger daughters who could be heard snoring upstairs. Instead, he said, I imagine so, Mr. Bennet. Do you have daughters, Lord Havisham? asked Mary, quite off the topic of the real reason for calling. 
No, I have three sons. He offered no further explanation, and Elizabeth sensed it was for the best. It was clearly time to change the subject. Thank you for coming so quickly, she said. As yet, Elizabeth had avoided eye contact with William, an accomplishment growing difficult to maintain as she felt his eyes boring into her. Let us not delay our unpleasant business over niceties. Please, tell me anything you feel will help in this investigation. I am here to listen, observe, and make a judgment, Lord Havisham said, addressing Father. Elizabeth cleared her throat. Father was in no condition to speak, nor would she involve him. I am the one who discovered the body, and am willing to answer any questions you might have. There was no sense in delaying the inevitable. She cared not if she offended. If Lord Havisham thought the matter too delicate to consider with a young lady, she would merely investigate on her own. It made no difference to her. Lord Havisham considered her for some time, but she could meet his gaze. There was sympathy in his eyes, but as he had no power to break her heart, it did not make her cry. Finally, the elderly man spoke. Mr. Bennet, obviously I must speak with all witnesses involving the investigation. It is unfortunate Miss Elizabeth should be in possession of so much information when the murder victim was her own mother, but I believe it best for all concerned for me to ascertain the facts as quickly and accurately as possible. Do I have your permission to hear what Miss Elizabeth knows, in the understanding that she will have to reveal information indelicate to a lady? In your presence, of course. It was not quite a snort, nor was it a sigh father produced. To Elizabeth it was a good sign that father would soon recover to his normal, humorous self. He was not lost completely. Perhaps you will consider me negligent in my oversight where my daughter's education is concerned, my lord. I have allowed Lizzie access to all the books in my study, which she has taken advantage of to the full. Let me reassure you, Lord Havisham, there are not many topics about which she cannot speak of intelligently, and often with more understanding than most gentlemen. Ask what you must. Only allow my other daughters present to choose for themselves if they wish to hear the details of their mother's abrupt end. Jane took a deep breath. I will offer all the support in my possession to my sister. She must not bear this alone after the shock she has experienced today. Elizabeth reached over and held Jane's extended hand. She almost wished Jane would have chosen to leave. What she had to relate to the magistrate was gruesome, and most assuredly unsuitable for a tender-hearted lady's ears. But Jane would bear it for her, if only everyone she loved possessed that same loyalty for her. Of course, Jane was family. William had his own family. Mary agreed. I am the least affected amongst us, and, as such, am perhaps in a better position to draw logical conclusions... Father furled his brow and bunched up his cheeks, but he did not contradict what he knew to be true. Elizabeth had often vied for last place in mother's affections. Hearing Mary acknowledge so aloud was all the more painful for the distant, factual manner in which she stated her position. With a sigh, father raised his hands. There you have it. My daughters have spoken. They will stay. Elizabeth, feeling defiant in her sister's display of loyalty, made the mistake of looking at William. She expected him to look down in guilt, to shift his weight in discomfort, or even to look upon father with scorn. Society certainly would not approve. What she did not expect was the hint of a smile he gave her and the nod of approval. Clearing his throat, Lord Havisham asked in a grave tone for Elizabeth to explain everything she remembered from that afternoon, including any pertinent details immediately before she discovered the body. He was careful never to refer to her relationship with the deceased, 
keeping it impersonal and making it easier for her to share details. Of course she left up the altercation with William causing the doubt festering in her mind. Father rubbed his temples. Elizabeth wished he would leave the room. As she related every person and point in her memory, she saw him withdraw into himself. When I saw her lying on the floor, I screamed. She cut her narrative short. Where was her wound? Lord Havisham insisted. On her forehead and temple. Did you see any other wounds? No. What else did you notice? With a cautious look at father, she continued. The blood was still fresh. I might very well have walked past the killer. A chill ran up her spine. Did you take note of the time? The time. She remembered the coroner pulling out his pocket watch, but she had not noticed the hour, as she had the last time she had been inside the shop. There had been no chimes to alert her. It was a clue. Her hands trembling in excitement, she said, No, I did not. The marble mantel clock did not chime. I do not remember seeing it on the shelf behind the chair. If it were reasonable in the least, she would have run into Meryton to see if the clock was on the shelf or not. It had been several months in the shop. The likelihood of someone happening to buy it from one day to the next was slight when it was not a new item. On the other hand, it was heavy and would have made the perfect murder weapon. William added, I can confirm that the clock was not on the shelf at the time of the murder. A marble clock would be heavy enough to use as a weapon. Lord Havisham nodded slowly. If its shape is consistent with the injury, it is a good lead. Mary, in a monotone, said, It is almost biblical, is it not? Her voiced musing was met with silence. Colonel Fitzwilliam said, As in Cain and Abel? At that, Mary must have realized she had spoken aloud. Shaking her head, she said, No, I was thinking of the account of the serpent in the Garden of Eden. The Lord said he would bruise the serpent on the head. Thank you, Mary, said Elizabeth, before her sister went off on a religious tangent. Of course, a righteous individual aware of that account would never act against his fellow man. Lord Havisham asked, Are there religious zealots in Meryton capable of such a sin? Mary's eyes widened. None I know. I merely remarked on a similarity. And I thank you for it, said Lord Havisham. We must consider every possibility. And while I tend to agree with Miss Elizabeth... It does sound like an act of hate. Are you aware of any enemies the deceased might have had? Jane answered. She had no enemies of which we knew. There were several who avoided her, but I would not say they hated her. Certainly not enough to end her life. I will want to speak with those whom you feel did not like her. We must leave no stone unturned. Gracious, where to begin? Mary came to her aid. Then you will have to speak with everyone in Meryton, with the exception of Aunt Phillips, Miss Lucas, and our servants. The vicar and his wife displayed extraordinary patience with Mother, but she often tried even them. Lord Havisham controlled his expression, but his lengthened pause proved it was difficult. Is there anyone in particular you believe might possess some knowledge about the murder? Elizabeth said. Mr. Burke lied when Mr. Darcy asked if anyone else was in the shop. His wife and two other shopkeepers in the village were in the parlour. These same ladies, along with a few more, were at the shop two days before. While I am not inclined to believe any one of them guilty, they are not commonly in association together, and... They might have seen or heard something of import. I will arrange to speak with them on the morrow. Anyone else? he asked. 
And the men unloading the cart with Mr. Burke? She added. William said, I have seen to it. Of course he had. Apparently he interpreted her annoyed expression for curiosity, for he went on to explain. I asked Mr. Tanner, the village constable, to speak with them before they departed for London. Good. Anyone else? asked Lord Havisham. Elizabeth felt the discomfort in the room. She could not be the one to implicate Lady Catherine. If anyone was to voice the suspicion aloud, it had to come from someone else. As badly as she felt betrayed by William, he was justified in behaving as he did, and she could not return like for like. Not only would she lose his respect, but she would lose her own. William said, Other than my Aunt Catherine, as I have admitted to you during our journey here, I can think of no one else capable of harbouring such an enormous amount of resentment against Mrs. Bennet. Most people in the village, from what I have observed in my time here, understood her always to seek the best interests of her daughters. Her methods were not always approved of, but her motivation most definitely was. Elizabeth held her breath so as not to sigh her relief aloud. I see. With one more glance at the occupants around the room, Lord Havisham said, that is all the questions I have at this moment. We will have a preliminary hearing in five days' time, whereupon we will send our accused to Hartford to await trial for murder. Five days. Monday. Five days to learn the truth. Chapter 15 the rain softened to a gentle spattering for Mother's burial the following morning. Mr. Bingley came to offer his condolences and to accompany Father, as did Colonel Fitzwilliam and William. Lord Havisham went along as well, though Elizabeth suspected he went more to observe than to offer comfort to a gentleman he had only met the evening before. The men left Longbourn together, a cluster of black greatcoats and hats against the sad grey sky. Elizabeth felt as drab as the weather with her black trimmings and ribbons on her most sombre dress. She had tucked her emerald green dress into the back of her armoire, feeling as if she had lost a friend. It had been the dress she relied on to give her cheer when she felt uncertain. Now she would have to wait until Kitty's wedding to wear it. Wearing mourning to a wedding was frowned upon, but there would be no bright green for her the next six months apart from that joyous event. No lively colours and vibrant hues to brighten the long, dark winter days ahead of them. Mother would have never approved, but certain conventions of society must not be thumbed lest one become a complete outcast. While Elizabeth did not give a fop's fob for society, even she knew she could not do as she pleased without consequences to herself and, worse, to her sisters. She turned away from the window when the coffin disappeared from sight to the room full of contrasting ladies. Charlotte was there. She would never abandon a friend in need, nor miss an opportunity to see Colonel Fitzwilliam. Aunt Phillips fussed over the tea and cake she had brought, complaining about her nerves and fanning herself by the fire, just as Mother had always done. Mrs. Thorne attempted not to show how much she enjoyed her cake, one must never enjoy anything during a funeral. Mrs. Hurst and Miss Bingley had arrived with Mr. Bingley, no doubt to keep a watch on him lest he do something so untoward as to propose to Jane. How is Lady Lucas, Miss Lucas? I do hope she is well, said Miss Bingley, giving more attention to the embroidery on her skirt than to Charlotte. Concerned, Elizabeth asked. Has your mother been unwell? Charlotte nodded. She has taken to bed since the day of the parade. As well she should, with the shock she suffered, said Miss Bingley, without the delicacy Elizabeth's dear friend had bestowed. Charlotte pursed her lips at the tactless comment. Indeed, we expect her to recover fully within a few days, she does not suffer from the delicate constitution so many ladies younger than her do. I will tell her you inquired after her health. With a huff, Mrs. Hurst sat back in her chair. 
It is rather stuffy in this room. Not as stuffy as some of its occupants, thought Elizabeth. Leaning forward and widening her eyes in a display of feigned innocence, Miss Bingley said, What a pity you are in mourning for the greater part of a year. Elizabeth would have thought it the lesser part of a year. It did not sound as dire. Miss Bingley looked at Mrs. Hurst as if they had rehearsed what to say. Mrs. Hurst took a moment to remember her practised lines, receiving a scowl from her younger sister. Oh, yes, it is a pity. It will be impossible for Miss Kitty to marry while she is in mourning, not to mention entering into an engagement. That was directed mostly at Jane. Inhaling deeply through her nose to cool her stirred blood, Elizabeth said slowly, Do not suppose too quickly. The vicar asked to call on the morrow about the reading of the bands and subsequent marriage ceremony. He did not imply arrangements need be suspended. Mrs. Thorne smiled. Of course, there is no reason Miss Kitty, or any of you for that matter, must suffer more than you already are. Just as silver is refined from its impurities by the heat of fire, so the Bennet maidens will be purified and blessed after their tribulation. Miss Bingley huffed, and Mary nodded her agreement. Elizabeth could have thought of a more appropriate scripture to quote, but she was more interested in Kitty's future to allow herself the distraction. Aunt Phillips, stirring her tea with one hand and fanning herself with the other, said, "'Have you not read the gossip columns lately? Julia Johnstone had her court presentation and her debut in society not long after her father died. If it is good enough for the royal family, it is good enough for me. Kitty will marry as soon as confirmation is received from Officer Denny's parish, although we will refrain from hosting a lavish wedding feast. That would be unseemly under the circumstances.' Take that, ladies. Successful vengeance stirred Elizabeth's spirits and made the day bearable. Aunt continued. I dare say there shall be soon another engagement amongst my nieces before long. Much to the Bingley sisters' consternation, Aunt smiled not only at Jane, but also to Elizabeth. Marriage can be a great source of joy when God has blessed a union, commented Mrs. Thorne. Lydia, still lethargic from the previous evening's draught and thus uncommonly quiet, sniffed delicately. Like a martyr, she endured their company and seemed determined to display how dramatically death had matured her. I wish to marry a handsome, charming gentleman whom God has blessed with good looks and fortune. I think the happiest marriages are the wealthy ones. Happiness does not depend on possessions where moths and rust can consume, Miss Lydia. You would do much better to store up treasures with God. That is the path to true contentment, Mrs. Thorne corrected gently. Speak for yourself. I want more than contentment. I wish to be rich. Lydia dabbed her eyes with her black handkerchief. It is what Mother wanted for all of us, and I am determined to fulfil her wish. Mrs. Hill came into the room bearing a plate with cake on it. Lydia reached out for a piece before Mrs. Hill could set it on the table. It smelled of ginger and rich molasses with a touch of cinnamon. It was still warm, and the spices wafted off the top of it in a swirly steam. Mrs. Hurst took the serving plate closest to her and raised it to her nose. Mmm, this smells divine. Stop that, Louisa. You act like Charles. Had Miss Bingley left her statement at that, she would not have aroused suspicion. But she did not. Her eyes darted over to Jane, and her complexion deepened a shade. When Mrs. Hurst pinched her arm and hissed, Elizabeth, and everyone else in the room for that matter, knew Miss Bingley had inadvertently hinted at something worth knowing. Elizabeth expected Lydia or Kitty to ask directly, but it was Aunt Phillips who pressed for more information. What is this? Please explain your meaning, Miss Bingley. Not surprising there. Aunt Phillips loved to gossip. Elizabeth leaned forward, not wanting to miss a word or flinch. Miss Bingley shrugged her shoulders in an attempted flippancy. But it was too late. 
Mrs. Hurst stared down at her untouched cake as if she were cursing it for causing such trouble. It is nothing at all. I believe most gentlemen enjoy the scent of cake. My brother is no different. Miss Bingley waited until Aunt altered her gaze to her cake, and she reached over to pinch her sister, who bit her lip to keep from crying out. Jane came to their aid. Of all the senses, I believe smell to be the most powerful for recalling memories. Mrs. Hill's gingerbread smells of the comforts to be had in a happy home. Elizabeth felt the same way about sandalwood and fresh linen. She would forever think of William and how safe she had felt in his arms at its scent. I will never be able to use smelling salts again without remembering my dear sister, said Aunt Phillips in a quivering voice. She dabbed her eyes with her handkerchief. Elizabeth looked out of the window. She would much rather accompany her father than be stuck in a cramped room. She was grateful for her friends, but she had no use for Miss Bingley and Mrs. Hurst with their fake sympathy and hypocritical attitude. They had not even liked Mother, which reminded Elizabeth. She began cautiously, knowing she would not get a direct answer, but hoping for the tiniest bit of information. Perhaps Mrs. Burke can recommend an alternative to smelling salts. The last time I was in her shop, she had a group of ladies with her. Her acquaintance has widened so much of late. I do not doubt but that she will be an excellent source of a new restorative. Mrs. Hurst wiggled in her seat, and Miss Bingley pinched her lips shut. They knew something. Charlotte knew nothing, and as Mrs. Thorne took the first bite of cake at that moment, Elizabeth could read nothing on her expression other than the immense pleasure of enjoying a delicious repast. Swallowing, Mrs. Thorne said, I simply must ask Mrs. Hill if she will share her family's recipe with me. There is nothing quite so comforting as gingerbread, and hers is the best I have tasted. Gingerbread is my favourite. I could eat an entire cake in one sitting if I did not have to share, boasted Lydia. She reached out for a second slice and Elizabeth shook her head. There had been too many times when Lydia had helped herself to the remains of the gingerbread, leaving only crumbs for the rest of her family. Aunt Phillips cleared her throat. Save some for the gentlemen, Lydia. They will be cold, wet and hungry when they return. She smacked her niece's hand away from serving herself another piece. Frustrated the conversation had been distracted, Elizabeth tried to think how she could ask what the ladies were doing assembled together at the haberdashery. Then again, Miss Bingley and Mrs. Hurst were probably not her best sources of information. She would have to call at Lucas Lodge. She could go on the morrow to inquire about Lady Lucas. Continuing, Aunt said... There is a matter I should like to discuss with you before I take it up with Mr. Bennet. She teared up and took some time to calm her emotions. Finally, she came out from behind her handkerchief. I am dreadfully lonely. It is my hope that I may convince one of my nieces to stay with me and Mr. Phillips for the duration of our mourning period. We have discussed it together and decided... Lydia perked up in her chair, swallowing quickly so she might not be quite so rude when she interrupted. I accept. I would absolutely adore staying with you in Meryton. Oh, it is perfect. Aunt looked down at her lap, and Elizabeth groaned inwardly. Aunt did not want Lydia. Jane said softly, Lydia, you must let Aunt finish. She and Uncle may have decided differently. With a scoff, Lydia said, But of course they would choose me. There was no avoiding it. Either Aunt would be upset at being forced to take Lydia into her home, or Lydia would have to be disappointed. Mr. Bingley's sisters paid rapt attention, enjoying the spectacle to come. Charlotte said, When my mother's younger brother passed away, she took great comfort in a dog. In fact, Duchess had puppies several weeks ago, and we still have two in need of a home. Might that not be a welcome alternative to separating loved ones in their time of need? Oh, Charlotte, her practical suggestion would fall on deaf ears. 
aunt replied. That is a kind offer, Miss Lucas, but my loss is every bit as great as my niece's. Charlotte bowed her head, peeking at Elizabeth out of the corner of her eye. Elizabeth shrugged. She appreciated Charlotte's intent. Who would not want a sweet little puppy to cuddle and put bows on her ears? We would have so much more fun with a dog in the house, aunt, said Lydia, still assuming aunt could not possibly have anyone else in mind other than her. Mary said, I should think you would be more assistance if you offered to help Uncle file his papers and provide uplifting conversation. Which is precisely why Mr. Phillips and I have selected you, Mary. You are level-headed and will provide a calm spirit in our home, providing companionship for me and assistance to your uncle. We would very much like to invite you to our home. If Mr. Bennet agrees, would you be willing to live with us for a time, dear Mary? Lydia's lip stuck out and she huffed through her nose. Nobody wants me. Instead of mourning the loss of their mother, the next few minutes became a game to see who could calm Lydia in her time of distress. Elizabeth leaned over to Charlotte. Do you have a female puppy left? Charlotte smiled. There is one. She is the sweetest little thing, although she does have a penchant for stealing her mother's food from her dish. She will suit Lydia perfectly. May I call on the morrow? I wish to see how Lady Lucas fares and we can put ribbons around the puppy's neck to surprise Lydia. Mother will be happy to see you. She talks of little else other than you and your family. She kindly made no direct reference to Mother. Thank you, Charlotte. I am much more diverting than Mary, complained Lydia. Jane, who now sat beside Lydia, rubbing her back and stroking her hair, said, Aunt does not seek diversion or else you most certainly would have been her first choice. Is that not so, aunt? Absolutely, my dear. My nerves are plaguing me and I need calm conversation. Aunt reached over and squeezed Mary's hand. If father agrees, I can pack a trunk to be sent today, Mary offered. Lydia continued to grumble, feeling aunt's cut all the more deeply for its being unintentional. Charlotte leaned over and whispered to Elizabeth, Poor Lydia, you had best call early on the morrow. Elizabeth eagerly agreed. Chapter 16 Darcy could not help but contrast his own mother's burial with Mrs. Bennet's. The difference was too great. While every family in and around Pemberley had been present, or had paid their respects in one way or another, the few present at Mrs. Bennet's burial were clearly there for reasons other than their esteem for the lady. He stood next to Mr. Bennet in the rain, holding an umbrella so the gentleman would not get too wet and fall ill. He cared for Mr. Bennet as he would his own relative, because Elizabeth would wish it. Bingley came more out of concern for his intended and his own human decency than for his friendship with the rest of the Bennets. Richard, too, had joined them in the hopes of seeing Miss Lucas. A more sensible lady did not exist in Hertfordshire. Tanner had joined them in his capacity as constable, Lord Havisham determining it best for a known local man to make inquiries instead of his own constables. Lord Havisham watched faces and whispered questions to Tanner as shovelfuls of mud were scooped over the coffin. Darcy was pleased Mr. Wimple had been able to provide the flowers he had requested. Mrs. Bennet, though she had been a trial to Darcy's patience, had possessed a love for pretty things, and it would have pained Darcy to put Elizabeth's mother to rest without anything of beauty to accompany her soul. Mrs. Bennet loved flowers, Mr. Bennet said with a gravelly voice. His quiet tears touched Darcy more than Miss Lydia's loud sobs. In one way or another, he had loved his wife. I should have. Mr. Bennet's voice choked dry. Regrets. Darcy remembered vividly his regrets toward his mother. I should have embraced my mother more when I had the chance, he said. 
It was uncomfortable for him to share the intimate memory with Mr. Bennet, but he felt compelled to do so. Mr. Bennet looked blankly into the distance. The first time I saw her was in the middle of a field bursting with wildflowers. I was at home during a break from my schooling, and the sight of her amidst such beauty took my breath away. Her easy laughter captivated my heart. Pulling out his handkerchief, Mr. Bennet dabbed at his face, once again falling into despondent silence. Darcy allowed him some minutes, and then he could no longer contain his thoughts. You must tell your daughters. It would temper their grief to know their mother had been loved deeply, that their parents shared something rare, coveted and beautiful. It was my fault it did not last. I mocked her when I could have taught her. Mr. Bennet's voice trembled to a stop. What could Darcy say other than promise he would never fail to value the gentleman's daughter as Mr. Bennet had his own wife? Darcy was done with regrets. He would have none where Elizabeth was concerned, which made it all the more imperative he speak with her about Anne. If Tanner and Richard were correct, he had given her every reason to believe he had betrayed her affections. To allow her to think of him thus repulsed him. He would not allow a miscommunication, of which he would unfailingly provide more in the years to come, to wedge itself in their trust, and form a breach too large to span as the passing hours widened the gap. The last of the mud was scraped off the sodden grass and onto the mound of earth marking Mrs. Bennet's final resting place. It was time to return to Longbourn. Darcy did not know how we would manage to speak to Elizabeth in confidence. He could not risk overhearing ears, nor could he risk writing it down. But manage he would. He was determined. They walked in a line huddled under their umbrellas for the short stretch to Longbourn. The smoke coming out of the chimney promised warmth. Lord Havisham's deep voice behind him said, Colonel, will you be so good as to walk with Mr. Bennet to Longbourn? Mr. Tanner has revealed some information to me, and I think it best to consult with Mr. Darcy at the inn. Darcy wanted to object. He needed to talk to Elizabeth. However, he also needed to bring Mrs. Bennet's murderer to justice. If Tanner had found something, he would be foolish not to listen. But Elizabeth needed him too. She deserved to know the truth, and the truth could only come from him. Torn between opposing demands, Darcy whispered to Richard, Tell her I need to speak with her. That would have to suffice until he could explain. She would appreciate his help in discovering the killer, and he hoped her gratitude would soothe her contrary thoughts toward him. Climbing into the waiting carriage, Darcy fell into silent contemplation for the duration of the trip. Discussion inside the carriage was out of the question, with the thick raindrops pounding against the roof and the wheels sloshing through the mud and water. Tanner's inn was warm, and the private room had a blazing fire ready for them when they entered. Miss Molly brought in slabs of venison over boiled potatoes and a bottle of red wine, Thank you, Miss Molly, that will be all, said Lord Havisham, kindly dismissing the housekeeper. As soon as she had closed the door behind her, Lord Havisham said, There are some details which we need to discuss. I am sure you agree with me that time is not on our side. There is a killer in the village, and the sooner we identify this individual, the better. He would hear no argument from Darcy. Continuing, Lord Havisham said, Since we are in agreement, allow me to continue. The first and most obvious suspect is Lady Catherine. Darcy sat back in his chair, the wood creaking under his weight. I doubt her physical ability to lift an object heavy enough to inflict the damage done. That remains to be seen, commented Lord Havisham, tensing Darcy's shoulders. Mr. and Mrs. Burke. Lord Havisham listed through several names, but it was the final name he pronounced which surprised Darcy. It was preposterous. And finally, Lady Lucas. 
Lady Lucas's daughter is Miss Elizabeth's dearest friend. She did not arrive at the shop until after the murder. She would be the first person I would eliminate from suspicion, said Darcy. You give your opinions freely for one so young, grunted Lord Havisham. Darcy felt the hair on his neck stand on end, like one of his hounds when it was riled. Lord Havisham continued. It is no wonder when you are not in possession of all of the facts. Mr. Tanner, be so good as to enlighten Mr. Darcy. Tanner's lips twitched, and Darcy wanted to reach across the table to tag him. Who knew Elder Brothers was such a bother? Did Georgiana consider him a bother? What would she think of Tanner? Today, Mr. Tanner, I have already made arrangements to interview various villagers during the course of the day, as well as with Mr. Bingley to speak with his guests. We have four days to find the fiend who killed Mrs. Bennet. We do not have time to waste. Lord Havisham's words did nothing to soothe the battle waging in Darcy's mind. This murder hit him with a force much more powerful than Wickham's had. He had known his innocence, and Elizabeth's faith in him had made it bearable. Now, he knew he had caused her suffering, and the very murder of her mother had prevented him from revealing the truth about Anne to her sooner. Tanner cleared his throat. You will not like this, Darcy. Using your suggestion and feeling at liberty to lighten your purse, as I saw necessary... I was able to get Mrs. Burke to confess her reason for being present in the parlour with the other women when all of the village was enjoying the parade. Evidently, they had formed a sort of ladies' club. The group assembled are the most staunch members. The others who are not in attendance prefer to leave early for the parade. Among them are Lady Lucas. Lady Lucas? Darcy repeated in disbelief. That is not all, Tanner continued. Miss Bingley and Mrs. Hurst are members, and they took it upon themselves to introduce Lady Catherine to their club. Darcy sat up, clutching his hands on top of the table to keep them still. Did Aunt Catherine accept their invitation? She did. She was present for a time, but left before the parade to avoid being seen mixing in company with ladies of inferior stations. I have been unable to determine where she went after departing. She did not return here directly. That sounds like her. I am surprised I have not heard of this. She would have cut Miss Bingley for suggesting she involve herself with something so common. Oh... She became a member of the club, oath and all. Darcy forced his jaw to remain in place. It must have cost you a handsome sum to acquire this information. Another chuckle. Not me, Darcy. You. Mrs. Burke was entirely moved by the coins I figuratively dangled in front of her face. She expects to be rewarded for betraying her sisters in hatred. Hatred? Darcy did not like the direction this headed. If it gives insight into the murder and gives peace to the Bennet household, I would give a fortune. I knew as much, and Mrs. Burke will regret betraying them, for now they are all suspects. You see... The name of the club is Lamb. Ladies against Mrs. Bennet. Preposterous, Darcy mumbled, shaking his head. Of all the ridiculous notions. Tanner held up his palm. Before you resign, Lamb is a group of ridiculous ladies. Consider how many clubs you society gents have formed over worse foolishness. However... It gives them a motive. Mrs. Burke said it was founded by Lady Lucas herself last year when all of the Mrs. Bennet's daughters came out in society. 
can you imagine how she must have felt to have not only the eldest Mrs. Bennets to compete with for the notice of a single gentleman, but the two youngest as well? They are hardly of an age to do so. And there were Mrs. Bennet's remarks about how plain Miss Lucas is. Such comments have been born since the birth of their offspring. And this was Lady Lucas's way of finding support from other mothers inflicted by Mrs. Bennet. Well, what was the purpose of their meetings? To bring harm? Darcy asked. Mrs. Burke said they merely discussed Mrs. Bennet's wrongs against them, taking comfort in each other's sufferings. Darcy squeezed the back of his neck, resting his head against his hand. What will Elizabeth think when she finds out? The Lucases are her friends. Mrs. Burke made a point of telling me that the subject of their offence was Mrs. Bennet, although there had been occasions when Mr. Bennet, Miss Kitty, and Miss Lydia were discussed. The ladies took great comfort in Miss Mary's spinster ways, and not one of them would say a word against Miss Bennet. Miss Elizabeth is held in high regard by most of the ladies, though they agree she has a quick tongue. Most of the other ladies. Darcy was certain his aunt and Bingley's sisters were the exception. His aunt... Was this why she had not been present at the inn before the parade? After her exchange with Mrs. Bennet the day before, he understood why she would affiliate herself with such a group. She would have done anything to cause Mrs. Bennet harm. Looking over at Lord Havisham, Darcy asked, Do you believe my aunt killed Mrs. Bennet? A steely glint hardened the Earl's eyes. That remains to be seen. If the evidence supports it, justice will be meted out, and I will not hinder it. We will keep watch over all members of this club. They are of particular interest, and I intend to interview several of them this afternoon. Do the other ladies know we are in possession of this information? Darcy asked Anna. No. I made certain to speak with Mrs. Burke only in the presence of her husband. Is Miss Lucas aware of her mother's activities? Darcy asked, thinking of Richard. Mrs. Burke seemed confident she is not, Tanner replied. And we will do our best to keep it that way until the hearing, only if the existence of this ladies' club holds any bearing on the murder of Mrs. Bennet will it become public knowledge. The Bennets have enough to endure without adding the loss of long-standing friends to their suffering. Lord Havisham spoke with finality. Darcy would take the secret to the grave lest it hurt Elizabeth more. She was under no delusions about the popularity of her mother in the village, but a revelation involving her friends such as this could very well crush her. He must speak with her. Soon. Chapter 17 Elizabeth endured their company for the comfort they brought her sisters, but by the time everyone had gone and the house fell silent, her frustration stifled her in the shrinking house. The heavy rain had eased to a soft drizzle, the kind that felt good against hot skin. Grabbing her shawl and tying down her heaviest bonnet, she sought out Mrs. Hill, who attempted to scrub ink from her hands, did Father spill ink on his desk again? Elizabeth asked. I am only glad it stains nothing more than the wood and my hands. Where are you off to, Miss Lizzie? I am in need of some fresh air. I shall not be away long. Mrs. Hill looked out of the nearest window. Are you certain? You could catch your death of a cold. I will return shortly. If you insist, Miss Elizabeth... Mrs. Hill did not look pleased. But what could Elizabeth say? Not even Mother could have kept her indoors after a morning spent in the company of Miss Bingley and Mrs. Hurst. Elizabeth had behaved herself for Jane's sake. However, such temperance had taken its toll, and Elizabeth feared she might say something frightful to one of her family members unless she got out of the house and let the gentle showers soothe her agitated thoughts. 
Stepping out to the gravel path, she walked with wide steps toward the fields surrounding Netherfield Park. Not that she sought out the company of a certain gentleman, mind you. No, she convinced herself it was merely her favourite path because it offered the best views of the lakes surrounding the estate, and she could imagine the flowers which would grow come springtime. The promise of better times lured her along the path she had made with her own feet over fields and across overflowing brooks until she reached the highest point. Leaning her head back, rain droplets sprinkled across her face, kissing her cheeks and washing her worries away, if only for a moment. What she would give for William to ride up at that instant, sweep her off her feet and carry her away. But it was only a fancy. She had a forlorn father to manage and a hysterical sister who had lost her best friend. Her other sisters, Elizabeth was grateful to notice, grieved in a way she would have participated in under normal circumstances. But circumstances were not normal. She had a murderer to catch. She had a plan. However, one plan to catch a murderer, the last time she had involved herself in a murder investigation, she'd nearly been the next victim. She could rely on no one to help her. William had his aunt and cousin with whom to concern himself, and she would do nothing to add to his burdens. No, Elizabeth would simply have to rely on herself, just as she had always done. She would be strong for her family's sake, as much for her own. Elizabeth, said a deep, velveteen voice she craved to hear so much. Its sound startled her. Lowering her head and opening her eyes, she saw William standing before her. I had hoped you would venture out of doors today, he said. I do not have a chaperone. He would take offence at that, but she best pointed out before he could. It is for the best. There is something I must discuss with you in confidence. Cautiously, she said, the grove of trees will offer some protection from the rain. They walked a short distance in silence to a fallen trunk, sheltered by a canopy of evergreens and branches. Whatever it was William wanted to tell her, he was in no hurry to say it. I told my family I would not be away long, she said, to prompt him. She could not disguise the edge in her voice, though she dearly wished to. Her heart would betray her to encourage William, while her mind knew he would not choose her when it came down to it. Her heart would make her sit a touch closer to him than she ought to, but her mind warned her to keep a safe distance. When he reached his hand out toward her, her heart wished he would continue until she was wrapped in his embrace. Her mind made her slide away from him on the log and snap at him in frustration. Mr. Darcy, if there is something you wish to say, I beg you to say it. How dare he show any sign of tenderness toward her when he must marry Mr. Berg? She made herself look at him, and she saw the hesitation, the flicker of disbelief. Oh, believe it, Mr. Darcy. So help him if he hurt her any more than she already did. She would lash out at him and not feel sorry for it in the least. Or rather, not until the next day. Then she would be very sorry, as she usually was, when her mind conspired with her tongue to say exactly what she meant to say and precisely the way she meant to say it. First, uh, I must apologise. Now how could she stay irate with him at that? That he could utter the words, and perfect words they were, she least expected, fueled the flames of her frustration. She bit her tongue, and he continued, I am not so talented as you are in expressing myself clearly, when it is imperative for me to do so. Blast the man! First he apologises, and then he compliments her? Clasping her hands and biting down harder on her tongue, she held herself together. Miss Elizabeth, I fear I gave you cause to doubt my regard for you, and now I must assure you that it was never my intention to hurt you. My feelings for you remain the same. Dear Lord, now he gave her hope. 
Her heart responded like a little puppy wagging its tail at the slightest affection from its master. She raised her hand to her chin to clear off the drool, just in case. Her sensible mind, however, told her not to get her hopes up too soon, and so she returned her fingers to their clasped position in her lap and sucked in her cheeks to give her tongue a reprieve. I would have told you before, but circumstances have prevented it. My cousin Anne is ill, as you are well aware. Her illness is not understood by modern science. Doctors, in their ignorance, have allowed, even encouraged, people to believe it a punishment from the devil. Elizabeth's jaw dropped as she understood his words. Miss de Berg suffers from seizures? He nodded, watching her intently. My aunt has managed to conceal her affliction these many years by limiting Anne's association and confining her to Rosings. Only her family doctor is aware of her condition. Until she came here? ventured Elizabeth. Yes. She suffered an episode at the inn. Mrs. Molly witnessed it. His eyes searched her, asking questions she did not know how to answer. Her own mind flooded with doubts she wished to have dispelled. On one account, she could allay his fear. Mrs. Molly spoke with our housekeeper. She did not make mention of Mr. Berg's ailment, though she did imply the lady was ill. Her intention was to inform me of your engagement. Elizabeth's stomach clenched, making it difficult to breathe. Would he deny it? Tanner will be happy, as I am, to know he may trust his housekeeper. After Mrs. Bennet's comments, I had reason to doubt her. That Anne should be discovered is my aunt's greatest fear. Elizabeth went numb. Of course, it explained everything. It explained why Lady Catherine was so insistent William marry his sick cousin. An alliance with him would dispel any rumours which might arise and keep her safe. On the contrary, Elizabeth wanted to lower her head between her knees and moan at the wave of nausea sweeping over her. No wonder William had changed object of his regard. He was too honourable to act in any other way, nor could she accept his attention knowing what she did. Breathing deeply to keep the acid burning her throat from rising, she said, I understand now. You will do what you must, and I think highly of you for it. The anxious furrow of his brow smoothed, and he smiled brilliantly. You cannot imagine what a relief it is to hear you say as much. The same morning we met in Meryton, I had been awake for hours writing discreet inquiries to my man of business, as well as a couple of trusted physicians regarding my cousin's condition. One point which has helped her conceal her ailment has been its inconsistent nature. There have been years she has suffered merely one or two episodes. It is only recently she has worsened. My hope is to discover a trustworthy, knowledgeable doctor for her, so that I may be free to court you. The bile choked Elizabeth so that she coughed. William clearly did not know her if he believed her as selfish as that. You would court me whilst knowing your own cousin to be in danger. Have you not read the papers recently? If your cousin is found out, the people would accuse her of being a witch. They would kill her. His smile turned to a frown. I take great care to inform myself of current affairs. I take it you refer to the instance in Cambridgeshire. Do you not see the danger to Mr. Burke? They accused that woman of witchcraft, dragged her out of her home, and beat her with clubs until they believed her dead. When her kind-hearted neighbour took her in, the villagers formed a mob and would have succeeded in beating both women to death had they not fled for their lives and begged the authorities to interfere. If your cousin's affliction is found out, the people could just as well accuse her of the same crime, and they would kill her. That was an isolated incident in a naive parish. The laws against the crime of witchcraft were repealed nearly one hundred years ago. 
And yet, it was only recently an entire village rose up against those two women out of fear. They were fortunate to come out alive. But how do you think they will be received when the accusations against them become known? They will travel the whole of England, unable to make a new home because of the prejudices of others against them. You would deny yourself happiness for the welfare of my cousin? If it means her life, yes. If it were one of my sisters, I would give my life to protect her. You would do the same. Of course. I will do everything in my power to help my cousin. However, I refuse to allow my fate to be dictated by others, or by an event which may never happen. There was a good deal of sense in his words, but she was too upset to pay it much heed. And Mr. Berg? What of her future? Now William appeared as distressed as she felt. Would you have me base my decisions on what might never occur when she's perfectly content never to marry? That would have been good to know before. She does not wish to marry? She is content to die alone with nobody but her mother to keep her company? I cannot help but think that her health would improve dramatically were she to separate herself from that particular influence. She held her breath. It was one thing for William to speak against his aunt, but it was quite another for her to do so. I am inclined to agree with you, which is why I have sent inquiries to London. I expect to hear word from my man of business any day. Oh, that was all she could utter. She did not normally suffer from a loss of words, but what could she say? His explanation seemed reasonable, but until she knew for sure, she did not dare allow herself to hope. William's jaw pulsated and his eyebrows furrowed. How can you even be certain I could protect Anne if I were to marry her? It would be for naught. How she wished she could not understand Lady Catherine's reasoning. It would make this infinitely easier to bear. She could have allowed herself to be convinced. Mr. Berg is already past the prime age to marry, and her poor health is well known. People are already curious to know what inflicts her. If you were to marry her, all rumours would be stifled. After all, why would you marry a sickly cousin if she could not meet up to the obligations and responsibilities of the mistress of a large estate. Nobody doubts your intelligence. If anyone had drawn wrong conclusions about her, they would have to assume they were wrong. And what would happen at Pemberley when she took to her rooms and hid from everyone? Do you not see it would be worse for her? There were several explanations Elizabeth could think of, but none of which were proper for her to discuss aloud. A miscarriage, for one. It would be a lie, but it would keep Mr. Berg out of harm's way. William looked at her in disbelief, the disappointment evident in his melancholy eyes. Elizabeth, I had not expected you to support my Aunt Catherine in her madness. I had thought you would be happy. If I mean nothing to you, then please tell me now. My feelings toward you strengthen each day. I am left to think you are using this circumstance as an excuse. To me, it is clear what I must do and where my loyalty lies. I choose you. I will always choose you, if you will have me. She had cried so much in the past two days, she had thought she had no more tears to shed. Clearly, she had been wrong. He chose her. But was he free to make that choice? Could she live with the knowledge that her acceptance of his love would extend the suffering of another? She despaired to ask for more time when she understood her heart and ached to tell him her greatest desire. She looked away from him, for there was no possible way she could gain control of her battling emotions when his look pleaded with her to let him love her. It was the look of which she had dreamed, the look any unmarried lady dreamed of being so fortunate to receive. 
And yet, she could not bring herself to accept it. She needed more time. She needed to understand before making forever promises. Please, William. He brightened and reached out to take her hand at her use of his name. Stupid girl. She pulled away, sorry she had made things worse. Please, she repeated. See, to Mr. Berg first. Her life is more important than my happiness, no matter how it pains me to say it. She rose to leave as the rain clouds darkened. I must return home. They will worry if I am away too long. She stepped away, looking over her shoulder. William sat on the fallen tree with his head between his hands. Each step she took away from him was torture. She wanted to snuggle into his embrace in the confidence he was hers to console. Darcy did not notice how heavily the rain fell until a shiver coursed through him, bringing him to his senses. Had he been foolish to reveal Anne's condition on the day of Mrs. Bennet's burial? What had been meant as an explanation had only complicated matters further. Never in his wildest nightmare would he have imagined Elizabeth to side with Aunt Catherine. Their assumption that he placed his happiness before Anne's life angered him. It was so entirely opposite to the reality. But he could not give false hopes where they were not warranted. He himself ran the risk of disappointment if his inquiries led to a dead end. And yet, both Anne's determination to remain unmarried and the possibility of finding a doctor with a modern view of medicine willing to help her without locking her up in a mental institution fueled his optimism. All the negative emotions Elizabeth provoked within him were tempered by his admiration for her loyalty. Her loyalty extended beyond her own family to include his. Though he exposed himself to the worst pain, he would not give up on her until all hope was lost. Her heart was worth the struggle of winning. He had never been more certain of anything else in his life, nor would he ever find her equal should he live a thousand years. Returning to Netherfield Park, he sent for Lawrence to draw a hot bath. Nobody in the house would bother him if he was bathing, and it would take the chill out of his skin. The door to the music room was open, but he had a plan should he be called. Darcy! The shrill voice of his aunt called out to him. Darcy! She repeated when he did not appear in the doorway a moment after she expected him. Miss Bingley brought her piece to a dramatic end, no doubt pleased with her performance and that he should have heard a portion of it. Where have you been? You are soaking wet, criticized Aunt Catherine. I have been out of doors until recently. There are some matters requiring attention before Lord Havisham comes to call on the morrow. Aunt Catherine froze and her face blanched. Lord Havisham? she said in a whisper. Darcy saw the moment she realised how frightened she appeared. Puffing out her chest and raising her chin, she said, I was unaware he meant to call on the morrow. Yes, your threats against Mrs. Bennet were poorly timed. While Richard and I are certain of your innocence, you will have to convince Lord Havisham of it. Her shoulders stiffened. The truth will set me free. He is not a fool. Who is this Lord Havisham? asked Miss Bingley, drawing a glare from Aunt Catherine. If you have friends in the first circles, you ought to know who he is, Aunt Catherine hissed, causing Miss Bingley's face to burn scarlet red. Seeing his opportunity, Darcy departed. Tomorrow would be an event, but at that moment all he wanted was a scalding hot bath, nothing warm and comforting to remind him of Elizabeth. Chapter 18 It was silent around the breakfast table the following morning. Elizabeth was grateful for it. Her head ached from lack of sleep, but she had a full day planned, and resting indoors would do nothing to distract her thoughts. William would not approve, but she would walk alone to Lucas Lodge to call on Charlotte and Lady Lucas. The distance was not far. 
Her breaths came out in puffs in the winter air. Her wool stockings and kid leather gloves kept her comfortable enough, but it was still a welcome relief when she saw the smoke rising from the chimneys at Lucas Lodge. Quickening her pace to warm her body until her skin could soak up the heat of the fire, she jogged up the steps to the door. Elizabeth was immediately shown into the drawing room where Charlotte sat by the window, squinting her eyes to see her embroidery in the dark room. Her sister Maria practised a piece on the pianoforte. Lady Lucas was nowhere in sight. Charlotte dropped her embroidery as soon as she opened her eyes enough to see who had come to call. Lizzie, I have been expecting you. I am so glad you have come. Hugging Elizabeth tightly, Charlotte led her to the settee nearest the fire. Mother will be happy to see you. Since she has taken ill, it is impossible to give her any cheer, said Charlotte, nodding at Maria to continue playing. Perhaps you will have more success than we have had. I am glad to help if she will see me. There is a question I should like to ask her if you do not believe her to be too delicate for easy conversation. She aimed to find out what the ladies who assembled at the haberdashery were up to once and for all. I should not think so. Her body is weak, but her mind is strong. I dare say it will do her a great deal of good. The puppy is in a basket in Mother's room. Would you like to see her? Charlotte asked. Yes, let's see her. Pulling ribbons in Lydia's favourite shade of pink out of her reticule, Elizabeth added, I came prepared. I only hope the puppy does not attempt to eat these. Come, Charlotte led Elizabeth out of the door, up the staircase, and down a long hallway to the last door. She knocked twice, and the maid was quick to receive them. Is mother well? Miss Elizabeth is here for the puppy. The maid moved to the side to allow them in, shutting the door and any light from the hallway out. The only illumination in the room was from the small fireplace. Charlotte left Elizabeth by the door, crossing the room to the curtains, which she pulled aside. Mother, I know what the doctor says, but too much darkness cannot be good for you. You will soon lose all sense of night and day, and you will develop the sleeping habits of a night owl. Then we will have to send for sleeping draughts. So long as you close them before you leave, Charlotte, Lady Lucas said in a weak voice. Oh, Miss Elizabeth, I did not see you. Elizabeth had not seen Lady Lucas either. She rested on a fainting couch beyond the glow of the fire. Come nearer the fire, mother, lest you catch a chill. Like a sergeant giving orders, Charlotte moved her mother to the cushion chair by the fire, casting a disapproving glance at Lady Lucas's maid in the process. She would do well as the wife of a colonel. I am not feeling well, Charlotte, Lady Lucas said softly, glancing at Elizabeth. Nonsense. Elizabeth has come to select a puppy for Lydia. I think she will like the speckled one. Bring the basket to us. Lady Lucas called over her shoulder at the maid, who bobbed a curtsy and went through the doorway opposite them to the sitting room. The cocker spaniel who had lain under the fainting couch followed her mistress, resting her black and white chin on Lady Lucas's legs until her mistress patted the chair and she leapt up to sit on her lap. Duchess only has two puppies left. One has taken a liking to Sir William and follows him everywhere. The other is the best-looking of the bunch. She does, however, have a bad habit of chewing on slippers and stealing food, said Lady Lucas, patting Duchess on the head and generally avoiding eye contact with Elizabeth. I shall hide the slippers at Longbourn and tell Cook to keep the pantry closed. Elizabeth smiled, trying to appease Lady Lucas. Besides, if the puppy comforted Lydia as Elizabeth expected... She would be worth the trouble. Rustling sounds and a thud proceeded from the sitting room. A flash of speckled black and white fur ran into the room, followed by a flustered maid. I apologise, ma'am. I could not get her inside the basket. The puppy pounced on Elizabeth, scratching at her knees in excitement. Her pink tongue bathed Elizabeth's hand as she reached up to touch the white tuft of fur between the puppy's ears. 
She had little patches of white surrounding her feet, looking as though she wore slippers. Her fur was soft. Pulling the bright pink ribbon from her pocket, Elizabeth held it out for the dog to poke at and sniff. I think she likes the ribbon, Charlotte observed, taking one of them from Elizabeth and tying it around the puppy's ear, while Elizabeth did the same on the opposite side. Instead of rubbing them off with her paws, the little dog's ears perked up and she moved her head from side to side as if asking them, do these ribbons bring out the sheen in my coat? Duchess barked her approval and Lady Lucas smiled. She is rather vain, is she not? She is perfect, said Elizabeth aloud. For Lydia, she added in her own mind. Lady Lucas grew serious, her lips trembling. She pulled out a handkerchief and dabbed at her eyes. I cannot tell you how sorry I am for your loss. Her sorrow pierced Elizabeth's heart. Mother had tormented Lady Lucas for as long as Elizabeth could remember. Her constant, unflattering comparisons of their daughters always fared ill for Lady Lucas. But she had borne it like a true lady. It touched Elizabeth that Lady Lucas should be moved to tears when one, whom she well could have considered an enemy, was no longer a part of her life. Thank you, Lady Lucas. We are still in a state of shock, and I will admit I am not at peace to mourn her properly until the identity of the individual who acted so violently against Mother is discovered. Now was her chance. She would not waste it. Now that a couple of days have passed, do you remember anything which might help me? Lady Lucas gazed blankly into the fire. I am so sorry I cannot help you. Not easily deterred, Elizabeth pressed. Are you certain? You were with a group of ladies. Why were you there? Lady Lucas swallowed hard, but she kept her face turned away. The flames flickered across her pale face. Mother, it is a simple enough question. Is it a worthy cause for the war against Napoleon? To Elizabeth, Charlotte added. Mother often participates in charitable causes. Most likely that was all it was. Calling to her maid, Lady Lucas rose shakily to her feet. I apologize, girls. I am unwell and must rest. Pray excuse me. She leaned on her maid while Duchess trotted beside her to the bed. Close the curtains before you leave, Charlotte. Have the maid take the puppy downstairs for Miss Elizabeth. With a confused glance at Elizabeth, Charlotte did as she was bid. There was nothing left to do but leave. Gathering Lydia's puppy in her arms and receiving a kiss of thanks for her gesture, Elizabeth handed the squirming dog over to the maid and waited for Charlotte by the door just as the clock chimed the hour. The familiar sound froze the blood in Elizabeth's veins and she strained her eyes in the darkness in search of its source. She found it just before Charlotte drew the curtains. On the small table beside Lady Lucas's bed sat the marble mantel clock, the same clock which had disappeared from the shelf behind Mother on the day of her murder. Chapter 19 Darcy sat looking out of the parlour window as Bingley paced back and forth, wearing a path in his carpet from the window to the door. Sit down, Mr Bingley. Your constant movement is aggravating. Aunt Catherine, Darcy had noticed, had donned her stiffest silk gown and her biggest jewels. Her maid had teased her hair into imposing heights, towering over the top of the chair she occupied. Anne had been instructed to remain in her rooms lest the confrontation induce an episode. Bingley dropped into the nearest chair, crossing one foot over the other, then switching them again. Just watching him made Darcy nervous. Really, Mr Bingley, declared Aunt Catherine, her patience put to the ultimate test by his constant fidgeting. Bingley would be the least of her worries as soon as Lord Haversham arrived. I apologise, Lady Catherine. 
This makes the second time a guest in my home has been suspected of murder. I fear the good people of Meryton will begin to think this estate is cursed. I know I am inclined to think it. Darcy had not considered how Lord Haversham's visit would affect Bingley, other than the nerves it would induce at his being forced to witness an altercation. Mere circumstance, Bingley. Far more good has come of your residence here than bad. You ought to think of that. Not if you ask Caroline and Louisa, mumbled Bingley. Their stay here can only lead to disappointment, said Darcy. I know that. They ought to know it too. How is that? asked Aunt Catherine. I was under the impression they sought the peace and tranquility of the countryside. If that is their purpose here, why should they be disappointed? She shifted in her seat and looked nervously at the door, which remained closed. No footsteps echoed in the marble hall to alert them of the arrival of Lord Havisham. Bingley stuttered to find a suitable answer. He was not blinded by ambition, as his sisters were. He knew very well that no matter how much Miss Bingley befriended Aunt Catherine, the matron would never approve of a match between a lady whose dowry was earned through trade and her nephew. Miss Bingley wishes to marry into a fortune, said Darcy. Aunt Catherine rolled her eyes. Then she should have remained in London. The only gentleman of fortune here is... She cut her sentence short and her eyes widened as realisation dawned like the summer sun, bright and clear. Darcy did not spare her. After all, she had been the one to accept Miss Bingley's offer of hospitality without the least concern of how it would affect anyone other than herself. Her own selfishness had prevented her from seeing the true intentions of an unyielding aspirant who would seek out her good opinion. Pinching her lips and flaring her nostrils, Aunt said, it will not do. You must think of Georgiana's future. Her prospects are of the utmost importance, and marrying into a family tainted by trade would limit her options. You would be better off with that. Bennet girl, Darcy finished for her. I agree wholeheartedly with you, Aunt. How perceptive of you. Aunt Catherine huffed the veins in her neck and temples casting a greenish hue to her complexion. You know very well that is not what I meant. Then perhaps you should have spoken more plainly. Look at him giving advice he would do well to heed himself. He still did not understand his wrong against Elizabeth, but he was not so foolish as to fail to notice a certain pattern in their arguments. It always came down to a misunderstanding one which he should have clarified from the beginning, but failed to because of his failure to explain more than was necessary before she could jump to all the wrong conclusions. His entire life as the master of a large estate had trained him to give orders and have them obeyed. Never had he been presumed upon to offer an explanation until Elizabeth. While his aunt huffed and puffed and Bingley cleared his throat and coughed to disguise his laugh, Darcy attempted to understand where he had erred. What had he done wrong? He had only wanted to help her, yet she seemed ungrateful. Had he left out some important detail about Anne? Elizabeth had immediately pitied Anne, but not for the reasons Darcy had supposed she would. Darcy was on the brink of understanding. It was so close he could have reached out and touched it, when the door opened and Lord Havisham entered the room, closely followed by Tanner and Richard. Darcy wanted to ask Richard where he had been, but it would wait. The spectacle before them was worthy of his full attention. Aunt Catherine's spine stiffened so severely her corset creaked. Lord Havisham stood before her, his stony gaze taking in every detail from her exaggerated hair to her gaudy gown. She met his eyes, but Darcy saw her struggle to maintain her composure. Raising her chin and feigning haughtiness, she finally looked to her skirts as if they were much more interesting to arrange than to stare into the face of an elderly man who had once captured her heart. Darcy believed the story now. 
Bingley extended his arm out to the chairs beside Lord Havisham, but the Earl remained standing before Aunt Catherine. First, allow me a word with our suspects, gentlemen. There is something I have been waiting to tell her these many years. Chairs scraped as they rose to leave. Lord Havisham raised his hand. No, please stay. I will afford Cathy the same courtesy she gave me. He could have said nothing else to increase Aunt Catherine's anxiety more. She hated being at the centre of a spectacle. Darcy saw her pulse thrumming through her veins as if they would leap out of her skin. She clasped her hands and arched her neck to a flattering angle, raising her eyebrows in faint surprise and boredom. Her act was superior to any performance Darcy had seen on this stage, but he knew her too well to be fooled by it, as did Lord Havisham. Sitting directly across from her, he leaned forward, capturing her eyes so that she would have to have turned her head to look away. When you refused my hand, he began, pausing long enough for Aunt Catherine to swallow hard and for Darcy to have to remind himself to breathe. Leaning back in his chair, Lord Havisham continued, It did not take long for me to realise the gift you had given me. I am eternally grateful to you, Cathy, and I want you to know I have not harboured any resentment toward you these many years. I hope you have been as happy. Darcy's relief was so great he nearly laughed. He did not have the same freedom of expression which would have brought certain laughter to Elizabeth, but he would relate this story with all of its details to her just to hear it again. However, Lord Havisham's words did not have the same effect on Aunt Catherine. Her eyes narrowed and her complexion mottled. You came here to insult me. You presumed to use my Christian name and pretend I meant nothing to you. How dare you? There was a time when you meant the world to me. Aunt's cold chortle bode ill for Lord Havisham. Is that why you married the... Aunt fluttered her fingers. What was she? Something humble and average. Lord Havisham went still. You speak of my wife's origins, as if they formed part of her character. Let me assure you, they only serve to refine her. With another chuckle, Aunt said, Oh, I remember now. She was the parson's daughter, was she not? Aunt may as well have accused her of being a prostitute for all the vile with which she pronounced her lowly position. I warn you not to speak derisively of my wife. She was an excellent woman with a grace and dignity far above those who later became her peers. With a loud harumph, Aunt's sharp tongue lashed out, a nobody who became a titled lady. Only your lot considered her beneath you. She became everything to me. Everything when she brought nothing to your union? Love passes, but her fortune is inherited for generations after you are gone. That is how you make your name remembered. Darcy shook his head. For a moment, he had felt as if his father was in the room with his ambition and craving for prominence. When people remembered George Darcy, they thought of a hard man of weak virtue who was willing to trample over others to grasp at fortune and position. Lord Havisham's voice vibrated through the room. I had a wife I adored, and three boys who we raised together to be outstanding men. Had you condescended to accept my offer of marriage, I would have become the most miserable man in all of England before you drove me to madness. And yet I was the first to receive your offer, Aunt Catherine said triumphantly, as if she could win this argument. With admirable self-possession, Lord Havisham lowered his voice and relaxed his rigid posture. That is true, but it has been so long since your name has fostered anything in my breast but the deepest pity 
I can no longer call to mind the motives which possessed me to propose to you. Aunt's voice snapped. Pity! You dare pity me when I descend from one of the greatest families in England? Lord Havisham shook his head and sighed. My father was an earl, too. I think you wished the title for me much more than I ever did. If Aunt Catherine held any tender regard for Lord Havisham after they had parted ways, it must have been distressing for her to hear how he had inherited after she had refused him. And now, to hear him thank her for it and speak lovingly of his deceased wife? Her pride was taking a thorough and well-deserved thrashing. You are a fool if you cannot see the benefits of your position, Aunt Catherine insulted. At what cost? I lost two brothers to inherit my title. If I could have them back, I would hand it to them on a golden platter. Tell me, Cathy, has your loyalty to society been to your gain? Do you still put its influence over the obligations of your heart and the interests of those you hold dear? You can have no idea what I have sacrificed for the ones I love. Aunt replied levelly. Darcy knew the truth behind Aunt's words. Her faults were many, but where Anne was concerned, she had been a fierce protector. Havisham, Aunt Catherine, we are wasting precious time. Please, let us see to the matter at hand so we may continue about our day. Darcy moved closer, taking a seat between them. Bingley chose to remain at a distance, he had problems enough of his own with Aunt Catherine under his roof and a sister with overreaching aspirations. It was only a matter of time before Aunt Catherine slashed her claws at Miss Bingley. Richard sat opposite Darcy, adding another barrier between the elderly opponents. Thank you, Darcy. You are right. There are graver matters at hand, said Lord Havisham. The door to the parlour burst open carrying Miss Bingley in like a chilling draught. Your ladyship, I only now heard of the magistrate's call, a negligence for which I must beg your pardon. My brother did not see fit to tell me you were in need of my assistance. Bingley stood, his eyes large. Caroline, you must leave. I will do no such thing when it is in my power to uphold the Darcy name above reproach. Richard gawked, his mouth wide open, while Lord Havisham appeared amused at the addition of another bold female in the room. It was the look on Aunt Catherine's face which gave Darcy pause. He saw the workings of her mind as clearly as the gears of a clock. Miss Bingley, I encourage you to pay heed to your brother, Darcy said, confident his plea would fall on deaf ears. If she chose to stay... She would dig her own grave. Aunt Catherine focused her wrath on the young lady before her. Miss Bingley, why do you presume to burst into a discussion to which you were purposefully not invited? I, Miss Bingley stuttered in doubt, I came to assist you. I know you did not kill Mrs. Bennet. Lord Havisham asked, can you account for Lady Catherine's presence from the time she left the Meryton Inn until she returned? Yes. All of it? She was in your sight every second, he insisted. Miss Bingley shifted her weight. It would be ridiculous to suppose I can account for every second. However, I can attest to her superior character and... Miss Bingley! Aunt hissed. Your presence in this room is what is ridiculous, not to mention your delusions of grandeur in believing yourself worthy of marrying one so far superior to you. You are unworthy to wipe the dust from his boots. Leave this parlour before I determine to turn the best families in London against you, so that even your dearest friends wish they had never allowed your shabby slippers to cross their threshold. The walk of shame was five paces long, and Miss Bingley reached the doorway with her dignity dragging around her feet. Disappearing out to the hallway, Darcy heard her 
and Mrs. Hurst, who from the echoes of their whispers had been eavesdropping, bicker until Bingley rose to close the door. Thank you, Mr. Bingley, said Lord Havisham, in his gentle voice communicating that he thought no ill of the gentleman for possessing a contentious sister. Turning to Aunt Catherine, Lord Havisham asked directly, Lady Catherine, did you murder Mrs. Bennet? Darcy believed her innocent to the core of his soul, and yet he gripped the arms of his chair, turning his knuckles white, waiting for her answer. Chapter 20 Stunned into speechlessness, Elizabeth walked part way along the hall with Charlotte before the irrefutable evidence crashed down around her. Lady Lucas? Elizabeth did not want to believe it. How could she tell her best friend of what she suspected, of what the evidence seemed to prove, without ending their long-standing friendship? Desperate to disprove the notion, Elizabeth focused on the facts. Lady Lucas came to the haberdashery after Mother's murder. Oh, but Elizabeth remembered seeing her leave the shop minutes before. It had struck her as odd that Lady Lucas had left the door open. Did the other ladies know? Had they seen or heard something? Tension crawled up Elizabeth's spine, settling at the base of her neck. She could not trust those ladies. They had already lied. She grasped at another fact. The marble mantel clock had been on the shelf behind the chair the same day William had returned to Meryton, merely two days before the militia parade. If only she could ask if the clock had been sold. But she could not trust the Burks if they lied to protect Lady Lucas. But why this absurd pact of secrecy? Was Lady Lucas in possession of some information which could harm the Burks? Information which might explain their close association? If only Elizabeth knew the reason behind their meeting, it would offer insight into their lies. Lizzie, are you well? Charlotte turned to her, resting her hand on Elizabeth's shoulder. Yes she began to say, only to realise how easily she too had lied. Had it been easy for Mr. Burke? What of the other ladies who did nothing to reveal their purpose, thus giving their support to Mr. Burke? As damning as the facts were, and as badly as she would rather blame a group of ladies instead of her best friend's mother, Elizabeth could not lie to Charlotte. You worry me, Lizzie. Charlotte reached for her hand, tugging on it for Elizabeth to follow her into her room and across the carpet to the settee placed under the polished window, where the sunlight beaming in between clouds revealed every line of concern on her friend's face. Elizabeth could conceal nothing in this bright room, even if she had wished to. "'Shall I send for tea?' Charlotte asked, her eyes searching for a servant. "'No,' Please do not trouble yourself. What she must tell Charlotte was awful enough without the chance of a maid overhearing a portion of it. It is no trouble at all. She slid forward on the cushion, making to stand. Elizabeth grabbed her arm. Please, I must insist. Even to her own ears, she sounded frantic. What is it? Allow me to be your friend and tell me what has disturbed you so that I may help. Elizabeth's head buzzed, and the flowered paper on Charlotte's bedchamber walls blurred in her vision. The only sounds Elizabeth heard were her own shallow breaths. Was it a betrayal to believe Lady Lucas capable of the worst crime known to man when she so easily excused Lady Catherine of guilt? The clock... Elizabeth's voice floated from her of its own accord. Charlotte nodded, her eyes imploring her to continue. Is the clock new? she asked, praying it was merely a coincidence and nothing more. I believe Mother bought it, recently. Charlotte paused, her eyebrows knit together. Elizabeth could have finished her sentence more accurately for her, 
when precisely? she asked. She had to be certain before she uttered a single word against Charlotte's mother. Two or three days ago? The day of the parade. That dreadful day kept getting uglier. Elizabeth's heart sank. Her need for answers and justice stood in direct opposition to a friendship she had treasured her entire life. She could no sooner hurt her dearest friend than she could Jane. And yet, if Lady Lucas was guilty, what was to prevent her from injuring another? I, I remember that clock. It chimed the hour when I saw Mr. Darcy return from London. That had been a happy memory. How drastically things had changed in the course of four days. I noticed it was gone the day Mother was killed. I remember thinking then that it must have been... Elizabeth chewed on her lip, unable to say the words she needed to say. It must have been what? Charlotte encouraged. Tears choked Elizabeth and a sob escaped her. Her dear friend whom she would forever distance once the accusation was made, wrapped her arm around Elizabeth's shoulders and held her. Rocking her back and forth, Charlotte said, You have had too much tragedy of late. Something has distressed you today, and I would love nothing more than to help you. But if you cannot speak it yet, I want you to know that I am always at your disposal. When you need me, I am here. Her kindness cut Elizabeth to the core. Shrugging off her arm, for she did not deserve Charlotte's comfort, Elizabeth said, It is so much worse than you think. If she did not say it now, she never would. Inhaling deeply, she let it out in one fluid breath. It is very possible, almost certain, that the clock in Lady Lucas's room is the same clock that killed my mother. Charlotte sat back, withdrawing her hand and her comfort. Her eyes narrowed and her mouth closed tightly in thought. She did not take more than a few seconds to contemplate Elizabeth's words, but to Elizabeth it felt much longer. Finally, Charlotte spoke. Her voice was even without the quiver of emotion. How can you be certain it was the clock used against Mrs. Bennet? It was a perfectly reasonable question to which, unfortunately, Elizabeth had an equally reasonable reply. It was on the shelf before Mother was murdered, and it was gone afterward. Mother's injury was of the kind which would require a heavy object, and the marble clock would have done the job efficiently without requiring great force from her attacker. But you cannot be certain the clock was used, can you? The haberdashery is crowded with heavy objects. Not in the corner where Mother had sat, and not with the round curve required to crush her forehead as it was. Trying to give credit to Charlotte's argument, Elizabeth pictured the room as it had been the day she had sat in the chair in the corner. The feathers had tickled her fingers as they brushed against her when she sat. On the other side of the vase of feathers was the case holding the books in the lending library. Above her, the clock tick-tocked a steady rhythm, surrounded by small framed paintings, embroidered scenes, and tall, narrow candlesticks. Candlesticks? No, they were too narrow. On the other side of the chair were writing tables and an assortment of inkwells scattered over their polished surfaces. An inkwell? She latched on to the possibility. There is a slight chance an inkwell could have done it, if there was one heavy enough. Charlotte, clearly as eager to grasp at straws as Elizabeth was, said, You see, it is only a coincidence. You are overly strained, and the worry is blurring your reason. Now I promise I will keep my ears open for any news. If I hear anything which might help us determine who has committed this horrible crime, I will run to Longbourn and tell you in person. Charlotte's optimism tormented Elizabeth's guilt, for no matter how reasonable it was to think of the possibility of another object being used as a weapon, it did not take away her suspicions against the mantel clock in Lady Lucas's possession. 
I am so sorry, Charlotte. Do not be, Charlotte said as she rose from her city. Clasping her hands together in front of her, she added, No matter what you may think, I refuse to believe my mother capable of committing such a heinous crime against a family we have considered friends. Our loyalty is stronger than your suspicions, and I thank you to extend us the same courtesy. And there it was. The offence. Elizabeth had never felt so low. Charlotte stepped over to the door, waiting expectantly for Elizabeth to leave. Mustering what dignity she could, Elizabeth followed her out to the hall, leaving her at the top of the stairs. Charlotte, I... Elizabeth did not know what she could say to repair the damage. Not now, Lizzie. Please, go home and allow me time to discern what has happened here today. That said, Charlotte disappeared through her doorway. Elizabeth did not know how long her leaden feet refused to move, but her puppy whine brought her to her senses enough to continue to the bottom of the stairs, where the butler extended a recently brushed puppy with pink bows around her ears and neck, squirming in a basket. Miss Elizabeth, shall I ask Sir William to allow his carriage to convey you home? This little miss will be a handful for you, I fear. The kindly butler smiled at her, as if she were part of his master's family. She reached out to take the basket. The puppy stretched up the side and leaned her head back to lick Elizabeth's fingers. The endearing gesture twisted Elizabeth's gut, her guilt increasing. No, thank you. I have been enough trouble today and should take my leave. I enjoy the exercise and Longbourn is not far. The butler looked confused, as well he should but Elizabeth looped the basket through her arms and clutched them to her chest on her way out of the dark entrance hall of Lucas Lodge. She was not welcome there any more. The sun blinded her, and she blamed the bright luminary for provoking the tears streaming down her cheeks. Tears, which the puppy thought were part of a delightful game, she pounced up to lick them from the air. Stopping to dry her face, Elizabeth said to the innocent animal, I have made a mess of things, have I not? Well, he must think me the most ungrateful human being of his acquaintance and most unfit to marry. Charlotte most assuredly believes me to be the worst friend on the earth. And did you know blissfully, happy puppy, that I recently lost my mother? Accepting her discomfort as deserved punishment for all her recent wrongs, she pulled the heavy basket closely to her heart, which of the two was decidedly heavier, and set out at a brisk pace for her home, repeating over and over to herself how content she ought to be at the prospect of bringing cheer to one of her sisters, even if Elizabeth herself doubted she could ever again feel happy. Chapter 21 Darcy, what is the matter with you? Richard asked after the last interview appointment left, closing the door to the private room behind them. Lord Havisham and Tanner made no motion to leave, and Darcy was in no mood to air his concerns out in the open. You were rude to Mr. Burke. He may have provided us with a valuable lead to the missing inkwell, commented Lord Havisham. Somebody probably pinched it, mumbled Tanner. Perhaps, but I need your help searching for it nonetheless, Lord Havisham ordered. Tanner furled his brow. He was rude, and I am being punished. Perfect. Darcy returned Tanner's glare. He needed to know he is still considered a suspect. The men who had helped him unload their cart of furniture could not attest to his constant presence in the back room while they laboured. You called his character into question, Lord Havisham said in a monotone. He cared more for the reputation of his precious shop than the lives affected by Mrs. Bennet's death. I care not if I have offended him and his wife when they have acted in an abominable fashion toward their own patrons. Even though Mr. Bennet had the reputation of forgetting to pay the expenses incurred by his wife, 
Even Mr. Burke had admitted that he did always pay, eventually. Lord Havisham said, Mr. Turner, ask Mrs. Molly to bring in some of her delicious beef stew. Perhaps Mr. Darcy's humour will return to him if we fill his belly. Tanner guffawed. Return his humour? He would have to possess one first. Richard chuckled with him. You do not know Darcy well enough yet, sir. What you witnessed today is fairly normal. Oh, wipe that surly frown off your face, Darcy. If he had worn a frown, it was now a full scowl. Do you not find it frustrating that in a scene with perhaps hundreds of potential witnesses, not one of them can admit to seeing anything of import? The entire village has gone silent, and we are no closer to determining the identity of Mrs. Bennet's murderer than we were the day it occurred. Unless we are all cautious, we will have to send Aunt Catherine to Hartford for trial, for the mere reason that we were unable to discover a better suspect. It is unacceptable. Lord Havisham's chair squeaked under his weight as he leaned back and crossed his arms over his chest. As much delight as I might take in causing Cathy discomfort, I would never wish her harm when it is in my power to prevent it. Her presence at the Lamb Society meeting before the parade and her refusal to reveal her whereabouts when she left bodes ill for her. Darcy squeezed his fingers together until his bones cracked. Calm yourself, man, said Tanner, returning to the room with a platter heaped with steeping bowls of stew and chunks of bread. Mrs. Molly came behind him, balancing four large tankards of ale in her hands. You would not be calm if you're in my place, Darcy complained. Richard tore off a piece of bread, dunking it in his stew. And why is that, Darcy? because instead of comforting the lady you wish to marry, you choose to stay with us unmarried chaps. Lord Havisham lifted his tankard. Well put, Colonel. You would have me ignore the murder of Elizabeth's mother. Justice must be meted out or she will never have peace. Darcy could excuse Tanner and Richard's ignorance. They knew nothing of the ways of women, but Lord Havisham ought to have known better. That proves how ignorant you are, young man, said Lord Havisham. Feeling his hackles rise, Darcy shoved his plate away, only to have Lord Havisham shove it back into place. Eat, he said, tapping Darcy's plate and ordering him about like he was no bigger than a schoolboy. Tanner and Richard knew better than to laugh, but they had great difficulty swallowing the lumps in their mouths, the louts. Jabbing at a cube of meat, Darcy popped it into his mouth. The beef was so tender, it melted on his tongue, and though he would never admit as much to the other gentlemen in the room, it tasted delicious. His stomach rumbled at the offering, telling him how hungry he had been. He was chewing his next bite when Lord Havisham nodded at him in approval. Never was a fight, nor a fair lady won on an empty stomach. The nourishment fed Darcy's valour. Tell me, if you are truly more knowledgeable in the subject, how am I wrong to court Miss Elizabeth by discovering who murdered Mrs. Bennet? Lord Havisham laughed a deep, growly bark. If I am knowledgeable on the subject of women, <laughs> never would I presume such wisdom, my boy. I do, however, no more than you do, and so I will do my best to give your question a worthy answer. Richard leaned forward in his chair, intent on Lord Havisham's reply. Tanner, on the other hand, gave more attention to his stew. Taking a long draught of his ale, Lord Havisham cleared his throat. There is one thing you must understand, Darcy. No matter how well you feel you know your young miss, you know nothing. What she feels and what she chooses to reveal to you are often two conflicting extremes. Miss Elizabeth never hides her emotions, Darcy said with pride. The Earl had been a widower too long. His memory failed him. 
Lord Havisham shook his head in pity. You know nothing. Accept it, and you will add to the peace in your household. Never assume when she, and any other lady for that matter, wishes for you to ask. It may be that you have read her signs correctly, but many times you will be wrong, and all she needed was for you to take the time to listen to her concerns. Oftentimes that is enough. But that's all nothing, countered Darcy. My wife never came to me with a problem she was incapable of solving better than me. In my experience, she merely needed me to listen to her idea to convince herself of its worth. If I listened to her, giving her the attention she deserved and dignifying her, she would even credit me for taking care of what had robbed her of sleep when it was not me at all. It was all her. He smiled to himself, rubbing his palm across his chest. My, how I miss her, he whispered. Touched as he was by Lord Havisham's undying love for his wife, there was a gaping hole in his reasoning. How is it just for you to get the credit for solving a problem when you did nothing to solve it? I fear I would find such praise undeserving and patronizing. Richard said, I would like very much to always be seen as a hero in the eyes of my future wife. If that is all it takes, care and a listening ear, well then, I shall become the best listener in England for the lady with whom I choose to share my life. Darcy had done what he humanly could to make Elizabeth's life easier, and what had it earned him? Her derision. But this is nonsensical. Why would an intelligent woman give credit where it is not due? I should rather earn her respect and love by acting to prove how important she is to me. It had not worked thus far, but he was a persistent fellow. And you should continue to do that, of course, said Lord Havisham. Not a day should go by without some display of your continued affection. A good marriage needs constant attention— However, your wife will see your love proved in ways you could never imagine. I shall never forget the time I surprised my Maggie with a diamond necklace. It was a work of art, with amethyst gems inlaid in a floral pattern I knew she would adore. She thought they were lovely, and she expressed her gratitude in a manner most pleasing to me. However, later that week, our youngest boy fell ill. It was late at night, and the weather was as bad as it was the night you came to me. I could not send a servant when my horse was the fastest in the stable, so I rode to fetch the doctor. My efforts were rewarded for weeks afterward, something this expensive jewelry never managed. He shook his head, as if he still could not comprehend it fully. Nor did Darcy. You merely did what you had to do. How could that possibly compare to a gift that proves you wish to please her? His confidence in the gift he had brought Elizabeth from London wavered. What if she did not understand its value? Tanner swallowed his last bite, pounding the table with his large fist. And that gentleman? Why, I would much rather remain unattached. Women are impossible. Just when you think you understand them, they change, and they always marry a man with the intention of improving him, as if we are as inconstant as they are. Admit it, Tanner, the world would be a rather drab place without the colour women add to it, Richard said, swirling the ale in his tankard. Other than my saint of a mother, the only colour I manage to provoke in a woman is red. If happy marriages could be made by two people set in opposition to each other, then I might consider it. But I am too set in my ways to allow some female to disrupt my life. Tanner nodded his head in finality, and it occurred to Darcy that Tanner's bold, determined statements destined him to be the next to fall. That Richard had already met with some success in the marriage front, was evident from his constant disappearances to Lucas Lodge, Darcy suspected. 
Sounds lively, Richard said, saluting Tanner. Lord Havisham chuckled. You're in for a rough fall, dear sir, if your time should ever come. My wife and I rarely saw eye to eye. She was much more refined than I have ever been, or could be. We had lively discussions, heated disputes, you might call them. Oh, but when we made peace... Lord Havisham let his words drift off to haunt Darcy's imagination. He was not so naive he did not comprehend the gentleman's meaning. Richard sighed. Darcy did not know what to think. He had insight enough to recognise the wisdom in the Earl's words, but Darcy was unaccustomed to needing correction. It made him doubt what he had been so certain about moments ago. He had decided to present his gift to Elizabeth, allowing his offering to smooth over whatever faults she accused him of until he could convince her to marry him. Now it was not enough. In fact, it would probably make her angry. He would just have to continue to carry it in his pocket, as he had been. Lord Havisham spoke. Miss Elizabeth is an independent sort of young lady. I do not know her well, but I admire her strength. If you win her loyalty, you will have won a gift with more value than all all the treasure ever to pass through the hand of a man. Do not let it go to waste, as your aunt did. Do not allow pride to steal away the greatest blessing known to man. Greatest blessing? asked Tanner. The love of a good woman, Lord Havisham clarified, in a firm voice, brooking no argument. Tanner took his hint and said nothing more, though it was clear he disagreed with every twitch of his jaw. Silence fell over them. Richard looked up at the ceiling with a lovelorn grin on his face. Perhaps he would beat Bingley to the altar after all. Richard had always been quick to act once he made a decision. It had served him well in the army, and Darcy had no doubt it would serve him well on the home front. Lord Havisham's eyes lowered as he undoubtedly brought his wife back from his memories, giving him a warm smile and a contented look Darcy craved for himself. Tanner looked around at them as if they were the worst fools. Throwing his arms up into the air, he scraped his chair back against the wood planks to stand. You are pathetic, the lot of you. I'm going back to the taproom. The air has grown too heavy for me here. Darcy watched him leave, but he did not follow. He needed a new plan. Miss Molly came in, loading her arms with their empty dishes. Mr Bingley is here, Mr Darcy. And what of it? he asked, biting his tongue at the harshness in his tone. If Bingley came into the village in search of him, it could only mean he bore bad news. She must have become accustomed to Tanner's blunt manners, for Miss Molly continued cleaning off the table, wiping it down with a clean rag while balancing the dishes on a platter propped on her hip without pause. He looks dreadful. Pardon me for intruding, please, but it would be a kindness for you to seat your friend instead of leaving him in Mr. Tanner's hands. True. I have some notes to make in my room, said Lord Havisham. Have a good afternoon, gentlemen, and thank you for your assistance. If anything remarkable happens, I will inform you directly. Richard stood, nearly toppling the chair over in his haste. I have an important call to make. I bet you do, young man. Lord Havisham smacked him on the back as they turned toward the door. Darcy followed them out to the taproom, pausing to calm himself on contemplating Bingley. His hair stood on end from his incessant tugging. His neckcloth... The bane of Bingley's valet's existence hung limply to one side. Darcy, there you are. I do not know what to do. I need to see her, to know she is well. But my sisters insist I ought not call while Miss Bennet is in mourning. They cannot understand I shall go mad unless I see her. He could have pointed out that Bingley had seen Miss Bennet the previous day, but he did not. Empathising with the desperation in Bingley's tone, Darcy clapped his hand on his friend's shoulder. 
I will go with you. He had no plan, but he would test Lord Havisham's theory. He would try anything to ease Elizabeth's pain and mend her heart. If that meant admitting to an error he was unaware of having committed, so be it. Chapter 22 Giggles and yelps greeted Darcy as he and Bingley neared Longbourn. Miss Kitty and Miss Lydia ran around the house chasing a black and white bolt of lightning. The puppy darted between the horses, spooking them and nearly trampling the source of the mischief under their hooves. Chloe, come here, you naughty beast, shouted Miss Lydia, clutching her sides and doubling over in laughter. She wore a black gown, as she had since Mrs. Bennet's death, but her semblance was greatly improved. Calling the little ball of fur a beast was perhaps a touch exaggerated, but Miss Lydia was given to dramatics. It soothed Darcy's heart to see happiness at Longbourn. Darcy hopped down from the saddle, and reached out with his long arms to scoop up Chloe, who licked the air in her glee and squirmed to be let down so that she might run her new playmates all over Hertfordshire. Darcy ruffled the tuft of fur between her ears and handed her over to Miss Lydia, who showered the puppy with kisses. Thank you, Mr. Darcy. I do not know what I would do if Chloe had got away from me or came to any harm. In a tone similar to one of Mrs. Bennet's superficial scoldings, she said, Bad Chloe, you really must take more care around the horses. Never run away from me again or I shall have to punish you properly. To Miss Kitty, she added, let us introduce our newest member of the family to the other animals in the barn. Before they continued to the barn, Miss Kitty said, Jane and Lizzie are reading in the rose garden if you wish to call on them. With a nice curtsy, she must have been practising. She smiled and followed her sister at a swift gait. The rose garden boasted one carefully manicured rose bush, surrounded by others in various stages of neglect. It would not surprise Darcy to learn that Mr. Bennet refused to care for his rose bushes upon learning how Mr. Collins favoured the bloom. The scratches on Miss Mary's hands had suggested who the keeper of the lone thorny bush was. At the edge of the garden, where a small pond separated the house from the fields, sat Elizabeth. From the corner of his eye, he saw Miss Bennet join Bingley, but Darcy could not take his eyes off the young lady struggling to smile before him. Elizabeth, he whispered for her alone. William, she answered, lowering her face and looking out over the pond so he could not see her expression. Was she still angry at him? He would naturally assume so. But what did he know? According to Lord Havisham... Nothing. Partly to prove the Earl wrong, and partly hoping the Earl had dispensed a sacred key of discovery, Darcy sat beside her, resting his hand close enough to hers on the bench. Their fingers could touch if she wished it. She did not. Standing so quickly, he felt the air rustle around him. She stood facing him. Her face was a menagerie of emotion. Tell me what I must do to help you. Please uh, allow me to share your burden, he said softly. Elizabeth scoffed. You have already done enough. She sighed, admitting, You even got flowers for Mother. She would have loved them. If he had done so well, what was wrong? Why did she not speak her mind as he knew she was capable of doing? He stood, reaching his hand out to her cheek. She flinched, pushing him away. His anger rose at her unwillingness to simply tell him what was wrong. But care made him patient. Please tell me how I have erred, he insisted again. Her eyes flashed, and she closed the distance she had created only a moment before. You want to know the great wrong you have done? You come here and take charge, sing to every detail, and leave me with nothing to do. You have made me useless and aimless. He opened his mouth to respond, but she was not done. You offended me on our first meeting, and I wish I could still despise you now as I did then, but I do not. She stabbed his neckcloth with her finger. You made me care for you, 
when I have no right to, and yet I cannot hate you for it. You have doomed me to disappointment, and the injustice of it makes me so angry at you for raising my hopes up higher than I had ever dreamed of only to have you, the man I'd grown to trust, dash them to pieces. He reached out to her, and she slapped him away. No, she cried out, tears pouring down her face. You knew you were not free to encourage me, and yet that is what you did. Was I nothing more than a game to you? Her chest heaved up and down. She looked away, and he turned to see Bingley and Miss Bennet staring at them. Elizabeth waved at them to return to their sweet declarations of love, or whatever it was two people who never argued did. Let me explain. He struggled to control his temper against her accusations. He forced himself to understand her position, and the tiny amount of insight he gained made his stomach churn. His negligence in revealing something he had thought unworthy of explanation had cut her to the core, and he had allowed it. She should never have had to hear about Aunt Catherine's claims from anyone but himself, but he had not taken them seriously. She shoved against his chest, closing her fists and pummeling him between sobs. Heartbreak weakened her blows, but she hit her mark squarely, and oh, how he deserved it. Elizabeth's sobs turned to gasps in her visible struggle for breath. Darcy could bear her suffering no longer. Reaching around her, he pulled her tightly to his chest and held her. She did not fight against him. He would have loosened his hold had she done so. Instead, she buried her face into his cravat and wept, much like his mother had done the day father stole her self-worth by waving his indiscretions in front of her or the day Georgiana realised Wickham had not wanted her more than her dowry. In Elizabeth's eyes, Darcy was no different from them. Shh. He rested his cheek against the top of her head. You wish to know why my Aunt Catherine presumes an engagement between myself and Anne? He asked for clarification, taking no chances at any further misunderstandings. Elizabeth's body relaxed against his own, melting into his arms. He felt her nod and sniff. The worst was over. He could have stood holding her thus all day, for an eternity. But slowly he loosened his arms to give her his dry handkerchief. She had soaked his cravat with tears, and the sharp winter breeze cut into him when she pulled away. I'm so sorry, William. I do not know what came over me she said, covering her face from him with the linen square. He held his hands up. You are not the only one who must apologize. My pride prevented me from explaining something I deemed unworthy of my consideration. I am sorry, Elizabeth. Please, do not hide from me. She pulled one corner of the linen away from her eye. I know I look horrid. My eyes puff out and turn red when I cry then I shall do my best to never again give you cause for tears. You are always beautiful to me. He extended his hand toward the bench, inviting her to sit with him. Let me tell you of my history with Lady Catherine de Bourgh. I have resented her interference until recently. However, it does not give her any more power over me than it did before. My mother suggested her sister might attempt such a scheme, she warned me of it before she died. She did not know of Anne's malady, but she made me promise I would only marry a woman I could give my entire heart to, a woman I would respect as my equal and cherish every day of our lives together. You can imagine how such a promise would impact a boy of twelve years. It gave me the moral certainty I needed to refuse my aunt's insistence that I marry my cousin from the start. Not once have I ever given her reason to hope. But what of Mr. Berg? Do her wishes mean so little? Her wishes do not include me. When she came of age and Aunt Catherine went so far as to suggest we have the bands read, Anne told me how she did not wish to marry at all. Neither she nor I have ever desired to be anything more than cousins, a fact of which she assured me again recently, 
With Richard as a witness, we discussed her future with the knowledge of her condition in the fore, and she agreed to allow me to make inquiries into treatment. Her greatest wish is relief from her ailment upon which she can exercise more freedom. Unlike her mother, she does not see marriage as her only solution, not when she stands to inherit rosings and enough of a fortune to live on comfortably. You are not harming her in any way by refusing to marry her? No, she would not have me even if I were to offer for her. He shook his head and grinned. Anne is much more pragmatic and opinionated than I had believed her to be. She told me she would sooner marry an old man with dulled senses, though she might have the dignity of becoming a rich widow rather than the worry imposed by society's expectation that she provide an heir. She said that? Elizabeth's eyes glistened in merriment, her melancholy washed away. What would Lady Catherine say? Darcy's heart soared at the evidence of her returned humour. She would suffer an apoplexy, rendering her mute. You should be so lucky, Elizabeth laughed. Smiling, Darcy said, it would be sort of a reward. Darcy saw the remorse creep across Elizabeth's smile. I should not speak the first thought to cross my mind. Lady Catherine might set herself up for ridicule, but I cannot poke fun at her determination to protect her daughter. Her loyalty deserves the highest praise, not my mockery. Which is why I do not, nor will I ever cut her off. While her company requires an excessive amount of forbearance, she will always be welcome at Pemberley. Before Darcy could concern himself with Elizabeth's thoughts on the matter, she said, As well she ought to be. Family is family, no matter how bothersome they make themselves. Darcy discerned the moment her thoughts turned to her own mother, or so he would assume. He could ask, in which case he would be certain. A good deal has happened of late. How do you fare? As she told him about Lady Lucas, the mantel clock, and her altercation with Miss Lucas, Darcy was grateful he had asked. Lord Havisham had been correct. Darcy knew nothing. But he would learn to manage his deficiency. He would learn for Elizabeth. Oh, how he loved her. Chapter 23 With her burden lightened, Elizabeth's humour returned enough for her to realise how ridiculous she must have seemed. What woman in her right mind would pummel the chest of the man she loved while crying ugly tears, making her eyes red and puffy. Stuff and nonsense. Why did she have to realise how deeply she loved him when she was at her absolute worst? She peeked over the edge of his handkerchief, expecting him to look repulsed at the outcome of her hysterical weeping. He reached out to her, and she gave her eyes a final dab before he could pluck the handkerchief away. To her surprise and great relief, he smoothed her hair near her cheek. His fingers brushed against her hot skin and her breath caught in her throat. Evidently, William's affection was not to be dissuaded by a swollen, runny nose. Had Lady Catherine been there to witness her outrageous display of emotion, she would have had to swallow her past insults against Elizabeth's use of feminine charms to entice her nephew. There was nothing charming about her present appearance. Oh, the irony. If ladies were allowed into Gentleman Jackson's, you would do your sex proud, teased William. Why are only men allowed such diversions? Mind you, I did not enjoy punching you. Now, that was not entirely true. Even in her sentimental state, she had felt the firmness of his body against hers. When he had wrapped his arms around her, she had not resisted. Reining her thoughts in before she added a ruddy blush to her already appalling appearance, she added, I hardly knew what I was doing, but I cannot help but think of the advantages of a lady knowing how to defend herself properly. His smile disappeared. Did he think her comment too improper? Between your fists, your scream and your sharp teeth, I have confidence you would manage as well as you have always done. 
He did not believe her overly bold. Slowly, she let out her breath. William continued, I do hope, however, that you are never again in the position to need those particular weapons. Elizabeth, I know it is unreasonable for me to ask. I know what your response must certainly be, and yet my concern for your safety requires me to beg you to distance yourself from this investigation. You know I cannot. Until her mother's killer was found, she could not rest. She chewed on the corner of her mouth. I believe myself to be in real danger. His semblance darkened. Has anyone attempted to cause you harm? His fists clenched and his body tensed. Would she could conceal the truth of her suspicions from him? Would she could spare him the offence of believing his aunt capable of murdering her mother? But even with Lady Lucas's clock and sudden illness, Elizabeth was not convinced of Lady Catherine's innocence. Elizabeth, please, you must tell me. Lady Catherine gave me every indication of being capable of ending a life to suit her own means. If she murdered my mother to ensure her plans, what is to prevent her from killing me as well? My aunt is all bluff and no bite. How am I to know that? She breathed threats on our first meeting. Elizabeth did not trust her. Lady Catherine was capable of inflicting as much damage as she desired. She is frail. I doubt she had strength enough to do what was done. Elizabeth gasped. How easily he excused her. Passion fuels strength, and if Mother had attempted to effect her plan, your aunt would have done anything to prevent it. She folded her arms. Plan? he asked. Oh, her careless tongue. She had hoped to never have to admit he had been right to assume she had gone into merit and to interfere, not in the manner in which he had thought, of course. But he may not see it that way. She was already treading on thin ice with her suspicion against his aunt. Elizabeth sighed. There was no avoiding the subject now. They had experienced too many misunderstandings to wish to suffer through another. At the breakfast table the morning of the parade, Lydia expressed concern that Lady Catherine, who was soon to be a guest at Netherfield Park, would arrange a compromise between Mr. Burke and yourself. If you recall, I do not admit defeat so easily, even when I was agreeable to the idea of marrying you. Was? What about now? Was she reading too much into his choice of words? How much easier it had been when she did not care so much. Now everything seemed to have a double meaning. Choosing her words carefully, fearing she had already said too much, Elizabeth countered. Without witnesses to speak up, we were free to choose how to react once we left Mr. Bingley's library. I doubt Lady Catherine would go to the trouble of entrapping you, unless she could do so thoroughly. He stared out over the pond, the breeze ruffling his curly hair. Was he angry? Disappointed? Or worse, indifferent? I believe her capable of such treachery, but Anne would never agree to it. I have learned never to lower my guard while in the company of my aunt, and I will not underestimate her now. Elizabeth's fingers chilled. Will Lady Catherine always oppose your freedom to marry whom you choose? William's assurances had satisfied her conscience where Mr. Burke was concerned. But Elizabeth now realised how that only solved one small piece of the puzzle. There was still the fire-breathing dragon to conquer. William captured her with his intense brown eyes. It is why I must be certain of my choice. She dearly wanted to ask, And are you? But she feared his answer. She had been so much trouble already. Would she be able to interfere? She asked instead. She may attempt what she will, but I am not easily deterred. That, Elizabeth believed. If there was anyone in England more stubborn than she, it was Fitzwilliam Darcy, and, perhaps what most concerned her, Lady Catherine de Bourgh. 
An unexpected voice startled Elizabeth. Mr. Darcy, oh, very good to see you again. I must take this opportunity to thank you for sending for me. The offer of your carriage was most kind and gives you credit. Of course, one would expect as much from the nephew of my patroness, Lady Catherine de Bourgh. Mr. Collins joined them, appearing from nowhere. She had not heard a carriage. Mr. Collins bowed, wiping his forehead with his handkerchief at the exertion when he stood erect again. Mr. Collins, acknowledged William, you came earlier than I suggested. Another more insightful man would have heard the complaint, but not Mr. Collins. Taking William's comment as a compliment, he bowed again, his red face beaming with pleasure. When I received your message yesterday, I hastened to make the necessary preparations so that I might join upon my grieving relatives and offer them comfort. Upon learning how Lady Catherine and Mr. Burke are also residing at Netherfield Park, I hastened all the more so that I might put myself at the disposal of her ladyship should she require my assistance and your good self, not to mention my defenceless relatives at Longbourn. The grave tragedy to befall Mrs. Bennet demands another male presence at Longbourn to ensure the safety of the ladies. Elizabeth shut her mouth so tightly her teeth ground. Mr. Collins, the great protector of defenceless damsels in distress, managed to poke himself in the eye with his damp handkerchief. William's lips twitched, but in an amazing display of self-possession, he kept his voice on an even keel. No doubt Mr. Bennet will be pleased to hear of your concern for his family. Mr. Collins agreed wholeheartedly and was about to launch into another elongated speech, preceded by yet another acquiescent bow and a deep breath, when William added in a grave tone, I must return to Meryton immediately to report to the magistrate. Lord Havisham will want to know of the recent developments. His ample use of titles prevented Mr. Collins from detaining him any further, and they returned to the front of the house where a groom waited with Mr. Bingley's and William's horses. The gentlemen mounted, and Elizabeth watched them trot down the drive. William turned to her just as he reached the lane. The look he gave her infused her with hope that all would be well. His determined countenance matched her own, making her more resolved than ever to get to the bottom of her mother's murder and to hold on to William's heart. Bingley departed for Netherfield Park, leaving Darcy to continue into Meryton. He found Richard at the stables. Richard, what brings you here? Darcy dismounted, handing the stable boy his reins. I have some disturbing news. I am glad you are here, for I would prefer for you to know it before I have to relate the whole to Lord Havisham. Richard rubbed his hand over his face. You have called at Lucas Lodge, inquired Darcy. Richard stood at attention. Yes, how did you know? Darcy sighed. I have only just arrived from Longbourn. Never could I have imagined Elizabeth as distraught as I saw her a few minutes ago. Bowing his head, Richard said, I, Charlotte, uh, uh, Miss Lucas, was as upset as a woman with tempered nerves will allow. You do not believe it, do you, Darcy? I do not know what to believe, Richard. That the truth may prove to be painful for us to accept is a real possibility. For our sakes, and especially for Elizabeth and Miss Lucas, I wish it not to be true. I will reserve my judgment until proper, indisputable proof is provided. Richard nodded. That is all we can do. Walking across the square, they hesitated before the inn's front door. Sucking in his breath, Darcy said, Let us not delay the inevitable. And of one accord, they went inside Tanner's inn in search of Lord Havisham. Chapter 24 The following morning, Elizabeth asked for coffee. Her eyes burned from the long, sleepless night. Her dreams had been invaded by Lady Catherine objecting at the final reading of her bands. Then, 
when William decided to apply for a special license, who would turn out to be an intimate friend of the Archbishop of Canterbury than Lady Catherine? The license was refused, and there was nothing to do but elope to Gretna Green. And still Lady Catherine found ways to prevent them from travelling at every turn. Charlotte had been there too, at the services, in London, at every inn they stopped at. She said nothing, but her accusatory stare hurt Elizabeth's conscience, making her feel unworthy of the happiness she sought with William. How could she ever be happy again when she was the one to send Lady Lucas to the gallows as a murderess? It could not be true. Sitting with her hands wrapped around her steaming cup, Elizabeth warmed her fingers, missing the lively conversation she had always known around the breakfast table. There was no rustling of father's newspaper. He was still ensconced in his study with three days of stubble covering his cheeks. None of her efforts had roused him since mother's burial. Mr. Collins, taking it as his God-given duty to comfort his cousins, had spent a good deal of his time attempting to converse with Father the previous afternoon. Feeling his efforts had been met with great success, Mr. Collins had satisfied himself with the acquisition of two nods and a grunt in reply to his one-sided conversation. Elizabeth had hoped Father's extreme dislike for Mr. Collins would move him to show some reaction, but his eyes had merely glassed over and he sat in his own world of what Elizabeth could only imagine were memories, and quite probably regrets. There was a knock on the front door. Elizabeth looked at the clock. It was too early for callers. It was Charlotte. She hastened into the breakfast room, leaning on the back of a chair as she tried to slow her breaths enough to speak. Elizabeth rose immediately, and Mrs. Hill insisted Charlotte sit, an offer which was refused. There is no time. I promised I would tell you directly if I learned anything, Lizzie, and it is the worst news. When Charlotte's eyes clouded with tears, Elizabeth's alarm increased. Her friend was not inclined to displays of emotion. Mrs. Hill pulled out the chair for her and reached for the teapot. Thank you for your attentions, Mrs. Hill, but I cannot be away long. Looking at Elizabeth, Charlotte asked, Will you come with me? Of course, Elizabeth said, already moving to the hall while Mrs. Hill scurried to fetch a wrap. They left Mrs. Hill with her ink-stained hand over her heart, guarding the doorway as if she could prevent any more evil from befalling her family. What is it, Charlotte? What have you learned? Elizabeth struggled to keep her friend's pace. For a moment, Elizabeth thought Charlotte would break into a run. Instead, she stopped short, blurting out, Mother confessed, and then continued on at her rapid clip. Elizabeth's heart leapt up into her throat and dread filled her bones. She confessed. No, no, it could not be. Every fibre of her being pronounced it a lie. But why would Lady Lucas lie, and especially about a murder? Come on, Lizzie. Lord Havisham is on his way, and I want to be there for Mother. She is beside herself, and I fear for her. Elizabeth's thoughts had slowed her feet. She had many questions, but Charlotte was in no position to answer them at the moment, so great was her concern for her own mother. What a dear friend! Even with her familiar loyalty, Charlotte had kept her promise. For her sake, Elizabeth would do everything she could to be present at Lady Lucas's interview. She would not believe her confession— unless there was sufficient evidence to condemn her. She prayed with all her soul that Lady Lucas's claim was unfounded, and she only required some rest. Already, Elizabeth formed excuses which she would express to ensure the revelation of the truth. Could it be Lady Lucas had suffered too great a shock? So William paced the entrance hall when they rushed through the open door at Lucas Lodge. The servants disappeared into the shadows of the dark halls with somber looks. Has Lord Havisham arrived? asked Charlotte. So William had no time to answer before they heard a creaking and jingling of a carriage approach. Charlotte said, I cannot wait to receive them here. I must go to Mother. She is waiting in her sitting room, and the maid knows to bring in a tray once everyone is settled. Her attention to detail under duress impressed Elizabeth. 
Charlotte's father, on the other hand, did not react so calmly under the pressure placed upon him. His hands shook until he clenched them together in front of him. Elizabeth heard the tremble in his breath. Turning to him before Lord Havisham had descended the carriage, Elizabeth said, Lord Havisham is a very fair man. In every way he has proved himself to be sensible and thorough in his inquiries. I have every confidence he, with the assurance of Mr. Darcy, Mr. Tanner and Colonel Fitzwilliam, will discover the truth and send the real culprit to trial. Thank you, Miss Elizabeth. I requested for Mr. Thorne to come with them. He is a familiar face, and his presence will comfort my wife. Boot steps clomped up the steps, and Lord Havisham entered the entrance hall flanked by William and Mr. Tanner on one side, and Colonel Fitzwilliam and the vicar on the other. Bows were exchanged, as well as the few pleasantries expected, and which seemed entirely inappropriate on such a dismal occasion. Nobody questioned her presence, nor did Elizabeth draw attention to it, remaining quiet and attempting to blend in with her surroundings, not a difficult task with her drab morning clothes and the dark halls of Lucas Lodge. Lady Lucas rested on a fainting couch, a vial of smelling salts on a table within reach. Her lady's maid stood over her, fanning Lady Lucas's face. Chairs had been brought inside the room, set around in a circle, as if she were already facing a judge and jury. Lord Havisham pulled his chair forward. Sir William, I am certain your wife would much prefer for you to sit beside her than next to me. Whatever she has to say today, it takes a great deal of bravery for one to admit to a wrong. Elizabeth stood by Charlotte off to the side affording them both an undisturbed view of Lady Lucas as well as the gentleman facing her. Lady Lucas, before you tell us why you have called us here this morning, is there anyone in the room other than myself and Mr. Thorne who you would rather not overhear your confession? Lady Lucas shook her head emphatically. No. She reached over and held Sir William's hand. I would rather only say what I must once. That is understandable, Lady Lucas, Lord Havisham acknowledged. A tea tray was brought in and ignored. As soon as the door shut behind the maid, Lady Lucas began her account. The day of the parade, I went into Meryton to meet with the other members of a secret group I am responsible for forming. Her eyes flickered over to Elizabeth. This group began with the innocent purpose of discussing our mutual dislike for a certain lady. Elizabeth's stomach clenched. Mrs. Bennet's comments, though thoughtless on her part, had, over the years, caused us all much grief. I have no doubt she never meant to speak maliciously, but I knew what she said of my daughters when she thought I could not hear her. Elizabeth recalled how many times Mother had called Charlotte plain and ready for the shelf. How awful it must have been for Lady Lucas to hear her remarks. But an entire group of ladies? She remembered the motley assembly gathered the day of William's return, and it made sense. Each one of those women could easily have held a grudge against Mother. Elizabeth wondered to ask why. Why had Lady Lucas allowed herself to be so offended she had formed a club against a woman she knew not to possess enough sense to change her ways, or even be offended for more than a day were she to learn of its existence? It pained Elizabeth to admit as much about her own mother, but mother had never allowed anyone or anything to stand between her and her purpose of seeing her daughters marry well. Like a horse with blinkers on, she would trudge through and tread over whatever obstacles awaited her, justified in her attention to her family, not unlike Lady Catherine. The day of the parade, we met together to introduce a new member to our society, Lady Catherine de Bourgh. I will admit that having such an esteemed person within our ranks gave a certain validity to our purpose. Did Lady Catherine present herself? asked Lord Havisham. William and Colonel Fitzwilliam sat on the edges of their chairs. I was told she did, 
However, she did not stay long. She departed before the parade. William and Colonel Fitzwilliam exchanged a look. Where had Lady Catherine gone? Elizabeth wished to know, too. You were not there to receive her, Lord Havisham asked. No, I arrived seconds before the parade began. Lady Lucas addressed the vicar. What exactly was the purpose of your society? Lady Lucas looked down at her hands, picking at the tassel on the throw over her legs. It seems so foolish now, and I deeply regret it. My intention in forming the Lamb Society was... She clipped her sentence short when Mr. Thorne raised his hand. Lamb Society? he asked. Ladies against Mrs. Bennet. Lady Lucas's face blushed, as well it should. Seriously, did it not occur to at least one woman in their little group to object to such a ridiculous name for an equally ridiculous club? Ah, said Mr. Thorne, looking as uncomfortable as Lady Lucas did on her admission. What was the purpose of your society? It was innocent, I assure you. I merely grew tired of bearing Mrs. Bennet's insults. I only wanted someone to talk to, someone who could empathize with me, and with whom I could seek and provide mutual comfort. Knowing the difficulties between Mrs. Burke and Mrs. Bennet, I brought the subject up with her. From there, she invited a few other ladies and some of the other business owners in the village. I had not intended for it to be anything so grand, but it grew of its own accord. Your wife, of course, refused to join our group, Mr. Thorne. Mr. Thorne seemed relieved to hear it. She continued. We gathered together once a week and aired our complaints against Mrs. Bennet over tea. Our intent was to comfort, not to cause harm. Lord Havisham said, Tell us what happened the day of Mrs. Bennet's murder. Lady Lucas closed her eyes and gripped Sir William's hand tightly. I was late in arriving to the meeting. When I arrived at the Burke's shop, the first person I saw was Mrs. Bennet. She seemed impatient. I asked if she was well, and she told me how she was seeing to the future of her daughters, and she needed to speak to Mrs. Burke immediately. Then she implied that I would not understand her haste, as I did not, apparently, share the same concern for my own daughters as she did for hers. She stopped, raising her free hand to cover her face. Her chin quivered. After some moments of silence, she continued. Mrs. Bennet walked toward the back of the shop, looking for Mrs. Burke. I do not know what possessed me, but I... I pushed her. She stumbled forward, her foot catching against something. I reached out to her, but I could not stop her fall. She released her husband burying her face in both of her hands. Elizabeth's heart ached, knowing now how those same hands dripping with tears had reached out against her mother. She felt Charlotte loop her arm around her shoulders, and she was quick to wrap her arm around Charlotte's waist. They stood together, holding each other up as Lady Lucas cried. She hit her head against one of the writing tables. It was so loud. I feared all the ladies would hear it and run out to see what I had done, but they did not. I waited for Mrs. Bennet to get up, but she did not stir. William asked, Why did you not seek help? Surely your friends would have believed it was an accident. I panicked. All I could think was that I had killed Mrs. Bennet. I left as quickly as I could. I stopped near the counter between the room where I knew the ladies were gathered and the door to the shop. By that moment, I wanted nothing to do with the club I had formed. I felt ill. I left the shop. And yet you returned. Why? asked William. My conscience and the vain hope Mrs. Bennet had regained consciousness. I wanted nothing more than to enter the shop find her standing, and beg her forgiveness. Instead, there was so much blood, and I knew, I knew what I had done. 
Looking directly at Elizabeth, she added, My sin is unforgivable. I am sorrier than I can begin to tell you. Chapter 25 Sir William, concerned with the health of his wife, begged for them to return at a later time for further questions. The gentleman, on observing Lady Lucas's state, readily agreed. He stayed with her while Charlotte walked down the stairs beside Colonel Fitzwilliam, her eyes trained so firmly forward it was obvious to Elizabeth that Charlotte wished to speak with the colonel. Would he pay any attention to the daughter of a murderess? Was Lady Lucas even guilty? By her own admission, she was. But there were small details missing, and Elizabeth was not satisfied. Or could it be that her friendship with the Lucases clouded her judgment? William fell in beside her, slowly descending the steps in silence. Everyone was in a pensive mood, and when Lord Havisham stopped at the bottom of the steps, they grouped around him. Our visit today has been quite disturbing. Allow us to convey you home in my carriage, Miss Elizabeth. I believe you will want to be with your family now. Mr. Bennet will want to be kept abreast of our findings as this investigation continues. Miss Lucas, thank you for your assistance. I will return this afternoon. Please assure your mother and father that no arrest will be made today, and to mention nothing of this to anyone else. There are certain matters which do not add up in my mind and require further study. With that, they left. William handed Elizabeth into the carriage, the colonel riding beside the coachman to allow more room for the occupants inside. The distance between Longbourn and Lucas Lodge was not great, but Elizabeth appreciated the time it afforded her to ask some questions of her own. Lord Havisham, you mentioned you have doubts regarding Lady Lucas's involvement in my mother's murder. If you please, what are they? The wound, he said simply. Both William and Mr. Thorne agreed, William adding, If she is responsible, which I also doubt, it does not explain why Lady Lucas seemed not to have seen any blood until she returned to the scene. I do not recall seeing blood on the tables, nor did Mrs. Burke mention cleaning it from her wares to sell. Mr. Thorne nodded. We would have heard about it had her goods been thus harmed. She would have added the cost of the damage to Mr. Bennet's bill. Lord Havisham said, I am tempted to return to the shop and have another look. Perhaps we will come upon a dent in one of the tables, and, with a little incentive, Mrs. Burke may be induced to recall more than what she has already told us. Elizabeth sighed. She wished she could go with them. However, her family needed her. She had told Mrs. Hill to put water on to fill the bath for father. He would need some convincing to leave his study, something which would not happen if she told father what she had recently learnt. Still... She would be unable to leave Longbourn soon. That was what she hated the most, being stuck, unable to be of any assistance where she would rather be involved, and having time to ponder. She dreaded having so much time with her thoughts. And then there was William. She was not ready to leave him yet. Elizabeth knew her strength. She knew she would manage well. However, with him, she felt up to any task. If she stumbled... He would catch her. William met her gaze with a sad smile, reminding her to be of courage. She readied herself to depart from the carriage. Longbourn was near. William said, I will call later to speak with Mr. Bennet. I see no harm in speaking freely of the facts before you, Elizabeth, but I do not want for you to feel obliged to repeat certain indelicate details to him unless you feel it best for him to hear of them from you. It was precisely what she needed to hear. He would come back. She would see him again. She would not have to tell father the ugly news just yet. Thank you. I believe father would prefer to hear the news from you. Lord Havisham asked, How is your father, Miss Elizabeth? Has he improved since I last saw him? I fear he has not. He and mother... She caught herself slowing her thoughts before she revealed the nature of her parents' relationship to a stranger, 
a kind stranger, but a stranger still. They did not always agree, but I do believe he misses her. I remember when my Maggie died. I felt lost without her, and it took a great deal of time to know what to do with myself with her gone. Your father is an intelligent man. He will soon find ways to occupy his mind and his time until the emptiness dulls and he can bear it. Elizabeth suspected her father's despondency stemmed more from disorientation than desperation, but she thanked Lord Havisham all the same. She liked to think she would be missed as Lord Havisham had missed his wife when her life ended. Would William miss her? After a lifetime together, would he notice her absence beyond a fortnight? The carriage jarred to a stop, and it was time to leave. William jumped out before the coachman could open the door and hand her out. She accepted his help, resting her hand atop his. A warm, melting sensation ran up her arm and spread through her body. Her fingers tingled where William pressed them in his hand. She managed to get out of the carriage without melting into a puddle at his feet. They stood thus until Colonel Fitzwilliam cleared his throat from the box above them. What a pest! William glared at him, but the spell had been broken. Pulling his fingers away, Elizabeth clasped hers together to hold on to his touch, pretending she only rubbed her hands together and shivered from the cold. Proceeding thus to the house, she turned back to see William still standing by the carriage door, ensuring she made it safely inside. Like a sentry. Jane came to her immediately, and, once Elizabeth was reassured Lydia and Kitty were not nearby to hear and propagate Lady Lucas's confession to all of Meriton, she gave her the details in a short time. Jane shook her head. I cannot believe it. Lady Lucas is tender-hearted and kind. Mother's comments were often thoughtless, but surely the jurors at the hearing will conclude it was simply a horrible accident. I wish it were as simple as that. Lady Lucas may not be sent to trial but she will have to admit before all of Meryton how she acted against Mother. It will humiliate her. Granted, if she reserved more malice toward Mother, she would deserve it, and I would not pity her as I do. Had Mother not tripped, I doubt Lady Lucas's push would have caused her to fall as hard as she did. I cannot believe she intended to do permanent harm. She said she reached up to break Mother's fall, a woman seeking to harm would not have attempted to help. The front door opened and a ball of curly fur raced across the door. Elizabeth heard Chloe's paws patting along the hall to scratch on Father's study door. Evidently she gained entry, for the scratching soon stopped. Lydia and Kitty followed closely behind, but Elizabeth overheard Lydia suggest they leave Chloe to cheer Father, and the steps creaked under them as they continued to their rooms, chattering about their visit to Aunt Phillips. Did you notice Lydia is wearing mauve instead of black? Having a puppy to care for has brought a positive change to her. Perhaps she is right, and Chloe will give Papa some cheer, Jane said in a low tone, even though nobody was around to hear them. Has he left his study today? asked Elizabeth. Jane sighed. Mrs. Hill has had Cook busy heating water, but you know how much time that takes. I suspect she will emerge from the kitchen at any moment. Several growls and scuffles proceeded from the study, and seconds later, Chloe ran into the drawing room with her prize. She looked over her shoulder as if making certain she had not been followed, then plunked down on the rug in front of the fireplace to chew on one of Father's slippers contentedly. Father peeked into the room, spotting his prey. You mangy cur. First my shoe, and now my slipper. Chloe looked up, sniffed, then returned to her all-important task of gnawing a hole in Father's slipper. She did not flinch when he stood over her, only growling and engaging in a game of tug-of-war when he reached down to retrieve the stolen item. Eventually Father won, but Chloe had left her mark. His toe poked out at the front of his slipper, 
and he lifted his hands before him in disgust at the drool covering them and his foot. Infernal pest, father grumbled. Watching the struggle between the elderly man, superior in size to the little ball of fluff, who clearly had a quarrel with father's shoes and had determined to destroy them, tickled Elizabeth's fancy. She clamped her lips shut, but when a chuckle escaped Jane, Elizabeth could contain her merriment no longer. She expected father to leave the room without a word, but he did not. He sat in the chair beside the puppy, took off his slipper, and handed it back to the little pilferer. If it brings you joy, far be it for me to keep it from you, he said, stroking her between the ears and smoothing her ruffled fur. Stunned into silence, Elizabeth watched as he pet the animal he had cursed only seconds before. Chloe abandoned the slipper and attempted repeatedly to jump into his lap until father finally scooped her up. She snuggled into his chest and licked his chin. Elizabeth would not bring up anything to provoke his sadness, but she must warn him to prepare himself for a caller later that afternoon. Father, Mr. Darcy wishes to call on you today. A bath is being readied, so you will be prepared to receive him. He patted Chloe absently, only looking down at her when she demanded his attention. I miss her, you know. His voice sounded gravelly from lack of use. You miss mother? Jane asked, prompting him to continue. Father's chin quivered. I was not a good husband to her, nor have I been a good father to my girls. She had her faults, as do we all. But no one could ever say Mrs. Bennet was not attentive. Now that she is not here, I feel her absence deeply. Do not say you have not been a good father, started Elizabeth. He interrupted. Why not? It is true. I have neglected my family's estate. I have not managed our affairs to our advantage merely out of spite for a cousin I despise. I must admit... I find Mr. Collins barely tolerable, but he does try to help in his own ridiculous way. Elizabeth looked at Jane. She had forgotten about Mr. Collins. Seeing her confusion, father answered. Once he determined I did not need, or particularly want, his company, he departed for Netherfield Park to call on his esteemed patroness, Lady Catherine de Bourgh. Jane shivered. She scares me. I would much rather befriend Mr. Bingley's pernicious sisters than a dragon who would sooner swallow me whole than allow me a measure of happiness. Jane! Elizabeth exclaimed. Father clapped. You have no idea how comforting it is to hear my conflict-averse eldest daughter speak plainly and intelligently. Now that I am convinced you are not foolishly ignorant of Mrs. Hurst and Miss Bingley's attitudes, you may have my full blessing to marry their brother. Mr. Bingley will be happy to gain a wife with a strong mind, though it be coated with soft velvet. Jane froze, moving her hands from her skirt to her hair and back. Father chuckled. Do not suffer on my account. I have spent the past few days pondering many things. A blind man could have seen the signs. How long have you been engaged? Elizabeth gasped. Jane had said nothing to her. Jane reached for her hand. Don't be angry with me, please. I cannot bear it. She smiled sweetly, clasping her free hand to her heart. With such delightful news, it did not occur to me to be offended. Jane, why have you kept silent? How is it just that I should feel so happy when tragedy has befallen us? It makes me feel guilty, even though I know Mother would have rejoiced to know Charles had asked me to marry him. We chose not to announce our engagement when Mother... He asked you the day of the parade, Elizabeth asked. Talk about poor timing. Oh, Poor, poor Jane. 
Jane, said father, if you think setting aside your happy future will in some way lessen my suffering, I beg you to reconsider. I am determined to do better by my responsibilities, as Mrs. Bennet would have wished. Mr. Bingley is a kind man, and he will treat you well. But we are in mourning, Jane said weakly. Since when do we allow society's expectations to dictate our behavior? I will thumb my nose at any individual while openly proclaiming them to be the worst sort of fool for insisting on prolonging our sadness when life is meant to be lived and enjoyed. You do not know what tomorrow will bring, and I wish you joy. Every day you are given the gift to continue on this earth. Jane sprang from her chair, embracing father and showering his face with kisses. Chloe wiggled between them, intent on receiving more attention than Jane from father. As only Jane would do, she apologized at appearing too happy when her dearest sister was, as yet, admittedly not as joyous as she was. Elizabeth's wit restored to her, along with her humor at seeing father return to his senses and much improved, she said with a saucy grin, Do not worry about me. I'm not afraid of dragons. Father laughed. That is my girl. Now I had best see if my bath is ready. I do not know how you have managed to live here without pinching your noses with clothes pegs. But I thank you for your patience and will assault your senses no further. He set Chloe on the floor. You little pest, must have a broken nose. Go find your mistress. He stood by the door and waited for the puppy to leave the room before he went in search of a warm tub of water and soap. He would be well. Jane would be well. Kitty, Lydia, and Mary would be well. Everyone would be well, no matter the trials and tribulations they might experience. Life had a way of continuing on, lessening the pain as the days passed, and even offering small gifts to entice a smile. Happiness always prevailed, and Elizabeth would pursue hers. Chapter 26 Darcy accompanied Richard and Lord Havisham back to the haberdashery. Neither of the Burks could remember anything they had not already mentioned, much to their chagrin when there were more coins to gain in the telling. They asked Mr. Burke if the tables were arranged in the same manner as they had been before the murder, and they examined all the edges of the furniture for evidence of a fall. This one here would have stopped her fall. I moved the inkwells over to a shelf, but there were three on the table, Mr. Burke offered, greedily helpful to provide any information for which he might see a reward. Solid English oak, sighed Lord Havisham, knocking his knuckles against the surface. You did not notice any blood when you polished the table? No, nor have we found the missing inkwell. Richard walked over to the window, peering out of the glass. I see Tanner. Shall we call him in to see if he has met with greater success than we have? Darcy cleared his throat to prevent a chuckle. He really should not laugh when Tanner had been given the thankless job of searching through every bush, bucket, and body of water for an inkwell the size of his fist. Call for him, said Lord Havisham, with a twinkle in his eye. Minutes later, Richard returned to the shop, followed by a surly, grumbling constable. Tanner's trousers clung to his legs and his boots bore evidence of having been hastily scraped of mud. Darcy looked away to compose himself. Richard grinned beside Tanner, as comfortable and warm in his dry clothes as Darcy was. Lord Havisham said dryly, Good afternoon, Tanner. You look damp. With a glower, Tanner crossed his massive arms. Thanks to the pointless task you have assigned to me, how in heaven... Am I supposed to find one inkwell when we have no indication to its whereabouts? It could be hidden inside someone's home, for all we know, and have nothing to do with Mrs. Bennet's murder, as if I have nothing else to do. He looked in the direction of his inn. A snicker escaped Darcy. 
drawing Tanner's glare to fix on him. I, you may laugh. You do not have to beat through every bush or search through every pond and mud puddle. If you want to join me in the search on the morrow, I would like to see you laugh then. Lord Havisham moved forward, patting Tanner on the shoulder. I appreciate your thoroughness, Mr. Tanner. I am confident a certain lady will also be grateful when it is found as well. Mr. Burke, assuming the Earl spoke of his own wife, said, It is true. Mrs. Burke has been most anxious about the missing item. Most of the residents of Meryton are honourable, and we have not had many incidents of thievery in our shop. Nobody corrected him. They would not spread the news of Lady Lucas's confession until it could not be helped. Tanner knew it too. Lowering his head and bunching his cheeks in stubborn resignation, he said, I will begin at first light on the morrow. I only came back when I did to help Mrs. Marley receive the passengers from the afternoon coach. She's been doing much more than her fair share of the work lately. Darcy looked at his tired, damp, elder brother and was moved to offer. I will search the Netherfield property with what daylight remains of today and first light tomorrow. I only have one brief call to make before I may begin. Tanner heaved a sigh. I am much obliged. Richard, too, added, I have a special interest in this search. Tell me where you have yet to look and I will go. Uncrossing his arms, Tanner relaxed his shoulders. Is there anything else I need to know? Any new developments? Darcy looked at Lord Havisham, who shook his head and said, No, we can manage for now while you warm yourself by the fire. Mrs. Molly will be glad to see you. It made Darcy proud to see how seriously Tanner took his responsibilities, but it was clearly time for his brother to rest. Darcy and Richard would pick up the slack while Lord Havisham spoke with the villagers in their search for the truth. Tanner bowed his leave, once again ensuring he was no longer needed before departing. He stepped to the side on reaching the door to allow passage to Mr. Thorne. Tanner, who had not attended services in years, moved past him gingerly, crossing the square in long strides to distance himself from the vicar. The heathen. Mr. Thorne, how good to see you, greeted Mr. Burke, quick to attend a potential customer. Good afternoon, gentlemen, said Mr. Thorne. Is all well? The truth will soon set us free from our conundrum, dear sir, replied Lord Havisham. What brings you here? The vicar blushed, looking down at the floor with a pleased smile on his face. Mrs. Thorne reminded me of an important event in our history together when she recently presented me with the token of her affection to celebrate the day we married. I thank the Lord in heaven every day for blessing me with such a righteous, caring woman for a wife. Congratulations! How many years of wedded bliss are you celebrating? Lord Havisham clapped the vicar on the back vigorously. Ten years. What sort of gift is appropriate for that amount of time? I had hoped to seek out Mrs. Burke's counsel, but I would appreciate your opinion as well. Mr. Thorne looked at Lord Havisham. Darcy caught Richard's eye. It was time for them to depart. There was nothing else to be found in the haberdashery, and they had an inkwell to find. Had Tanner not looked so miserable, Darcy would have regretted his offer. Bingley had three small lakes on his property, Darcy would ask a few trusted servants who would require no explanation to help him, but he would have to do most of the dirty work. It would be a long evening. Taking their leave, they rode to Longbourn, where Mr. Bennet received them in his study in good spirits. Darcy caught a glance of Elizabeth and was gifted with a smile, which he would remember with each squishy step in the mud during his search for the inkwell. Departing from Longbourn, they galloped to Netherfield Park, where Bingley's butler greeted Darcy with a message. It was from Mr. Hammond, a notable doctor in London. When did this arrive? Darcy asked. 
waiting to break the wax seal until he could read the letter in private. It was delivered by messenger a quarter of an hour ago. Thank you. Darcy signalled for Richard to follow him to Bingley's library. He had grown rather fond of that room. It held many pleasant memories, and Darcy needed something good surrounding him before reading what the doctor had to say regarding his inquiries. Closing the door behind them, Richard asked, Is it about Anne? Cracking the seal, Darcy examined the tight, neat handwriting covering the page. If the doctor was as efficient in his practice as he was with his letters, he would do well. Darcy read quickly, then handed it to Richard while he organised the new information and its consequences in his mind. Dropping his hand to his side, Richard said, There is hope. This is good news. Darcy was inclined to think so. We only have to convince Aunt Catherine of it. Richard's contented expression faded. She will not approve. She is too much a creature of habit to agree to what he suggests. And yet we must convince her. If Anne is to have any future, we must be persuasive and pray the doctor's optimism is justified in her case. There was no time to lose. Sending for Lawrence, for they could delay no more in this search for the missing inkwell either, Darcy asked for him to assemble a few of the most trustworthy servants at Netherfield Park and begin the search. He would join them as soon as he had seen to Aunt Catherine. The cold water of the lakes would cool him after what was sure to be a heated confrontation. To Richard, who shuffled his weight from one side to the other in anxiety, Darcy suggested, Perhaps your energy is best spent assisting Miss Lucas's family. Thank you, Darcy. Are you certain you do not need me? I hate to leave a man behind when he must face the enemy. She is not so much the enemy as she appears to be. I have had my man busy making inquiries since Aunt's horrible display at Longbourn. If what his man said was true, and Darcy had no reason to doubt him, he had never erred before, then Aunt Catherine's desperation was understandable, albeit dramatic. What did he find? asked Richard. Allow me to speak with her first, and I will tell you everything I know. Very well, I will return when the darkness prevents any further searching. Returning the letter to Darcy, Richard marched out of the library. Darcy read the letter again, taking confidence from Mr. Hammond's words. It would be a drastic change, but if it helped Anne, it would be worth the effort. His words suggested freedom for Anne and for Darcy. On inquiring, Darcy found Aunt Catherine and Anne in the music room. They were alone, Miss Bingley having been cut to the core from Aunt Catherine's comments against her and choosing to avoid any further humiliations. Anne held a book, her finger skimming over the pages she read. Aunt Catherine stared blankly at the piano, as if she heard the ghost of music past. Darcy crinkled the paper in his hand and cleared his throat so as not to startle them as he stepped across the carpeted floor. Anne looked up and smiled weakly, casting a worried glance at her mother. How is the day treating you, Darcy? You appear to have the weight of the world on your shoulders. She always had been too insightful. Darcy had thought he carried his burdens better than she implied. He straightened his shoulders and lifted his chin. There have been some advances in the case. It would appear you are no longer under suspicion. He would say nothing of Lady Lucas but neither would he allow his aunt to believe she might be found guilty. He would never insist she reveal her secret publicly when she had kept it from her family and closest friends for the better part of a year. Aunt huffed. I should never have been under suspicion in the first place. Mother, Anne reprimanded, you insulted a lady and threatened her in her own home. Of course you were under suspicion. Do not agitate yourself, Anne, warned Aunt Catherine. Anne's eyes roved around the room. I feel strong today, 
I only have these episodes when I'm overly tired. In fact, I feel well enough to attend services on the morrow. I am eager to see the people you've told me of in person. I would rather you not. Before they could forget he was in the room, Darcy held up the letter. I received a reply. A doctor who is in charge of a sanatorium ascertained the nature of my inquiry, and he writes with encouragement. He even relates a successful case similar to your own, by way of comparison. A doctor who can treat patients like me? You are certain it is not a lunatic asylum. You are certain you penned your inquiry in such a way so as not to imply my condition too directly? It had taken every ounce of Darcy's intelligence to structure his inquiry in such a way as to suggest at the falling sickness, without committing to it, should the doctor prove to uphold the common views most held. That the doctor was able to reply in an equally misleading manner, without the fear of misunderstanding, was a testament to his intellect. I am certain. I only sent my inquiry based on the excellent reputation the doctor has earned in our circles. Richard can attest to it as well. He read my letter before I sent it, as well as this reply. Aunt Catherine held out her hand, waving it in the air impatiently. Let me see. Darcy handed it to her. She turned the pages over, her pale face colouring when she saw the name. Ripping the paper in half, she proceeded to shred them while Darcy looked on in astonishment. He did not stop her, for there was nothing in the letter he had not already committed to memory. But the violence with which she shredded the paper captivated his attention as much as it did Anne. Mother, she exclaimed, measure your breaths, Anne. Do not agitate yourself. Aunt Catherine, not content to have shredded the letter to bits, thrust the tiny pieces into the fire. What had she seen to cause such a reaction? It had to have been the name. She had seen nothing more. You know, Mr. Hammond? Darcy asked. How dare you! Aunt Catherine stood before him, stretching to her full height, so that the feather in her turban towered over Darcy. Her refusal to be forthright was growing tiresome. Explain yourself, aunt. What objection do you have to Mr. Hammond? She stepped forward, and he swatted the assaulting feather away. Her complexion reddened. Do not say that name in my presence. I would sooner die than have a Hammond assist my daughter. Now that made him angry. You would deny Anne a future to satisfy your foolish pride? She clamped her mouth shut and lifted her chin, standing as firmly as an unyielding statue. Hammond is the doctor's name? Anne asked quietly, her jaw mulling from side to side and her eyes narrowing. I have heard that name. Aunt Catherine turned on her. That name is nothing to us. We will have nothing to do with it. Anne's bright eyes loomed wide against her pallid skin. If he can help me, then I will go so far as to act against your wishes, Mama. Now that my secret is known by my cousins, I trust them to convey me to London to Mr. Hammond as soon as the hearing is done and we are free to depart. You would not dare. Anne rose. You have been ill for months. I have been sick for a lifetime. I have hidden away and followed the treatments given to me by our trusted family doctor, whose ways are so antiquated as to belong in a museum. He has drained enough blood for me to give life to another person. And if I have to look at another leech, I shall scream in frustration. No, mother, it is time I took my life in my own hands. On Monday, after the hearing, I will go to London in search of the doctor. You may come with me, but I will go regardless. Darcy wanted to applaud Anne's bravery. Aunt Catherine did not, or more probably could not, say anything until Anne left the room. Her bold speech had exhausted her. Stabbing his cravat with a pointy fingernail, Aunt Catherine said, 
I blame you for this, and has never dared defy me before. Her refusal to accept a solution other than her own filled Darcy with pity. Perhaps then it was time. He left her standing by the fire, sending for Mrs. Jenkinson so Aunt would not be alone, while he joined the servants outside to search for a missing piece of the puzzle in Mrs. Bennet's murder. Chapter 27 Elizabeth let her vision wander, the vicar's sermon fading to unintelligible babble in her ears, to where Lady Catherine sat with her daughter, Miss de Bourgh. At first sight, Elizabeth felt Mr. Collins's comments on Miss de Bourgh's appearance highly unjustified. Elizabeth saw nothing aristocratic nor extraordinary about the lady. Such catty thoughts passed quickly through and just as swiftly out of Elizabeth's mind, dismissed completely when she remembered how perilously that lady's life hung in the balance. She could no more resent her for her mother's attempts to conceal her realness than to blame her for falling ill. Kitty reached over and squeezed her hand, drawing Elizabeth's attention away from Mr. Berg and to the vicar. He would read the bands soon. Elizabeth squeezed Kitty's hand in turn and smiled at her father. The transition from doom and gloom in Mr. Thorne's sermon to the happy news of a hopeful couple soon to marry was a welcome change. Elizabeth heard a collective sigh from the parishioners gathered. Elizabeth kept one eye on the vicar as he read Kitty's full name aloud, and her other eye on Lady Catherine. She would not put it past the lady to object, just to give the family trouble. The vicar paused, looking around his congregated flock for exaggerated seconds. Seriously, did he want someone to oppose? Elizabeth felt Lady Catherine's glare on her person, and she returned it in full force. If she distracted the lady long enough, it would be too late for her to make a scene. William must have had the same idea. Elizabeth noticed how he arranged to sit beside his aunt. His shoulder covered hers, though there was enough room for them to sit comfortably. If she meant to rise, she would have to shove him to the side to do so. What a fine man! The vicar continued speaking, and Elizabeth let out a rush of breath. William's lips twitched at the sides. He shared in her relief. They rose from their smooth wood bench and went outside where the sun had blessed them with an appearance. Mr. Collins, as was to be expected, lingered inside. It had been comical to watch him before the services had begun, tottering between Lady Catherine and his own family, until Father insisted he sit beside him. Now Mr. Collins rushed to his patroness's side, only to be brushed off like an annoying piece of lint. Mary, who had made her way to Mrs. Thorne, was deep in conversation with her and Aunt Phillips, but she took pity on Mr. Collins and invited him to join them. Kitty would wander away with Mr. Denny, delaying their departure for Longbourn in the carriage. Mr. Bingley did not hesitate to draw near to Jane and Father. They stood to the side of the church, enjoying the blessings of nature along with each other's company. And Lydia? She had been offended when Father refused to allow her to sneak Chloe inside the church. She had only quit pouting when Father suggested the dog remain in the carriage for them. Elizabeth saw the coachman walk with a rope attached to the ribbon adorning Chloe's neck, handing it over to Lydia when she approached. No doubt, the carriage cushions suffered less damage thanks to his thoughtfulness. Miss Elizabeth, a cold voice snapped behind her. Elizabeth's shoulders rose of their own accord, but she pressed them down before she turned to face Lady Catherine. Lady Catherine, she acknowledged. Miss de Bourgh came up from behind her mother, wrapping her arm through hers. There is a lovely grove of trees a short walk up the lane. Please, let us walk to the shade and you may introduce us. Smart move, Miss de Bourgh. Either she wished for her mother not to cause a scene in public, or she did not wish for witnesses to observe as she just joined her mother in an assault against Elizabeth. 
The last one was unlikely, given the sickly aspect of Mr. Berg. But Elizabeth made sure to keep both ladies in her line of vision and herself out of the reach of Lady Catherine's cane, so as to avoid any surprises. She stood with her back to the road in case she should need to depart in a hurry. Lady Catherine introduced Elizabeth to her daughter when Mr. Berg reminded her of it once again, and then she extracted her claws. You seem to be failing in memory, or perhaps your hearing prevented you from fully comprehending what we discussed when our paths last crossed. I insist you leave Darcy to honour the promise he made to Anne. I have no more influence over Mr. Darcy's actions than you, your ladyship, Elizabeth snapped back. Mr. Berg paled, and Elizabeth reprimanded herself. She must do what she could to remain calm, though she dearly wished to provoke. Pushing her desires aside, she added, Lady Catherine, I have no intention of coming between Mr. Darcy and a promise he has made. He would lose my respect were he to act dishonorably. Please believe me when I say I also hold Mr. Berg's interest in high regard. You regard the needs of my daughter, a stranger to you, Lady Catherine scoffed. Mr. Berg held her finger up to her lips, but Elizabeth would not be silenced when she meant to smooth ruffled feathers. Yes, I will not presume to speak for Mr. Darcy, but I may speak for myself with confidence. My future husband's family will become my family. I will protect their interests as certainly as I protect my father and sisters. Except for those with whom you do not get along, scoffed Lady Catherine. That was too much. Elizabeth planted her hands on her hips. Do you really think it possible for one to always get along with her sisters? It is neither practical nor reasonable to believe families should agree about everything and never suffer differences. Yet I love them anyway. Lady Catherine huffed, her stiff posture and accusatory glare proclaiming her unmoved. As Elizabeth looked at Lady Catherine, her heart filled with sadness at the similarities between the lofty lady and her own mother. Both of them were set on seeing to the futures of their daughters, even pushing aside decorum and decency to see to their interests. Elizabeth could see with Mr. Berg's frown that her life was more often troubled by her mother's interference, just as hers had been so many times by her own mother. The similarities between their families struck Elizabeth's sense of irony, and she knew from that moment that Lady Catherine held no power over her. Thanks to her own mother, who had given her a lifetime of experience in managing contrary purposes and manipulative schemes, Elizabeth felt confident she would manage Lady Catherine well enough. You would soon grow weary of caring for a sickly relative, Lady Catherine flung out. I will not deny the difficulties of the responsibility. However, I can guarantee that relative, whomever she may be, would never feel neglected by me. She would never be lonely so long as she is willing to accept my company and probably that of my sister's. Elizabeth could not resist leaving Lady Catherine with that final horrifying thought. Just imagine Lydia locked in a room with Lady Catherine. Mr. Berg smiled at her. Come, mother, I am fatigued and must return to Netherfield Park. If all goes well, we have a busy day of travel on the morrow. Elizabeth turned, and her vision settled on the very man who most invaded her thoughts. Not that she minded. He was rather handsome to ponder, especially when he smiled at her as he did then. Darcy had meant to disrupt the conversation between his aunt and Elizabeth, but Anne had signalled for him to be quiet. He had stood at a distance, listening as the woman he would marry stood her ground before his aunt. Aunt, not having seen the evidence of Elizabeth's protective instincts toward those whom she held dear, looked at her disbelievingly. So intent was Aunt fixed on Elizabeth, she had not noticed him. And now Elizabeth smiled at him, a picture of joy and tranquility. 
How she managed to keep her cheer in the midst of turmoil was a quality he would always admire and seek to emulate. She did not hold on to bitterness or resentment as he did. Thank you, he said, not bothering to pretend he had not overheard her conversation. Mr. Burke is lovely. I will admit I had already judged her in my mind as weak and lacking character. She shook her head and rolled her eyes. I must stop doing that. Darcy laughed. If judging prematurely is your biggest fault, I will learn to live with it. Her smile returned. He loved how the corners of her lips curled up, reaching her eyes and filling them with merriment, like dancing stars. I am pleased to know that, with all the trouble I have caused you since our meeting. She paused, twisting her fingers. I would still have wished to know you, to be your friend. And so much more, but now was not the time for declarations. What he could do was offer her the security of his affection when everything else in her world swirled in unstable chaos. She met his gaze, and her expression conveyed so much raw emotion. He wanted to pull her into his arms and hold her until her worries disappeared. Our families seem intent on interfering, even with Mother gone. Her voice dropped to a whisper. Your aunt is remarkably similar to her, and while I do not know Mr. Berg well, I suspect she is similar enough to Jane that we shall become close friends. Darcy's chest tightened. Elizabeth already considered his family part of hers. Surely she had made a favourable decision regarding him. She would never encourage him otherwise. Reluctantly pulling his head out of the clouds, Darcy reminded himself to be patient. While he was confident he had found a home in her heart, as she forever had in his, there was still the matter of her mother and his aunt to consider. Maybe it was selfish of him, but he wanted Elizabeth's complete heart, free of distractions and disturbance. He did not want to look away from her, but he needed to ensure no one was close enough to overhear what he had to tell her. There is something you should know about my Aunt Catherine. The reason she insists on an imagined engagement despite all attempts to reason with her. Elizabeth's eyebrows furled and her dark eyelashes lowered, instinctively knowing he bore more bad news. It made the telling infinitely more difficult. It was not supposed to work this way. He was supposed to alleviate her burdens, not add to them. What is it? she asked, bravely bracing herself to bear his news. She is desperate to see Anne settled, because she fears that, soon, my cousin will find herself alone and without a protector. Elizabeth raised her hand to her mouth. She is dying? She is convinced she is dying. Whether it is true or not is another matter. I received word from her personal physician, and he is under the impression... She is only recently undergoing a change most women experience at a slightly younger age. Elizabeth's eyebrows rose. Does she fan her flushed face when everyone else in the room is chilled? How did she know? That was one of the symptoms her physician mentioned. She wakes at night covered in sweat? Yes, he answered in wonder. Elizabeth rolled her eyes and sighed. She will live. However, I would not put it past her to use this against you to get what she wants. What has been done to restore Lady Catherine's confidence that her daughter will not be abandoned? She looked at him expectantly. Her certainty filled Darcy with a different sort of pride. The sort of pride which would see he never disappointed her. Do not look at me like that, William. I know you well enough to trust you already have several options as beneficial and practical as is possible for Mr. Berg. 
only Elizabeth Bennet would look frustrated at him for carrying out his responsibilities to the best of his abilities. He ought not goad her, but he could not resist the opportunity presented to him. I have seen to it, he said, grinning despite his efforts not to. She crossed her arms, trying to look vexed when she clearly was not. Smiles suit Miss Elizabeth, do they not, Mr. Darcy? asked Mrs. Thorne, interrupting their pleasant conversation. He mumbled an appropriate response, hoping the vicar's wife would take his hint and leave. Please excuse me for interrupting, but I wanted to let Miss Elizabeth know I will take Mr. Collins off her hands this afternoon. Mrs. Hill sent a loaf of her delicious gingerbread. And who better to share it with than a fellow clergyman? Please be so kind as to thank Mrs. Hill for her gift. Elizabeth smiled. Mrs. Hill is as thoughtful as you have been kind to us. Thank you, Mrs. Thorne. In a lower tone, she added, Father will be delighted to have a brief reprieve. Mrs. Thorne chuckled. I imagine so, Miss Elizabeth. Let us show ourselves merry in the day of our Lord, for tomorrow will bring its own troubles. With that, she left their company for Mr. Collins. She is right about the morrow. Has nothing else been discovered? Elizabeth asked. Not as yet. We have scoured the countryside for any piece of evidence which might prevent Lady Lucas from confessing before all of Meriton. If only we knew who the real culprit was, there would be no need for her to ruin her family. You do not believe her guilty? No. Elizabeth clutched her hand over her heart. I am glad to hear it. Lady Lucas acted on foolish impulse, but she is not a murderess. The injury Mother suffered was not caused from a simple fall. Someone hit her with the intent to kill. Tears pooled in her eyes. Resolve set fire to Darcy's veins. We will learn the truth. I will see to it. Chapter 28 Darcy did not take promises lightly. While the rest of his party returned to Netherfield Park to languish in their leisure for the remainder of their Sunday, he found his way to Tanner's Inn, where Lord Havisham requested they meet to discuss evidence before the hearing on the morrow. Ah, Darcy, there you are, Richard interrupted his pacing before the fireplace to meet him at the door. I hope I did not keep you waiting long, Darcy apologised. Tanner came out from behind the bar, bringing an inkwell, quills and a sheet of vellum with him. He sneered at Richard as he passed them to the table where Lord Havisham sat. Richard has taken a special interest in this case of late. I wonder why that is. Richard turned to face Tanner. What of it? Anyone may know my regard for Miss Lucas. I am not ashamed of it. She, like any other female, clouds your judgment. Why else would a reasonably sane man, such as yourself, trudge around in the mud in the vain search for an inkwell, which may not even prove to be the actual murder weapon? Tanner fired back. Darcy, who had spent a solid couple of hours doing the exact same thing as Richard, placed himself between the two at the table. You speak as if you have not been doing the same. Now we have no time to waste. The hearing is hours away and we have yet to catch the murderer. Something we must do, or let two good families be torn to shreds in undeserved guilt and blame. The hair on Darcy's arms stood on end at the thought of Lady Lucas standing before her neighbours to receive their judgment. Elizabeth would lose her best friend. She had lost enough already. Richard would be unable to propose to the woman to whom he would give his affection and devote the rest of his life, an injustice completely undeserved by two such individuals so perfectly suited to each other as Richard and Miss Lucas. The injustice that two families Darcy respected could be so adversely affected by what could, at worst, be termed a dreadful accident, left a bitter taste in his mouth one he would have to live with the rest of his days 
unless he found a way to prevent it. Tanner grunted, having nothing better to say. Gracious, he was becoming a surlier brute than he had previously been before making peace with Darcy. Still, he had done more than his fair share of trudging through the mud, searching for an item which might have been used against Miss Bennet. Darcy would be patient with him. Lord Havisham pressed his chin against his chest, rubbing his whiskers. I agree. The consequences of Lady Lucas's admission to her family, as well as to the Bennets, are not worth the risk unless we find her guilty of the crime. While Lady Lucas admittedly acted against Mrs. Bennet, the nature of the injuries inflicted on the deceased does not prove Lady Lucas to be the murderess. Someone had to have come behind her to strike Mrs. Bennet's forehead with considerable force. Otherwise, we would have found blood on the furniture. While I am unconvinced of the importance of the missing inkwell, it is our only promising clue. If only we could find it, said Tanner, lacing his hands behind his head and squeezing the back of his neck. It could be anywhere, as could our killer. How do we even know the one responsible is still nearby? In listening to endless accounts of Mrs. Bennet's character, what has impressed me the most is the villager's dogged determination to endure her for the sake of her family. Mrs. Bennet was the sort of woman to provoke animosity in others, ignorant of having done so. Could it be that after years of festering malice, a person claiming to be her friend took action? when the opportunity to end the life of a thorn in their side presented itself, said Lord Havisham. Do you suggest the killer is a woman? Darcy asked. The wound, profound as it was, gave more credibility to a man having done it. A woman in a passion is capable of greater strength than you suppose. We must not make assumptions, lest we miss a vital piece of information. At this point, I will consider anything a possibility. What do you think of Mr. Burke? asked Darcy. What is your theory? Lord Havisham dipped the quill in the ink, posing it above the paper. He departed for a short time from the back room, according to the men who helped him unload the cart, and he is in the best position to hide evidence. Tanner added, or fabricated it, to send us all over Hertfordshire in search of an inkwell someone probably pinched. Lord Havisham looked up from his notes. It is possible, and of everyone I listen to, the most probable. But what was his motive? He had difficulties extracting money from Mrs. Bennet or her husband, but even Mr. Burke admitted they always paid. What benefit does he gain in killing a paying customer? It did not make sense, but not much about Mrs. Bennet had to make sense to Darcy. There was no sense to be found in her murder, either. The quill scratched across the paper as Lord Havisham continued to write. I suggest we open the hearing with Mr. Burke's testimony, the murder having taken place in his shop. We will hope he reveals something noteworthy. What of the other ladies in the shop at the time? If we are searching for a motive, they had it, suggested Richard. Tanner smacked his hand against the table, the thud against the wood sounding as hollow as the testimony from those foolish ladies. They had reason to dislike, even hate, Mrs. Bennet but unless they are extremely loyal to each other and have formed another secret pact where they are willing to lie and obstruct justice for each other, which I doubt, given Lady Lucas's confession, they all agreed they were in Mrs. Burke's parlour together, excepting Lady Lucas and Lady Catherine, of course, who departed early. Aunt Catherine was another one in need of protection. To have her secret revealed in public would devastate her. I convinced her maid to tell me where she went after departing from the Burks. Apparently, she asked to be let out of the back door of the shop when she saw how crowded the walkways were in front of the shop. She suffered from a rush of heat to the face, which she did not wish observed, 
and she stood in the alley behind the Burks until it passed, said Darcy, praying no further explanation would be required. That is all? asked Tanner. Richard threw his arms up in the air. Why would she not admit it? Was she merely trying to be difficult? It is odd, but it gives her an alibi. I imagine her maid would lose her position if it were revealed. Lord Havisham laid the quill down and chuckled. Finally, addressing Darcy, he said, We will do our best not to drag her into this mess. There is no need to endanger the reputation of another lady. Above all, a lady who possesses little else to bring her pleasure. Thank you, Darcy said. Lord Havisham's grace impressed him deeply. He had the perfect opportunity to revenge himself against his foe and gave it no consideration. Lord Havisham shifted his weight in his chair. I received a letter from my son recently. He inquired about your aunt and your cousin. Panic shivered through Darcy. He tried to remember what Lord Havisham's family's surname was, but he could not recall it. Then again, there had been nothing normal about their introduction. What is his name? Henry Hammond, Lord Havisham enunciated. Aunt Catherine's exaggerated reaction now held meaning. Your son is the doctor I have been corresponding with in London. What did he tell you? Darcy did not want to doubt the elderly gentleman, but life experience had taught him to be cautious. I am aware of the activities of my son, Mr. Darcy. Lord Havisham looked at him levelly, and Darcy understood his family's secret to be safe. He knew of my history with Cathy, and given the lady's reputation, he felt it best to inquire of me about any family traits which might be relevant to Mr. Berg's case. He asked the same of me explaining how an understanding of the family's health enables him to see certain tendencies which might affect his patients, Darcy said. Mr. Hammond was an insightful doctor if he knew he would get no such information from Aunt Catherine. However, as knowledgeable as he may be, a more important question remained. Darcy asked, Do you believe him capable of helping my cousin? If Mr. Berg can be helped, he will help her. Darcy grasped on tightly to Lord Havisham's reassurance. Only time would tell if there was hope for Anne, but right now he could afford no distractions. Elizabeth depended on him. Well, that was not entirely true, but he wanted to believe she needed him as much as he needed her. What he was absolutely certain of was that they both needed answers and he would not disappoint her. Chapter 29 Elizabeth looked out of the window in Father's study. The night sky was clear and resplendent with sparkling stars. There was a bite in the air and Elizabeth was grateful for the warmth of the fireplace and the lingering aroma of Mrs. Hill's gingerbread. Father looked up from his book with a chuckle. It was the political satire William had given him. Your Mr. Darcy has exceptional taste in literature, Lizzie. Her Mr. Darcy. A blush crept up her neck and burned her cheeks. Try as she might to contain her smile, she could not... She liked the sound of that, her Mr. Darcy. He has described his library at Pemberley to me in so much detail. I can imagine myself there already. Oh, had I known that, I would have insisted he marry you directly. I have been much too permissive with my girls. Any other father would have demanded he propose once you were freed from Mr. Bingley's library. Father peeked over his spectacles at her, grinning impishly. There is some truth in that, but most fathers do not concern themselves with the feelings of their daughters when she could marry into a fortune. Forget that. It is his library I am interested in. 
said father, filling his study with their laughter. It was good to hear him laugh in earnest, to have evidence of his restored amusement. With all the trouble we have caused Mr. Darcy, he may never ask me. She chewed on the corner of her lip. Nonsense, father fired back as quickly as she had hoped he would. She needed reasons. Her heart was too involved to see anything clearly. Every word, every gesture and action held multiple meanings, and her judgment was clouded by her own contrary emotions. Why do you say so, Papa? Mr. Darcy is under no obligation to assist us. And yet, he has gone out of his way to see justice done for uh, my dear wife. He took off his spectacles to wipe his eyes. Elizabeth had never heard him refer to Mother as anything but Mrs. Bennet. His use of an endearment had Elizabeth dabbing at her eyes, too. His voice shook, but he continued growing stronger as he did. I was in no position to hire investigators and bring in a magistrate, as he did. Nor was I of any help to you in seeing to the sad details of her burial. I will be forever grateful you are not obliged to see to every decision after suffering the shock of discovering your own mother murdered. And yet, I have been ungrateful to him. I was angry he had seen to everything, leaving me nothing with which to occupy my mind and busy my days. If happiness and marriage depended on arguments, she would feel much more confident in her standing with William father did not scold her nor shake his head in disappointment. Instead, he laughed. You are too much alike and much too stubborn for your own good, my Lizzie. You have met your match, and it would appear Mr. Darcy considers you worth the trouble you will forever cause him. I do not know whether to be offended or relieved, she smiled. If he will love me, faults and all... Then I cannot be offended for long. Neither of you are perfect, my dear. Always remember that and try to be more understanding of his faults than I was with my poor wife's. With this sniff, he put his spectacles back on. A knock sounded and the front door creaked as it was answered. Elizabeth held her breath and waited for the footsteps to approach them in the study. Sure enough, it was a message for father. He read it, moving his spectacles up his nose. Lifting his head up sharply, he said, Mr. Collins says he knows who murdered Mrs. Bennet. We must make haste to the vicarage. Elizabeth did not contradict him, though Mr. Collins' delicacy would surely oppose her presence. Donning her warmest coat and wrap, she informed Jane of Mr. Collins's note and left her sisters in the warmth of Longbourn to accompany her father in the bone-chilling cold night to the Thorns' residence. "'It feels like snow is in the air,' father commented upon seating himself across from her in the carriage, rubbing his hands together and blowing on them. "'One detail bothered Elizabeth. "'I wonder why Mr. Collins sent a message,' when he could have told us on his return. While I appreciated the reprieve from his presence this afternoon, I worried at his imposition on the Thorns' hospitality when several hours had passed. Yes, he does tend to overstay his welcome. Still, if he has learned anything useful, I will forgive his presumption and haughty manners for the peace we stand to gain in learning the truth. The front parlour was crowded with gentlemen when they arrived at the vicarage. Leave it to Mr. Collins to create a scene. Not only had he summoned them, but he had also sent for Lord Havisham, Mr. Tanner, Colonel Fitzwilliam and William. It appeared the hearing would be held early. William made his way closer to the door as Mrs. Thorne received them, smoothing down her frazzled hair with trembling hands. Mr. Bennet, thank you for coming so quickly. I can hardly comprehend what has happened here this afternoon, but I give praise to God in heaven that Mr. Thorne and Mr. Collins are still with us. Her eyes 
appeared larger than normal, as if that afternoon had provided so much shock she could not relax her expression. Still with us? asked Father. Elizabeth's unease increased. When William reached her side, she stepped closer to him. Confusion added to her anxiety, Mrs. Thorne said. Did Mr. Collins say nothing of his condition? That would explain why Miss Elizabeth is present. Otherwise, I am certain her sensibilities would have obliged her to remain at home. Elizabeth had expected that, and she had an answer ready. However, she had no need for it. William answered, As the one who found Mrs. Bennet, I am certain that even Mr. Collins would approve of Miss Elizabeth's wish to be here. So long as Mr. Bennet has no objections, I doubt anyone else will either. He looked around the room, daring anyone to contradict him. As tense as the room was, Elizabeth dearly wished to laugh at the picture before her. If anyone objected, they did not dare voice it in front of William when he bore the expression he did. It was at my insistence she came. The message only said Mr. Collins had discovered the identity of the killer. I would not dream of keeping my daughter away when answers are within our grasp. Father draped his arm around Elizabeth's shoulders and squeezed her to his side. Mrs. Thorne nodded rapidly, the hair she had smoothed waving around her face. Of course, you know what is best, and I defer to your better judgment. I apologize profusely that Mr. Thorne is unable to greet you. She twisted her hands together. He is suffering from the same affliction as Mr. Collins. Affliction? Please, Mrs. Thorne, what has befallen the gentleman? asked Lord Havisham. Mrs. Thorne's chin quivered and William reached for her arm, leading her to the nearest chair. Thank you, Mr. Darcy. What a fright I am. Mr. Thorne and Mr. Collins were in fine health earlier this afternoon, but not an hour had passed after serving tea when both of them fell gravely ill. She pressed her hands to her temples. I fear for their lives. As bad as that? asked Mr. Turner. Have you sent for the apothecary? Yes, I did so immediately. I would not have believed it possible, but it was the apothecary himself who suggested... Oh, it is awful. She looked between Elizabeth and Father. What is awful, Mrs. Thorne? asked Father, his arm squeezing Elizabeth's shoulder. Please understand... I do not take the accusation lightly, and I repeat it only because of the responsibility I bear before my friends and before God. I cannot withhold a truth when it is in my possession. She paused long enough, the gentlemen began to shuffle their feet. Finally, she spoke in a whisper. We believe the cake was poisoned. Elizabeth clamped her teeth down on her tongue to keep from shouting no. I understand you did not make the cake. Who did? asked Lord Havisham. Mrs. Thorne sighed, her face contorting in discomfort. In a low voice, she said, Mrs. Hill sent it. Quickly, she added, Mrs. Hill has always been an upstanding member of our community. While the evidence appears to indicate she meant to do my husband and I harm, I cannot accept it. Mrs. Hill would never do such a thing. I, I do not think. Alarms blared in Elizabeth's head. It could not be true. Mrs. Hill was as close to another mother as she had and the thought that the housekeeper who had been with their family since the beginning would cause harm to her mother was simply unbelievable to her. She felt William's piercing look bearing down on her, while Lord Havisham asked several questions to which father listened in intense silence. Releasing his hold on her, William asked her, Do you think it is true? With every fibre of my being, I know it not to be true. He nodded, the muscles on the side of his jaw pulsating in time to the pounding in Elizabeth's head. 
Mrs. Thorne, now being on the verge of tears in her distress, was patiently attended to by Colonel Fitzwilliam, who asked the maid to bring her mistress something to calm her nerves, and sat with her, speaking softly. His ministrations proved effective, until she looked up and saw her husband standing at the bottom of the stairs, clutching his stomach and swaying from side to side. Mr. Thorne, you are not well. You will catch your death out here. She rose to join him, but Mr. Thorne waved her away. My love, I would not have you bear the burden of this wretched evening alone. It is true I am not well, but I am well enough to see the gentleman upstairs to our guest room. Mr. Collins will wish to give what details he knows. It will give him comfort should he not survive the evening. Elizabeth had never held any tender regard for Mr. Collins, but she certainly did not wish for him to die. The idea that he might sent her heart hammering. Father leaned down, whispering to her, Lizzie, I think it best for you to go no further than this sick room doorway, so you may hear without having to see anything untoward. The room being cramped, it was decided Colonel Fitzwilliam and Mr. Tanner would wait downstairs with Mrs. Thorne, while Lord Havisham and Father listened to what Mr. Collins had to say. William held back to accompany Elizabeth, a gesture she appreciated all the more as the acrid stench of vomit pierced her nostrils the closer they got to Mr. Collins's room. As he had done many times in the past few days, William handed her his handkerchief. She accepted it gladly, pressing it against her nose to inhale his much more preferable scent. When she saw William gag, she handed him the handkerchief, holding her breath until he returned it. And so they stood on opposite sides of the door to Mr. Collins's room, sharing William's clean cloth until they grew accustomed to the smell. Chapter 30 a tallow candle offered enough light to illuminate Mr. Collins's waxen face. His hair stuck to his sweaty forehead. The maid scurried into the room, apologising profusely and clearing a spacious path around her as she gathered the chamber pot and a pile of soiled bedclothes from the floor. The smell improved dramatically with those items gone. Elizabeth had never seen anyone so ill, and she shared Mrs. Thorne's concern that Mr. Collins might not survive the night. He said nothing of his illness in his message, William whispered to her. No, otherwise we would have brought him a clean change of clothes. I do not know if he could make the trip to Longbourn. Father motioned to the chair by the bedside table. You had best sit down before you fall down, Mr. Thorne. Mr. Collins groaned as father helped him sit up in bed. Elizabeth moved further into the shadows, lest he request she leave. William nodded his approval, moving a step into the room so as not to miss anything. In a raspy voice, Mr. Collins said, Thank you, Mr. Bennet. You are most kind. He stopped to catch his breath. Mrs. Hill... He leaned back against his pillows, his head rocking from side to side as if it were too heavy to hold up. Father sat at the foot of Mr. Collins's bed. Mrs. Hill made the cake. Yes, Mrs. Thorne mentioned as much downstairs. Mr. Collins, might I inquire why you are far worse off than Mr. Thorne and his wife, if each of you partook of the cake? Mrs. Thorne was not ill in the least. Elizabeth leaned in, straining her ears to hear every word. Mrs. Thorne offered her peace to me. It was painful to hear Mr. Collins attempt to speak. Elizabeth wished she could breathe for him. A more exemplary baked good I have not eaten. He stopped pausing long enough to calm his heaving chest. I ate more than my fair share. My punishment is deserved. 
Father said, You cannot mean it, Mr. Collins. Nobody deserves to be poisoned. If that is indeed what happened today. William asked, Is there no cake remaining? Mr. Collins cringed. I ate it all. My greed has led to my downfall. Putting his hand on what was most likely Mr. Collins's feet, Father said, Do not agitate yourself over what is done. You may feel miserable now, but your hearty constitution will not permit an easy defeat. Father's optimism gave Mr. Collins a measure of strength, strength enough to continue. My greatest wish is to be of service to your family. Should the worst come to pass, I prefer to go in peace. If it is my time to leave this world. Had he not looked so wretched, Elizabeth would have rolled her eyes at his dramatic speech. He continued, his voice fading. Mrs. Hill. He clutched at father's arm, but Mr. Collins could say no more. Patting his blanketed feet, father said, Allow me to understand your concern. Pinch your lips or moan if I am correct, Mr. Collins. If Mrs. Hill maliciously poisoned the cake, as you suggest, then is it your belief she also acted against Mrs. Bennet? Mr. Collins groaned. Elizabeth scoffed, drawing attention to her presence in the shadows. Mr. Collins was too weak to object, but he did cluck his tongue. William asked, is it understandable you might think Mrs. Hill to be guilty, given your realness after eating her cake? But what would she stand to gain by killing her employer? Nothing, absolutely nothing. Elizabeth clapped her hand over her mouth to prevent any further outbursts. Jealousy, revenge? There are many qualities which could provoke a servant to act against her mistress, suggested Lord Havisham. Mr. Collins sat bolt upright, panic crossing his face. My cousins, are they safe? Mr. Bennet pushed down on Mr. Collins's chest until he rested back against his pillows. Do not concern yourself. Mrs. Hill is not alone with them. Had she meant to cause them harm, she has had many other and better opportunities to have done so which was precisely the reason Mrs. Hill could not have killed Mother. Why do it in the haberdashery on the busiest day the village had seen all year? It made no sense. William voiced her thoughts aloud, his tone decidedly more curious than defensive, as hers would have been. Why would Mrs. Hill choose the day of the parade, a day teeming with potential witnesses, if she meant to harm Mrs. Bennet, she chose a rather public day to do it. Perhaps she saw protection in the crowd. Is it not true nobody has come forth as a witness? suggested Father, to which Mr. Collins groaned in accord. Lord Havisham stood on the other side of Mr. Collins's bed, stroking his side whiskers. Just as Elizabeth thought of another obstacle in the current reasoning pervading the room, William again voiced it. What connection does the murder of Mrs. Bennet have with you and the Thorns? Do you possess some knowledge which might reveal the identity of the true criminal? He looked between Mr. Collins and Mr. Thorn. I promise before God I know nothing. I only wish I did so that I might be of greater assistance said Mr. Thorne, continuing. As it is, I doubt I will be able to attend the hearing on the morrow. Understandably so, Mr. Thorne, said Lord Havisham. One detail niggled in the back of Elizabeth's mind. Mrs. Thorne loved cake. It was her weakness. Why had she not eaten a slice? For that matter, why had none in Elizabeth's family fallen ill? Mrs. Hill had made two cakes that morning, 
much to the consternation of Cook, who did not like anyone to invade her domain. Lydia, like Mr. Collins, had eaten the majority of it, but she was well. And even with her generous portions, there had been enough for all of them to enjoy a slice of gingerbread with their tea. William considered Mr. Collins and Mr. Thorne with narrowed eyes. Were his suspicions toward a certain individual growing as hers were? Elizabeth did not understand the motive as yet, but too many pieces of the puzzle fit. She hung on William's every word when he spoke. Mr. Collins, are your affairs in order should the worst occur? That she had not expected. Father and Lord Havisham shot him horrified looks, but William gave no reaction to indicate he was in the least bit affected. Elizabeth, too, wondered what he was about. Might I presume upon your goodwill? Mr. Collins began in his usual manner before thinking better of using flowery speech with the effort it required. Will you help me? Father, who continued filling in the blanks Mr. Collins did not have the energy to fill in, said, I will help draft the will. Perhaps Lord Havisham and Mr. Thorne will agree to serve as your witnesses. Mr. Thorne, might we send someone to fetch some parchment and your inkwell for Mr. Collins? William suggested. When Lord Havisham and William exchanged a knowing look, Elizabeth knew they had a plan of some sort. What it was and why, she could not even guess. She knew the Burke's shop was missing an inkwell. But what did that have to do with Mr. Thorne? The maid departed for the vicar's study and Mr. Thorne himself seemed more chipper than he had been moments before. He still slumped in his seat, clutching his stomach, but his countenance noticeably improved. I am honoured my wife's gift should be put to such an honourable use, gentlemen. Please forgive my eagerness to show it to you, especially in these dire circumstances. A gift? The inkwell was a gift? Evidently, William's suspicions were the same as hers. If only he could prove it. All she had to go on were her instincts, and they had led her wrong too many times before for her to trust them now. Mr. Thorne continued. I consider Mr. Collins to have saved my life and that of my dear wife. After all, we did not know the cake was poisoned. I trust God will not allow such an act of bravery to go unrewarded. And I pray for his full recovery. If overindulging in gingerbread was an act of bravery, then Lydia ought to be allowed to fight against Napoleon. She would win the war, and Charlotte could marry Colonel Fitzwilliam without the worry he might be sent to fight on the continent. Elizabeth heard feminine voices at the bottom of the steps and crossed the hallway to better listen. It was not eavesdropping, she was collecting evidence. Mr. Thorne sent for it, ma'am. I cannot return without it. I insist you take my inkwell, then. This one is an embarrassment. Their voices faded away as Mrs. Thorne convinced the maid to retrieve a different inkwell. Feeling like a clue was slipping through their fingers, Elizabeth joined the men in Mr. Collins's room. Mr. Thorne, why would your wife call the inkwell she gifted you an embarrassment? Cousin Elizabeth, not suitable. Mr. Collins tugged at the covers by his chin, hitting himself in the nose when his grip was too weak to pull them up. Father reached his hand out to prevent her from speaking. Mr. Collins, my daughter is here with my permission, and under the supervision of several gentlemen here who are, along with Lizzie, more interested in seeing to your improved health than in seeing you in your bedclothes. Mr. Collins remained unconvinced, but Elizabeth did not wish to budge. She felt safer inside the room than she did alone in the hall. If her suspicions were true, who knew what Mrs. Thorne would do next? Elizabeth went over every conversation and encounter with the vicar's wife over the last few days. Her comments, which Elizabeth had taken in comfort at the time, now held new meaning. Had she considered mother an impurity? What had been Mary's comment 
about the bruising of the serpent's head. Shivers ran down Elizabeth's spine. Father and Mr. Thorne talked soothingly to Mr. Collins. He must have been horribly fatigued with all the goings-on, but his determination to adhere to the suggestion of the nephew of Lady Catherine de Bourgh gave him the extra stamina necessary to see the creation of his will done. Elizabeth looked anxiously out of the door toward the stairs, but she heard nothing. Could Mrs. Thorne have escaped? William whispered to her, If any mention of the inkwell is made, Richard and Tanner will be alert. They will not allow her to leave. That is exactly what worried me. How did you know? It was entirely unfair William should be able to read her thoughts accurately when she too often misread his. Even if she possesses the inkwell, it proves nothing. We must be patient. The maid came in bearing the utensils needed to write, along with a tray to rest them on near father at the foot of Mr. Collins's bed. That is not the inkwell I requested, said Mr. Thorne, clearly displeased, but looking as if he did not wish to cause any more trouble by having the maid make another trip to his study for the desired item. Lord Havisham said, I should very much like to see your inkwell. Why did you not say what the gift was before, in the haberdashery? Encouraged by Lord Havisham, Mr. Thorne sent the maid downstairs yet again. It is silly, but Mrs. Thorne is ashamed of it. You see, on the way home from the shop, she dropped her basket, cracking the mirror on the lid before it rolled into a puddle of muck. Had I not seen her drying it off with a towel, I dare say she would not have given it to me when she did. He chuckled. She has attempted to take it from me several times to replace the glass, but I appreciated her gesture and her modesty so much I would not dream of parting with it. Tokens of appreciation should be properly valued. Well done, Mr. Thorne, said Lord Havisham. Elizabeth again heard voices downstairs, but she did not venture out into the hall this time. When the maid came upstairs, Mrs. Thorne accompanied her. My dear Mr. Thorne, why do you insist on embarrassing me publicly? she asked. William moved aside to let her stand next to her husband, stepping closer to Elizabeth and creating a barrier between the two ladies. Lord Havisham moved around the stand at the foot of the bed between her and father. Elizabeth was surrounded, and she was glad of it, so long as her protectors were not harmed. My love, I am not ashamed of you. To the contrary, your humility astounds me and makes me wish to display your thoughtful gift to all of Meryton. If only the members in our congregation could be so fortunate to marry as well as I have. Father lifted the inkwell the maid had set on the tray, commenting, no wonder the glass cracked. The size and weight of the bronze is significant. Had he known for what the inkwell had been used, he would have understood the significance of his observation. Lord Havisham asked, When did you say you purchased this inkwell for Mr. Thorne? It must have been a week ago, I think. I cannot remember precisely which day. Mrs. Thorne phrased her answer carefully, still pious in her refusal to lie outright. Mr. Thorne said, I remember very well. It was the same day we had that horrible rain, the day of the parade. Mrs. Thorne glared at her forthright husband, clicking another piece of the puzzle into place. Until that moment, Elizabeth had not disregarded the idea that Mr. Thorne might have acted with his wife. Lord Havisham observed it as well. Sending for Mr. Tanner, he asked him to fetch Mr. Burke. Mrs. Thorne's agitation grew, as did Mr. Thorne's confusion. What is this about? asked Mr. Thorne. Elizabeth's heart went out to the poor man. Of the two clergymen in the room, he was more clueless, as difficult as that may be to imagine. He looked around the room for answers. William would be too direct, as would Lord Havisham. 
father was too unaware of the details to understand completely what game was underfoot. She asked, Mr. Thorne, you mentioned you would display your wife's lovely gift before all of Meryton? Did you have plans to use it at the hearing on the morrow? He brightened before he looked down at his hands. I know it is vanity on my part. Mrs. Thorne warned me of it, but I thought it would be practical to bring my own writing things to save Mr. Tanner the burden of providing them at his inn. These details often get overlooked. And with his admission, the connection between Mother's murder and Mr. Thorne's poisoning was explained. Once again, Elizabeth found herself standing within a few feet of a cold-blooded murderer. A murderess. Of course, this time Elizabeth was not alone. The scorn with which Mrs. Thorne regarded her husband erased every doubt Elizabeth held against her guilt. You fool! You simply cannot keep your mouth shut, can you? Mrs. Thorne hissed. My love... Mr. Thorne sat back abruptly in his chair as if she had slapped him. Mrs. Thorne moved toward the doorway, but Colonel Fitzwilliam blocked her path. Not so fast, Mrs. Thorne. We are on to you. Mr. Thorne tried to stand, then thought better of it when his weakened legs wobbled under his weight. What is this? My love, what have you done? William widened his stance in front of Elizabeth, blocking her from danger as effectively as Colonel Fitzwilliam blocked Mrs. Thorne's escape from the room. Mr. Thorne, we have reason to believe Mrs. Thorne used that inkwell against Mrs. Bennet. Then she poisoned you to prevent you from revealing her secret before all Meryton on the morrow. Mrs. Thorne screamed as one possessed. Flailing one hand around, she scratched at Colonel Fitzwilliam's face while the other reached into her pocket. The flame from the candle reflected off the blade of a penknife she held in her hand. William pushed Elizabeth back. Furniture scraped against the floor as the men lunged forward. Between the wide shoulders of William and Lord Havisham, Elizabeth saw Father dive at Mrs. Thorne before darkness swallowed the whole room. Father! Elizabeth screamed. Chapter 31 for heaven's sake, bring in a lit candle, shouted Lord Havisham as the room went still, deathly still. William held Elizabeth in place, first with one arm, then with a full embrace. She had fought him at first, but once her brain caught up to her reaction, she realized the wisdom in staying where she was. But father, it was so quiet, and the wait was excruciating, Elizabeth squeezed her eyes, willing them to focus in the dark, to no avail. Closing her eyes, she imagined the room in her head. There had been a window behind her. Open the curtains behind you, William whispered to her, too concerned to be annoyed at being told to do what she'd already decided. She shoved the curtains to the side, flooding the room with moonlight. Rushing over to the doorway, she heard gasps. Mr. Tanner had returned with the Burks and Colonel Fitzwilliam out in the hall, but Elizabeth only had eyes for father. He lay on the floor in a crumpled heap with Mrs. Thorne. Neither of them moved. William rolled Mrs. Thorne off father. His white shirt and neckcloth were stained dark. Father! Elizabeth ran her fingers over his face, cursing her heart for beating too loudly for her to hear if he breathed. He groaned, reaching up to rub his head. His coat fell in shreds off his arm. Oh, he said, pulling his arm to him and holding it against his chest. Father, you are hurt. Let me help you. Panic welled up within her. With a shaking hand, he reached for her arms, holding them down. Lizzie, I am well enough. In the last murder investigation, it was my feet. It only suits that this time it should be my arms to suffer. If there is ever another murder in Meryton, which odds do not favor, I fear for my house. She choked on a laugh, and the tears entering her mouth as she sucked in air. Father would keep his wits about him at a time like this. From behind her, she heard Tanner say, 
We came running when we heard the scream. I believe most of Meryton heard it, Miss Elizabeth. Father chuckled. My ears are still ringing. William, leaving Mrs. Thorne in the care of Mr. Thorne, asked Father, Do you have enough strength to sit on the bed? Helping Father up, William said, Is there a surgeon near? Tanner's heavy footsteps moved toward the stairs. I will send the houseboy for him immediately. Make haste. Mr. Bennet has several cuts on his arms and looks to be losing a lot of blood. Pulling out his handkerchief, William helped Father out of his coat. Father's shirt stuck to him, brilliant red. Wrapping the linen and tying it tightly around his arm, William tended to Father's wounds as best he could, while the other gentlemen circled around Mrs. Thorne. Elizabeth stood at the end of the bed beside Father. The inkwell had tipped over, spilling its contents all over the tray. Mr. Collins lay limply in the bed, the only sign of movement were his eyes, which roved around the room. Mr. Thorne had dropped to his knees on the floor, cradling his wife's head in his lap. My dear, dear wife, I would not have believed you capable of such evil had I not seen it with my own eyes. Confess your sins and make peace with God. Lord Havisham moved over to Mr. Thorne, occupying the chair the clergyman had vacated. You had best pay heed to your husband, Mrs. Thorne. If you are fortunate enough to recover from your injuries, you will not fare so well before a jury. Mrs. Thorne lifted the hands she had clutched over her ribs, pulling the penknife out of her body and letting it fall to the floor. Elizabeth turned away and pinched her eyes shut. Mrs. Thorne would not be with them much longer. I have done my duty by God, she said, in a display of eerie calm. Did you murder Mrs. Bennet? asked Lord Havisham. I did it. She was a serpent, the offspring of Satan. She spoke as if she were reciting cold, distant facts. Mr. Thorne covered his eyes, his shoulders shaking. Why, oh, why, he exclaimed. You were too weak to do it. You were content to trust a woman like her to see the error of her ways and change. How many ladies, ladies more righteous than she, did she need to offend before she was stopped? She scoffed, her words bubbling out of her mouth in a gurgle. I believe in the goodness of people. I was not put on this earth to be their judge. That is for God alone to decide, Mr. Thorne answered softly. I only did what so many wished to do. I bruised her in the head like the serpent in the prophecy of Genesis. I do not regret what I have done, Mrs. Thorne said in a whisper, devoid of human empathy. She was fading fast. How did you do it? asked Lord Havisham. I hit her with the inkwell when she tried to get up off the floor. She belonged with her belly on the floor, like a serpent. Her answers got shorter and her breath more laboured. Elizabeth wanted to hear nothing more from the vile woman who dared compare her mother to a serpent when she had acted as traitorously as a ferocious beast, lacking conscience and humanity. That is enough to call off the hearing on the morrow. Before these witnesses who have heard her testimony of guilt, I think it's best now to wait for the surgeon to arrive. If Mrs. Thorne recovers, she shall be conveyed to await the next great session in Hartford, declared Lord Havisham. That will not be necessary whispered Mr. Thorne. He closed his wife's eyelids and crossed her arms over her chest. Tears flowed down his cheeks. What is worse, my lord, to learn she held me in derision or to mourn the death of the worst kind of sinner? The owl stood from the chair, offering it to Mr. Thorne. 
Squeezing his shoulder, Lord Havisham said, I am sorry, Mr. Thorne. The betrayal of one's trust is the greatest offence known to man. Father spoke. And I am sorry. Had I not grabbed for her? Mrs. Thorne would have caused much more harm than she did. What you did was brave, Mr. Bennet, and I doubt anyone present would testify you acted out of anything but in the defence of the others in this room, finished William. Colonel Fitzwilliam raised his hand to his face, covered with angry, bloody welts. I will second that. Does anyone object? His question was met with silence. Mrs. Thorne had killed Mother. Mr. Collins's greedy appetite had ultimately led to her discovery, and Father had incidentally brought about her end. That being settled, perhaps Mr. Burke would be so kind as to fetch the coroner. The sooner he does his inquest, the better for all of us. Mr. Burke, who had looked on along with Mrs. Burke in shocked silence, was moved to action. He clambered down the steps in a hurry, only hindered by his clumsiness. Addressing father and herself, William added, All of us will stay to ensure the inquest report reflects a true account of what transpired. Mr. Bennet acted in our defence. Lord Havisham, Colonel Fitzwilliam, Mr. Thorne and Mr. Tanner agreed unanimously. A weak voice floated to them from the pillows. I would never will my inheritance to the daughters of a gentleman with blood on his hands. It gives me great pride to return Longbourn to the descendants of the Bennet name on my passing. Stuff and fluff, Mr. Collins. You know as well as I do the entail does not work that way. You will be as right as rain on the morrow, and shall torment me often with your frequent and long visits in your hopes of catching my Mary's eye. I can assure you, sir, you have a struggle on your hands, since she has occupied her time with worthwhile employment at her Uncle Phillips's home, said father, to the mortification of Mr. Collins, whose face went from a greenish hue to a decidedly red shade. Continuing, father suggested, if Mr. Darcy will be so kind as to write, I fear I am unable to with my arms as they are. Perhaps we may placate Mr. Collins by recording his final wishes before the arrival of the coroner. But please, not with this inkwell. Mrs. Burke's eyes flickered to the offending inkwell. That was the very one... To think I had imagined Mrs. Bennet to somehow be responsible for its disappearance. I now believe I ought to have covered over her faults, minor as they were in reality. She was never the monster we claimed her to be. She was harmless, and I am so very sorry. The Lamb Society is disbanded. I am ashamed for ever forming a pot of it. Please accept my apologies. Father's eyebrows, like giant silver caterpillars, moved up and down as he pondered. Peeking over his spectacles as he drew a conclusion, he said gravely, I only wish Mrs. Bennet would have known of the existence of such a club. Absolutely not. What an appalling thing to say. She would have been deeply cut, said Mrs. Burke, her eyes wide in horror. Shaking his head slowly, Father smiled sadly. You did not know her as I did, Mrs. Burke. My wife would have been offended for the few seconds it took her to realize how flattering it was for the ladies in the village to deem her worthy of discussing so often to merit the formation of a club. She would have been honored to give cause for the creation of the first and only society for women in our village. I guarantee she would have taken it as her purpose to give you much to discuss at your gatherings. Elizabeth bit her lips together. Father was right. Mother would have gloried in the knowledge of her influence over the members of the Lamb Society. Loosening her bite, 
she allowed herself to smile at her first happiness-inducing memory of mother since her murder. As she looked at father and William beside her, she knew it would be the first of many more to come. Chapter 32 Hour upon hour passed, and William never left their side. The coroner's inquest revealed that Mrs. Thorne's death, though tragic, was not manslaughter, involuntary or otherwise. It was an unfortunate accident brought on by the foolishness of a crazed murderess to inflict as much damage as she could in a poorly lit room. As for father, he sustained a large bump on the back of his head from where he fell against Mr. Collins's bed, the scratches on his arms were mostly superficial, but two gave the surgeon cause for concern. In the superior lighting of the fireplace in the front parlour, he poured some whisky on the wounds, provided by Mr. Tanner, and bound them tightly, leaving instructions on the care of the wounds lest fever set in as father looked longingly at the empty bottle left behind. Elizabeth understood all too well. She was not one to imbibe, but she would have loved a sip from the bottle as well. It was a night for it. The Burks remained behind as well. Elizabeth suspected it was more to appease their own consciences than to be of any real assistance. However, Mrs. Burke proved to be a wealth of information once she called the day of the parade to memory. Father, putting the bottle on the floor where it could not mock him with its empty state, ran his uninjured hand through his hair. What I do not understand is how Mrs. Thorne avoided notice. There were people everywhere, even in the parlour of the shop. Mrs. Burke, who sat with them while Mr. Burke assisted in the coroner's inquiry, said, I have pondered that same question twice since Mrs. Thorne admitted to the deed. She was with us in the parlour before Miss Elizabeth entered the shop. Really? But she was not a member, was she? asked Elizabeth. No, although she attended most of our meetings. She chastised us for our gossip, saying nothing good ever came of it. Oh, little did we know. Mrs. Burke clasped her hands and stared into the fire. Now is not the time for regret. We need answers, said Father. How can you be certain she did not leave directly, that she hid? The bell above the door did not ring. I knew Mr. Burke to be busy in the back room, and while I did not expect anyone to enter the shop at the time, what with the parade to keep them out of doors, I always listen for the bell. As a shop owner, we must never ignore a customer. The bell did not ring, prompted Elizabeth, before Mrs. Burke got lost in a tangent. Precisely, the bell did not ring for quite some time, much longer than it would have taken Mrs. Thorne to reach the door. To be honest, the shop was so busy just before the start of the parade, I did not notice Mrs. Bennet had remained behind when I thought the showroom was empty. She most likely searched for me for some trifle for Miss Kitty's gown. I ought to have looked to be certain. Then this would never have happened. Her voice shook and her chin quivered, but she quickly regained control when father spoke. We must remember the past only as it brings us pleasure. Of what good is it to dwell on what we might have done when we cannot change the consequences of a chosen course? No, Mrs. Burke, I am determined to learn what I can from what has happened, with the purpose of living more wisely from now on. He patted Elizabeth's hand as he spoke, and she prayed he meant every word. What do you remember next? she asked, needing to know every detail, though it brought painful memories. The bell rang, and I recall hearing scraping noises and a thud. But I, I never dreamed what had caused it, with Mr. Burke rearranging furniture in the next room. Mrs. Thorne must have acted then. Elizabeth recalled Lady Lucas's confession. The bell Mrs. Burke heard must have been her entering the shop. She had fled directly after Mother's fall, panicking that she had killed her and leaving the shop door open in her haste to depart. Sparing her best friend's mother, she said, When I entered your shop, the door was open. 
Mrs. Thorne must have left it open and disappeared among the crowd before I came in. You and poor Lady Lucas. She suffered quite a shock. I do hope she recovers. She is an excellent customer. Did you know she bought a lovely, chiming mantel clock the day before the incident? The Lucases are a stable family and good people. No doubt they have been of great comfort to your family during these distressful times, she said. Like a question, searching for information Elizabeth was not about to give. Of course, they've always been our dearest friends. And they would stay that way. Elizabeth would call on them first thing on the morrow. Er, uh, rather, that day. It must have been after midnight. She would go after a quick nap. She would apologise for her suspicions, explain what had happened and insist Lady Lucas cast her guilt aside. Mother had a thick skull. Lady Lucas's greatest fault had been to leave in a panic so soon. Had she only waited? Elizabeth stopped herself. She could not allow herself to think so. It would only lead to a lifetime of regrets, taking away her peace and leaving her miserable. She would heed father's advice. If anyone knew how to maintain serenity whilst surrounded by disorder, it was father. She must have fallen asleep, for the next thing she remembered, father shook her shoulder. Come, Lizzie, it is time to go. The fire had died down to a few burning embers, and the pale grey dawn of a winter morning frosted the windows with ice crystals. It is snowing, she said. Outside the window, with the world covered in a clean white blanket, Elizabeth felt that the heavens had given them a gift, a new beginning. The men joined them downstairs, looking exhausted and in need of the fresh view out of doors, and most likely a stiff drink and a hot meal. Mr. Thorne drew closer to the window, saying in a hushed voice, Though your sins be as scarlet... They shall be as white as snow. Mr. Tanner clapped him on the back. A comforting thought. As for me, I am returning to the inn. I welcome anyone who wishes to join me for a hot meal and refreshment. Father looked too eager to join him for Elizabeth to insist they return home. When William tucked her hand in his arm, on the pretext she might otherwise fall on the slippery ground... Her senses awakened fully, leaving behind any trace of sleep. And that was when, in the dawning morning and their closeness, she saw the gash in the left side of his coat. Gasping, she forgot how inappropriate it was to touch his chest in the middle of the square, in front of gentlemen who would tease her relentlessly. None of that mattered if he was injured. "'William, you are hurt!' she pattered through the dark cloth, examining the fabric for bloodstains. He turned away from her. I am well. Mrs. Thorne took a stab at me, but Mr. Bennet held her arms down. If you are well, why do you avoid my touch? Her fingers tapped against something hard. What is that? she asked. Whatever it was, it had saved him. He straightened, taking her hand and placing it purposely in the crook of his arm, holding her so tightly she could not move her hand had she wished to. She did not wish to. It is nothing of which to concern yourself. We are all well. Mrs. Bennet's murderess was brought to justice. Our friend's reputations are saved. And hope reigns as we begin anew. How very poetic of you, William, Elizabeth said with a laugh. It was clear he hid something from her in his pocket but she would not force him to reveal his secret. Not yet. Mr. Tanner shook his head and trudged through the snow, leaving a trail of large boot prints behind him. Colonel Fitzwilliam pulled out his timepiece, clearly disappointed with the hour he saw. Lord Havisham chuckled with father, the two of them talking between themselves and continuing on to the inn. Do you like poetry? William asked. If it is said to nourish a fine, stout, healthy love, words must mean something from the person saying them, not emptily recited to gain a hollow smile or superficial admiration. I cannot disagree with you, 
though I have been used to consider poetry as the food of love. You would never say anything you did not believe wholeheartedly, and thus I believe you would use poetry most effectively. You are much too honourable for anything less. And how would you encourage affection? William asked, a gleam in his eye. Were we at a ball, I would say by dancing. A squeal escaped Elizabeth as William twirled her, leaving her light-hearted and breathless. Will that do? he asked, with a smile in his voice. Puffs of icy fog at her mouth proclaimed the cold weather, but she did not feel it. It was as warm as a perfect summer day to Elizabeth. It will. Where there is laughter, joy flourishes. And love? He stood so near to her she could feel the heat of his skin. Fireworks spread from her hands, which he now held between his own, through her body, leaving her knees weak. She held Fitzwilliam Darcy's heart just as certainly as he held hers. That he would cherish it, she felt confident. That she would live every day loving him gave her strength greater than her grief. Come inside before you both freeze to death, growled Mr. Tanner, holding the door to his inn open and waving at them to hasten their steps. William smacked him in the arm as they passed. Killjoy. They sat down by the fire to steaming bowls of stew and bread still warm from the oven. Never had food tasted so delicious. The conversation was equally pleasant. Troubles would visit them later, but for now they had a brief reprieve and they rejoiced in it. The colonel was especially merry. Elizabeth hoped the trouble he had taken in assisting them during his leave would be rewarded when he next called at Lucas Lodge. Lord Havisham would leave for his estate once his things were packed and his coach ready. He extended invitations of hospitality to each of them, luring them with tales of numerous pheasants to hunt, a large pond with giant fish eager to swallow the dangerous end of a fishing rod, enough works of art to show in a museum, and a sizable library. He was persuasive. Elizabeth should have known that with no cares in the world one would seek her out. The laughter around the table faded as the imposing figure of Lady Catherine entered the inn with Miss de Berg. They stood to receive her, and Lady Catherine walked until she stood toe-to-toe -to -toe with William. "'What brings you to Meryton at this early hour?' he asked. She refused to look at him. I could not stay another day in this dreadful place and insisted on returning to London. And since you had yet to return to Netherfield Park, I thought it best to find you to insist once and for all that you do your duty by your family and marry Anne. Come with us to London, Darcy. Miss de Berg stepped between them, pushing them gently apart. The truth of the matter is that Mother ruined Miss Bingley's social aspirations when she wrote to Lady Jersey and advised her to refuse Miss Bingley's voucher, to refuse her entry to Almax by any means. Mr. Bingley found out about it, and he insisted Mother leave at first light. Good for Mr. Bingley. While his action showed him to be capable of decisive action and boldness, qualities Elizabeth admired greatly and wished for Jane's choice of husband, she had difficulty pitying Miss Bingley. Lady Catherine harumphed. Miss Bingley will know I am not one with whom to trifle. Looking directly at Elizabeth, she added, Which leaves you, Miss Elizabeth? You insist on interfering with family affairs which are of no concern to you. You had best take care, lest a worse fate befall you. Elizabeth refused to be intimidated. Holding her head high, she said, I have no doubt of the powers of your influence. However, it would be a waste of your talents to use them against me. I hold no aspirations in society, nor do I seek their approval. I am simply a country bumpkin and much too insignificant for anyone of worth to notice. Colonel Fitzwilliam cleared his throat several times to cover his laughter, and William grinned widely. 
Now, Cathy, you have to admit you deserved that, said Lord Havisham with a chortle. Before Lady Catherine could make a retort, William commanded her attention. Aunt Catherine, the whole of the matter is that I am decided. I love Elizabeth Bennet with my entire being, and I will not stop fighting for her affections until I have secured her heart. She gives my life meaning and direction where I was aimless and haughty, and it is my intention to marry her as soon as I can convince her to have me. Lady Catherine recoiled. You speak of her as if she matters, as if she is your superior, when in every way... William held up his palm. She is. Elizabeth matters more to me than the world. In every way she has made me strive to improve myself so that I might become the man she deserves, of whom she dreams. Elizabeth held on the back of the chair beside her for fear of swooning. Well, I never... Lady Catherine pounded her cane against the floor. She could threaten and insult all she wanted. Elizabeth did not care. Fortunately, Mr. Berg recognised when to withdraw, and, with the help of Lord Havisham, she convinced her mother to depart. It would take some time and a great deal of effort, but Elizabeth understood her well enough to know that there would be no peace with Lady Catherine until her every option was exhausted. But that was for later. Now she preferred to fill her senses with the handsome, kind, honourable, responsible, considerate, handsome... And did she say handsome already? Man standing beside her. All the verbal battles she and William had waged together, all the needless offence caused by words poorly expressed, disappeared like cake at Longbourn. Before she could catch her breath, he was on one knee, holding her trembling hands in his steady grip. Elizabeth, will you do me the honour of becoming my wife? Finally, shouted Father, popping the romantic bubbles surrounding her and William. Father looked down sheepishly. I mean, you have my blessing, of course. Then again, you knew that. William smiled at her, pulling her in like a magnet. Words could not describe the joy she experienced, and so she did what she could. Raising her hands to either side of his face, she nodded as enthusiastically as she had ever done, pulling him to his feet and walking into his waiting embrace. Chapter 33 The next three days passed in a blur. Lord Havisham returned to his home, Mrs. Thorne was buried quietly, and Mr. Collins did not die from his overindulgence. He remained with Mr. Thorne, who attended to his duties with admirable devotion. When it was suggested he employ a curate to assist him until he could mourn properly, he firmly declined. Mr. Bingley and Jane would have their first reading of the bands that Sunday. Mother's hopes of her daughter's being the last wedding of the year and the first of the new would be fulfilled after all. Elizabeth's chest tightened whenever she thought of Mother, but when she cried, they were not the bitter tears of loss, but rather of healing father, thus far, had proved to be a man of his word. Time which he formerly devoted exclusively to study, he now spent with his steward, making plans and setting long-neglected projects into motion, so long as he could find his shoes. Chloe had developed the naughty habit of hiding them in a safe place where she might chew on them at her leisure. Her antics often brought Lydia and father together with the mission of discovering Chloe's newest hiding spot giving father and his youngest daughter something in common. It was a start. Mary took great pleasure in assisting Uncle Phillips with clerk-like duties. Her meticulous mind and ability to memorise were admired and praised often by Uncle. To Aunt, Mary lent a listening ear, and, to her sister's delight, Mary deemed to repeat the juiciest bits of gossip when she came to call. She was not so pious as Elizabeth had believed her to be, Darning her warmest coat and gloves, Elizabeth crept downstairs, wanting to escape out of doors unnoticed, lest her sisters attempt to prevent her from enjoying a walk before Kitty's wedding. 
Mrs. Hill met her by the dining room, and Elizabeth greeted her with a kiss. Are you hoping your handsome gentleman will happen to walk along the same path? she asked, a dimple flashing in the pudgy cheek where Elizabeth had kissed her. I think I shall walk near Netherfield Park today, Elizabeth tugged on her gloves. Then you will almost certainly see him, as I hear that seems to be his preferred path. With a wink, Mrs. Hill returned to the dining room to inspect the maid's work. Elizabeth stepped lightly on the fresh snow, not wanting to mar its clean beauty. Her feet crunched in the soft powder sparkling under the morning sun. It was a perfect day for Kitty's wedding. It was a perfect day to meet with William, she thought, walking with determined haste to their spot in the grove of trees. When she arrived, he stood up from the fallen log. He had been waiting for her. Hesitantly, he stepped forward, then thought better of it. He clasped his hands in front of him, then moved them behind his back. William was nervous. And what are you up to? A passing thought made her sick to her stomach. You look like a groom repenting his choice at the altar. There, she said it. She would not allow a misunderstanding to come between them again when she could ask for an explanation immediately. Oh, no he denied vehemently, before worry overtook him. You do not have regrets, do you? His uncertainty was adorable. I have many regrets, William, she began, moving close enough to him she could hear him hold his breath. I regret not agreeing to marry you sooner. With a whoosh that stirred her loose tendrils, William exhaled. That is what I hope to speak with you about. Would you agree to marry by license? Or do you have your heart set on the reading of the bands? Elizabeth would have loved to have had her bands read along with Jane's, but Lady Catherine would surely oppose. Under the circumstances, I think a license is the best choice for us, so long as Lady Catherine does not follow through with her threat to prevent the Archbishop from approving it. Or had that merely been a dream? There is that. Elizabeth laughed. Then she would leave us no option but to travel to Gretna Green. Can you imagine her reaction when she learns how her interference led to the great Mr. Darcy of Pemberley <laughs> eloping with an unknown, unremarkable... I believe the word you are searching for is insignificant, he said mischievously. Ah, oh, that was it. How could I possibly forget... Such an event would certainly make the papers. Then what would she do? My aunt would rather die an early death than be the cause of gossip among her peers. Still, it is a promising argument. I shall make certain to include it in my next letter to her. Mr. Berg seems rather taken with her doctor. He is younger than she had supposed. It was interesting to see how she did not mention much of the treatment, but she included sufficient details about the doctor. I believe I should recognize him if I saw him. Can you imagine Lady Catherine's reaction if her own daughter were to fall in love with Lord Havisham's son? A third son? Oh, the shame, he smiled, adding, Would you marry me if I were a third son? Elizabeth looked up at the clouds and tapped the corner of her mouth. Hmm. Please give me a moment to think, she teased. You seem to forget I have yet to see Pemberley. For all I know, it could be a straw hut in a dark forest. His face turned serious, but the twitch at the corner of his mouth betrayed him. No, not straw. I would never consider making my home out of such a flimsy material when mud is much sturdier. Their laughter rolled over the hills, echoing into the distance. The sparkling icicles adorning the tree branches watched over them, glistening and dancing in the early morning breeze and tinkling in applause. William pulled a long black case out of his pocket. Now that I know your true feelings, I feel at liberty to give this to you. They belong to my mother, but I changed them to suit you. He shuffled his feet and swallowed hard. Oh, he was nervous. Taking the case that had saved his life, 
she ran her fingers over the rich velvet covering. She would forever cherish it for what it had already done. William had not bought this gift from the Burke's haberdashery. Is this why you were away so long? she asked. Yes, open it. I will have you know that any gift requiring your absence for a fortnight must truly be spectacular. And even then, I will warn you, never to part from me longer than half a day ever again. I will see to it. Oh, those words. How often they had frustrated her. But today, they were a promise. Opening the case, she gasped. Are they spectacular enough? William asked. Elizabeth clutched his gift in one hand and her heart with the other. Her mouth gaped open, but no expression could articulate what she felt. The emeralds shimmered against white satin lining. William took the necklace, walking around her back. She pulled her ringlets up as he wrapped it around her neck and clasped it, his fingers lingering deliciously at the tender spot at the nape of her neck before trailing to her ears to help her with the earrings. Do you like them? he asked, taking one step away and admiring her so that she felt more beautiful than even Jane. His gift, his thoughtfulness, his concern and open admiration deserved a proper expression of gratitude, something better than words. Closing the distance between them, Elizabeth slipped her fingers up William's shoulders, twining them through the curls at his collar. Standing on the tips of her toes, she inclined her face upward until her lips found his. They were soft and tasted as sweet as honey. His breath smelled of peppermint. The stubble on his chin scratched against her skin, setting her nerves on fire and evoking sensations of which she had never imagined herself capable. Clinging to him as the world swayed, they kissed in the middle of the crystal-covered fields with nature as their chaperone. Epilogue All of Elizabeth's favourite people came for Mr. Denny and Kitty's wedding. Charlotte greeted her with a bone-crushing hug. Lizzie, there is something I wish to tell you, she whispered in Elizabeth's ear. Elizabeth was certain she could guess correctly, but she would do nothing to diminish her friend's joy. What is it? she asked. I am engaged, said Charlotte, bobbing up and down on her toes, to Colonel Fitzwilliam. A blush covered Charlotte's cheeks and a soft smile brightened her plain features, making her lovely. Oh, Charlotte, how happy I am for you. Please tell me more. Elizabeth urged, leading her to the bench where Jane sat conversing with father. He is a decisive man. He recognises in me qualities which he feels will suit me well to military life. Oh, Lizzie, Charlotte said, grasping Elizabeth's hands between her own. I never believed it possible to have a life of travel made available to me. I realise the conditions will not be ideal, but I am of a practical mind and shall make the best of it while sing to the comfort of my husband. Her blush deepened, as did her smile. You will make Colonel Fitzwilliam an excellent wife, Charlotte. I wish you both the happiness you deserve. Thank you. Father was especially pleased. Colonel Fitzwilliam is the second son of an earl, you know. Not that I hold any aspirations toward the possibility of a title and wealth, but I am pleased to share with you another bit of news I only recently learned myself. Elizabeth did not know if she could stand any more happiness. My aunt in London has informed me she intends to leave me her fortune. She has even offered to add to my dowry on the condition she approves of the gentleman. That is the best news. Of course she will approve of Colonel Fitzwilliam, Elizabeth whispered as a hush fell over the happy assembly. She and Charlotte had much to discuss after the wedding. The vicar took his place before the blushing bride and her officer groom. Jane and Charlotte flanked her on either side, an appropriate setting given how Mr. Bingley, William, and Colonel Fitzwilliam sat together on the opposite side of the aisle. 
The young couple exchanged vows, and Mr. Denny slipped a gold ring onto Kitty's finger. Both Jane and Charlotte clasped Elizabeth's hands. This next bit was the best part of a wedding ceremony. They collectively sighed as Mr. Denny said the words they longed to hear from their own gentlemen. With this ring, I thee wed, with my body, I thee worship, and with all my worldly goods, I thee endow, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Elizabeth peeked across the aisle at the man whom she loved, the man whom she would marry. Mrs. Fitzwilliam Darcy had a lovely ring to it. William met her gaze, and her body warmed at his smile. If their kiss at the edge of the grove was indicative of their future happiness together, great things awaited them. Right there, from that moment to forever, Elizabeth was undeniably, absolutely, unconditionally, and perfectly in love with Mr. Darcy. And for the first time, she allowed her hope free reign to imagine their life together. They would live happily ever after. She would see to it. At least, that is what every blushing bride-to-be hopes. True love is rainbows and sunshine, until someone else is murdered. This has been The Indomitable Miss Elizabeth, A Pride and Prejudice Variation, A Meriton Mystery, Book Two, written by Jennifer Joy, narrated by Nancy Peterson, Copyright 2017 by Jennifer Joy. Production Copyright 2017 by Jennifer Joy. So what did you think of that? Lady Catherine has quite a colorful history, doesn't she? If you enjoyed that audiobook, please like and subscribe to my channel so you don't miss any more audiobooks. Would you like a bonus chapter? Then please visit my website here for a special scene that I wrote between Lord Harvisham and Lady Catherine. I hope you enjoy it. Until the next audiobook, bye.